Councillors, please stand. Almighty God, we, the representatives of the citizens of the City of Brisbane, are assembled here to strive and care for the welfare of our city and all its people. Lord, we ask that you guide us in the decisions we make today. Amen. Amen. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and pay our respect to elders past and present. Please be seated. I declare the meeting open and I remind all councillors of your obligations to declare material personal interest and conflict of interest where relevant and the requirement of such to remove yourself from the council chamber for debate and voting where applicable. Councillors, are there any apologies? There are no apologies. Councillors, the minutes, please. Uh, Mr Chair, I move that the minutes of the 4,612th meeting held on Tuesday, the 4th of February 2020, be received, taken as read and confirmed. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Richard, seconded by Councillor Marks. The minutes of the 4,612th meeting of Council held on the 4th of February 2020 be received, taken as read and confirmed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. Councillors, I draw your attention uh, to the item in the agenda identified as public participation. And can I please invite Mr Ken Butler to address the Chamber on dogs off leash on beaches and ferries? Ken. Uh, welcome, Mr Butler. You have five minutes, uh, which commences when you begin speaking. As we've discussed earlier, you're free to stand or sit, whichever you prefer, and begin when you're ready. Thank you very much uh, for having me. So, sorry, um, Billy, the... the um, Put me oh, no, which going? Oh, it's going. Excuse it's me. Going. My apologies. Uh, first off, thank you very much uh, to uh, Councillor Cook. I hope you'll uh, appreciate your staff because they have been magnificent, especially Troy. Um, that's the only way I got here. This is February, oh no, this is November's. Um, welcome to Brisbane, or well, living in Brisbane. I refer to uh, dog lovers and their poor learned friends. The new off-leash areas are part of a 12 month trial creating more for residents to see and do while also protecting important shorebird habitat. You may be protecting the habitat, well, I can't see how, but you're certainly not protecting the birds. Some of these birds, whoops, where's my notes? Some of these birds have 10,000 kilometres to fly back to. And that's a long way when you're a tiny little fella. When they come here, they need to feed up and they need to rest up. So I believe that this decision by the council, it seems to be pushed by a whole heap of dog owners to allow this to happen. I find it very, very upsetting. I don't think it's very fair to the, board, to the birds. I walk everywhere and everywhere I walk on the footpaths there are dog feces and bags of dog feces thrown underneath somebody's bushes, dropped down the gutter. The place is a mess. It's like walking in a minefield. Some people can't even drag the dog off the concrete path. They've got to let it do it right on the path and just walk by and leave it. I'm sorry, that's just wrong. After I left Councillor Cook's office, I was sitting on the bus stop waiting for the bus and this elderly lady turned up and she had the November one and she was reading there quietly. I hadn't spoken to her. Next thing she says, oh no. I said, what? And she said, they're going to let dogs off leash on these beaches. I just said, no, I just found out about all this because I came down to see my local councillor to find out what was what, because the only information I had was this in the November thing. I said, they're also going to let dogs on the ferries. And she said, well, that, I know, she said, I heard that, and that is going to stop me from getting on the ferries. If I get on the ferry and these people that own dogs who don't know how to train anything, going to wrap around her legs, going to drop her on the ground and she said, I'll break something and I'll lose my independence. And this woman was very afraid of that. Now, she's not the only one. 
And I'm, I'm one of those ones that would react very badly if a dog started doing his business right next to me on the ferry. I'm, I don't need that. In, uh, what is it, February, March, we find out, it's in the, in the back of the thing, 135 off-leash dog areas. Now, that's, that's a fair few million in fences, I should imagine. A lot. Go down to Balmoral High, where Lytton Road and the footy fields, or the playing fields are. That fence has been replaced at least twice in the five years that I've been retired, that I know of. Now, that's a lot of money. And it's all getting cut by people with dogs, so they can get onto the the footy oval. Now, there's an off-leash dog area down there at the Combsley and there's one over at, um, just up near the railway line at Cannon Hill. And yet these people are causing, they're dirty, they can't pick anything up, and they're cutting fences. It, it's, it's illegal, and I believe it's not the only school that it happens to. It would seem to me that Council and Translink, Translink are bending over backwards for these people who are not looking after the, the, the other residents of this city. It's terrible. And that's all I have to say. Uh, I am very upset, especially those poor little birds getting chased. That's not fair. Thank you, Mr Butler. Can I please call on Councillor, uh, the Deputy Mayor, to respond, please? Deputy Mayor. Thank you, uh, Mr Chair. Yes, I will respond this afternoon. Um, as I explain to Mr Butler, I look after the Public and Active Transport Committee and will respond on behalf of uh, Councillor Hammond today with the, um, the trial of the dog off-leash areas in the beaches as well. Look, I understand your frustration. This is the joy of the democracy that we have in Brisbane. We have got uh, very many unique lifestyle opportunities and we need to balance them with keeping our very unique habitats that we have as well. And uh, I can understand that you don't like the idea of what we're trialling here at the moment, but we also did get, as you mentioned, uh, many locals asking for exactly this, an opportunity for their dogs to be off leash on the beach, an opportunity to take their fur babies with them when they go on the city cats as well. With regards to the off-leash areas that we're trialling at the moment for dogs, we have actually drafted the guidelines around that with the Queensland Government's Department of Environment and Science and uh, marine parks. So we did this very carefully based with UQ research that shows us that if we do a zoning in the foreshore, um, it would be significantly better at protecting the shore shorebirds than what we probably are seeing at the moment, and they're not my local areas, but I know what it's like in local areas where people decide they can have their dog off leash anywhere and everywhere. Um, we literally are putting in zones where it is acceptable so we can hope we can stop some of the non-compliance that we see around the areas, particularly where the migratory shorebirds are as well. It has been entered into as a trial with council and UQ, but the state government are working with us as well. And there's three areas at the moment. You mentioned um, Sangay, we've got Nudgee Beach and Manly, and we're just trialling it for 12 months. So in October this year is the end of the trial. We'll be going out to consultation again after Easter to ask people. We've done one <coughs> excuse me, round <coughs> of consultation with the community and got a very big feedback late last year of 550 people telling us what they liked and didn't like. Um, but it is about trialling the opportunity. I know the three councillors in those three areas are very supportive of the trial, so we can get to the bottom of whether it works or it doesn't work as well. Um, and the second survey, as I said, which will come out on community's website, on council website, I ask you to put your feedback into that as well. Let the local councillors know. I'm sure they'll be talking to their community as well. Till we see what worked, what didn't work, and how we can make sure that we cater for everybody in um, in this area as well. With regards to um, the dogs on ferries, it actually started as a petition that came to council. Um, it came to my committee, and we discussed it. And somebody asked me, "Well, do you support dogs on city cats?" And I said, "In principle, I think it's workable if we have a fair few." restriction on how that is actually monitored. Um, that actually brought the attention to the state and they did actually act on the requests out of the conversations that we were having here in council for a three-month trial 
to gauge support for this one. So this is totally being run by TransLink, who are the authority that is running the trial for the dogs on city cats. Um, they're only within um, off-peak times that they can go within the CBD areas. There's a lot of restrictions. They must be on leads. They must be muzzled. Um, if they're large dogs, they need to be under seats. Um, TransLink is the person to contact, the authority to contact on that. Um, we, again, are getting very mixed responses around this one. Some people love the idea. Some people hate the idea. Again, the democracy in Brisbane, we're trialling it. Um, we'll see how it goes after three months, but I strongly advise you to contact um, the state government as well through um, TransLink to give them your feedback. And uh, thank you very much for coming in today and letting us know how you feel. Thank you, no, thank, thank you Mr. Butler. That, oh. I appreciate, we appreciate you coming in today. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you. I appreciate the effort. Councillors, uh, you will now see that Mr Wayne Wakeham will now be addressing the chamber, another public participant. Mr Piers will, will bring him in now. Welcome Mr, <coughs> Excuse me. Welcome, Mr. Wakeham. You've got five minutes. Uh, Mr Piers will prepare your uh, stop clock for you there on your left. Um, and uh, you have five minutes, which begins when you begin speaking, and just make sure that red light's on. Begin uh, when ready. Thank you. Mr Chairman, councillors, thank you for the opportunity to address this meeting. The reason I'm here is because, ladies and gentlemen, we have a problem. The residents of the Queensland, of the old area of Eight Mile Plains, which is bounded by the South East Freeway, Logan Road and Miles Padding Road, feel they are being uh, ignored and abused. L let me give you a quick boil potted history of the area. In about 1860, this area was subdivided um, into residential blocks. I believe it may have been part of the original Hughes estate, and as to, as to this day, it's overlooked by the Hughes House, which is on the corner of Mild Padding Road and, uh, sorry, Pasto Road and Old Logan Road. Obviously, in that days, those days, Eight Mile Plains was a long way out of the Brisbane city. The Glen Hotel was a stagecoach stop. Uh, between Brisbane and the Gold Coast. So little or no housing development occurred in that area until post-World War II. And of course, it wasn't very popular because there are only small 450 or 400 square metre blocks. Um, and people were more interested in getting um, uh, larger blocks for a backyard. However, being surrounded by major roads creates a problem that could not be seen when the land was subdivided way back by simply sticking a grid over the area and uh, drawing lines, and that being affected um, adjacent to what is now the MPPL intersection, and now sandwiched between the Garden City Office Park and the Brisbane Technology Park. The residents are being overwhelmed by the parking from the overdevelopment which has been allowed to occur without provision for parking, the Garden City Office Park and the Brisbane Technology Park due to changes made um, to benefit a few people. Um, we also have, uh, sorry, that, uh, I've met with the councillors over the years um, and there's been a lot of denial that we actually have a problem. And I've met uh, issues from speeding or high volume traffic which uses the streets as a rat run to avoid the intersection of Mild Plating and Logan Road. Mr Chairman, this is ridiculous. I personally have spoken and met with former councillor Graham Quirk, Lord Mayor Newman, and Graham Quirk as his deputy and as Lord Mayor, and had written communication with the above and a number of meetings with the current councillor, Stephen Twain. Um, and yet, 15 years later, not one single thing has been done to alleviate the ever increasing problems the residents <coughs> face on a daily basis. Mr. Chairman, I do uh, grant Stephen Twain one thing, and that he has managed to get a survey of the area um, on the proposed uh, construction of speed platforms, which the majority of the residents supported, even though they would rather have the cl streets closed at London Street and Liverpool Street, because the speed platforms will have no effect on the volume of traffic 
and most will end up likely end up creating more noise and pollution. Mr Chairman, this area certainly falls into the category of local area traffic management, which includes closing streets to through traffic, and this street layout would not be approved for any new development, so why can't we brought it up to be up to date? If any resident approaches from the south along Logan Road, we have no alternative but to take alternate circuitous routes which is necessary to pass through the same intersection, the MMP, MPPL, twice to actually turn into our street. Yet drivers can turn into and out of this area with no restrictions at all when coming from the north on Logan Road and heading towards Roachdale and Miles Padding Road. And therein lies another issue with the traffic. The volume, the noise, the failure to stop at the stop signs, the aggressive driving, the use of mobile phones, and because there is no police presence, despite being asked for on a number of occasions, but of course it would not be necessary if the roads were closed. Mr Chairman, you may be thinking, how will the residents leave the street if the area, if the streets are closed? Well, at present, most residents who may wish to leave need to turn right out of Fraser or Mersey streets to access Miles Padding Road to to head towards the city or to the local shopping or schools. Yet not only is that nearly impossible, but also highly dangerous due to the volume of traffic, which is container trucks and cars coming from the freeway, from Gateway um, and Roachdale. I've asked Councillor Huang for a keep clear box to be painted on Miles Padding Road opposite Fraser Street to allow residents to exit safely. However, at this time, it has not been completed. Mr Chairman, the intersection of the MMPL has long been a problem, and in 2008 the uh, Mr. Wakeham, then disappointingly your time has expired, and so I'm, I'm going to have to stop you there. Uh, ask me you. to leave. No, no, not leave, please. <laughs> Someone's going to respond to you. Um, yes. Um, but oh. I must, I must stop you there. I apologise. Okay. Apologise, um, Councillor McLaughlin. Uh, feel free to take a seat if you wish as well. Thanks, Mr Chair. And Mr Wagen, thank you very much for coming in and for your passionate support for the things that you believe in. And I understand and know that you've been talking to Councillor Huang about these issues. Thank you for your presentation. I'll uh, certainly take the chance to read this more closely. Uh, as you're aware and as you've mentioned, um, there was budget allocation, the most recent budget, to investigate the things that could be done. That led to the survey that you talked about then. Uh, I understand that that went out to something like 220 local residents. Uh, the, the issues that we all deal with across the city is, and you've described it very well here this afternoon, are issues dealing with change. Gone back to the, the time of the, uh, the 1860 when the area was first uh, um, subdivided, and, and clearly there's been a lot of change since then. And often, and if not all the time, we're dealing with roads that were designed literally for horse and cart traffic, and they're dealing with much more modern vehicles. So that's a generic issue across the city. Our department, the infrastructure department, is very mindful of these issues and looks at the things that can be done. A lot of the issues you describe relate to driver behaviour, over which we have no direct control. They, uh, they do fall under the purview of the police, and we always encourage you to contact with the police. Uh, if, if there are a number of calls coming from, from a particular area in relation to driver behaviour, that does inform their decisions about where to post speed guns and the like. So I encourage you and your residents to follow that course of action as well. But in terms of the issues you raise about the engineering changes that could be made with the road network, uh, we're happy to look at those things that did, uh, after an initial reaction to that survey, I don't think it was hugely responded to, but then you and Councillor Huang went out to uh, encourage more residents to participate, if I understand that's correctly, and you have received a, a higher response rate and an indication that people will support the sorts of things that are being talked about. So we're quite happy to, to look at those measures. It's certainly not something that's being fobbed off or the words you described earlier to say it wasn't being taken seriously. These issues are being taken seriously. I understand the issues that arise in, whilst this isn't my area, I have similar sorts of areas and issues that arise, but I know Council Huang is, a, is also a, a passionate supporter and, lo and lobbies hard for the changes that might need to be made. The things that we can do are subject to a manual of uniform traffic devices, so they're, they're mandated uh, engineering changes that can be implemented, uh, but we'll look at those as well, so they do go to traffic calming, slow down signs, keep clear signs. 
they are all the things that can be looked at um, as a consequence of the survey that you have undertaken. Um, I will we'll, I'll also write on your behalf to the minister, because I believe there are issues that come off the, the state road network of affecting the local road network. So, um, on your behalf, I'll, I'm, I'm certainly happy to write to the minister to draw attention to your attendance here in the council today, your presentation, the issues you've raised, and to see if there's anything that the, the state can do about what it's, what it's doing with its section of the road in your area. But again, thank you very much for coming in today. We appreciate you taking the time to come in. This is the last council session for us for a little while, but rest assured that the issues you've raised are take, being taken seriously and will be addressed uh, in the course of the, ne the next 12 months. Thanks for coming in. Thank you, Mr Wakem. Mr Pearce will assist you. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, councillors. Councillors, I draw your attention to question time. Are there any questions of the Lord Mayor or a chair of any of the standing committees? Councillor Atwood. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, can you outline just some of the achievements that this administration have achieved in the last four years, which demonstrates that only Team Schrinner has the leadership, experience and ideas to run Brisbane? Are you okay. aware of any alternatives? All right, okay, Lord Mayor, I'm going to call on you, but before you begin, I'd like to remind councillors that uh, <laughs> Questions and answers are expected to be heard in silence. I anticipate that through the next 45 minutes, people will be asking for courtesy for them while not showing it for others. So I expect courtesy to be shown and received to all councillors. Lord Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair, and uh, thank you, Councillor Atwood, for the question. Uh, certainly, um, this meeting, as we're all aware, is the last meeting of the current council term. And And um, it's an important opportunity to reflect on what has happened in the past four years. And uh, it's also an opportunity to reflect on what might happen going forward. OK, sorry, Lord Mayor, stop there. I've, I've asked that, I've asked that um, uh, councillors allow answers to be heard in silence. And I'd ask that whatever, whichever councillor is just wistfully listing things, um, I'd ask them to stop because it's weird and not helpful. Um, and I'd like uh, all answers to be provided uh, in silence, please. Lord Mayor. I'm going to have trouble providing an answer in silence. Uh, Sorry, the uh, answer will be heard in silence. <laughs> heard in silence. Excuse me. Um, uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, so, uh, over the past term, uh, there have been more than 120 meetings of council. And in fact, the, uh, the opposition has asked more than 500 questions on notice as well. And uh, we're all aware of the questions on notice that are asked every week and responses provided. And uh, we're at the situation now where there is a very clear contrast. There is an administration that has a clear record of delivery, a clear record of building infrastructure, of protecting and expanding green space, of delivering better public transport, uh, of improving our quality of life as a city, the lifestyle opportunities. And then on the other side of the coin, we have crickets. We have absolute nothing. And what has happened here is quite fascinating because there has been plenty of opportunity for uh, the Labor opposition to develop their policy agenda. They, uh, it was actually six months ago that they selected a, well, selected is a loose word, um, that they, that they um, parachuted in their current Lord Mayoral candidate. So they've had six months, six months uh, to come up with some policies to uh, enunciate a clear vision order, for the Chair. future. A point of order to you, Councillor Strunk. Yes, I think the question was about what this administration has done for the last four years, not about the opposition. <laughs> you mean the state okay, government IT contracts? Councillors, <laughs> uh, Lord Mayor, um, 
thank you, Councillor Strunk, for your um, assistance. But as I often say, I don't take submissions uh, from councillors. I always accept relevant points of order. I would say that the Lord Mayor still has a substantial amount of time left. Um, most of uh, his time so far has been spent um, him just receiving interjections rather than being allowed to answer the question. And I would like to be able to have as many questions today as possible. We didn't get through enough last week, in my opinion. I want to have a good number of questions today. I'd like the Labor councillors and the opposition councillors to stop wasting time so I can make sure they have proper, a proper number of questions this week. Lord Mayor. Well, thank you. And as I was pointing out, the, uh, the people of Brisbane can see the clear record of delivery of this administration uh, with the whole range of projects, large and small, that have been delivered and continue to be delivered. Uh, and whether it's a fantastic project like Kingston Smith Drive, which will revolutionise the way that people come into the gateway of our city and provide an incredible walking and cycling opportunity and a new boulevard and a gateway to the city with better travel times. One that, mind you, if Labor was successful at the last election, would not have happened, would not have happened, uh, but uh, one that will deliver uh, significant allow the Lord Mayor to be heard, please. improvements to the way that people can move around that part of Brisbane and indeed facilitate movement to and from the state government's Hamilton North Shore High Density Development Area. Uh, but whether it's the Brisbane Metro project, which is now underway, or the countless number of local suburban upgrades and park improvements, road upgrades out in the suburbs, road resurfacing programs, and a whole range of initiatives, people can see what has been delivered because it has, in fact, been delivered and it is underway. It is work that is happening or has happened. But what we have on the other side of the coin is literally no agenda, no ideas and absolutely nothing. And so I am looking forward in this council question time may be heard in silence, please. maybe to hearing some of what Labor might propose to do if they are successful. Because let's be clear, the way this works is that uh, in six weeks' time, the people of Brisbane will make a choice and they will choose between two competing agendas. And they will choose based on who has a positive plan for the city and, and a plan that has actually been released and a plan that is achievable and a plan that is fundable and a plan that is based on responsible okay. financial management Cassidy, experience sorry, and a record stop, of delivery. Um, I appreciate this is the last meeting of the session that people, again, last week we were the first one back for a while, so we were excitable. This week it's the first one, it's the last one for some time, so everyone's a bit keen to make their point. I appreciate that. However, everybody gets a right to make their point. Please allow all speakers to be heard in silence. Um, you, don't get, you don't make a point by trying to yell over someone else. It doesn't work. It makes no sense and it doesn't work. All right. So please allow the person answering the question to be heard. Lord Mayor. And thank you. And so I'm looking forward to this council meeting, seeing Labor finally. It's their last opportunity. It is the last opportunity for them to portray an alternative vision for the city, to portray policies, to put forward their stance on important issues. What are they going to do on the key issues affecting Brisbane residents? What is their plan for the future? Now is their opportunity. They have asked the questions. They have had countless questions. And in fact, I mentioned they put more than 500 questions on the notice paper asking for information on various things. And to me, uh, it's quite fascinating that out of those more than 500 questions, 105 of them came in last week. 105. Lord Mayor, your time has expired. <laughs> Further questions? Councillor Cassidy. Thank you, Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, according to a developer's statement to the C, published by the Courier-Mail, Councillor Kate Richards repeatedly pestered him to break Queensland law and donate to her March 2018 fundraiser. In December, she was disendorsed by your party over matters described by the president of your party as extremely grave. You have repeatedly backed in Councillor Richards and declared that nothing will stop her from being a member of Team Schrinner. Given the LNP stripped her of pre-selection, what deal have you made with Councillor Richards to keep her quiet? Lord Mayor. 
Oh, I thought the question was going to be on policy matters, yeah, Mr. Yeah. Chair. Um, I'm, I'm sorely disappointed. Uh, look, <laughs> I, I can simply add to what I've said before, which is various claims have been made, but people should be very careful about believing claims that have been unsubstantiated. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Allow the speaker to be heard, please. Gosh, just shouting out doesn't and, help and, you. And who is appropriate to actually assess the validity of those claims? The Triple C is the appropriate entity, and that is exactly what is happening. Now, Councillor Cassidy thinks he knows better than the Triple C, because when the Triple C comes out with a finding, say on Councillor Mackay, oh no, no, that's not good enough. That's not good enough. They want to play politics with the Triple C, which is exactly the type of thing that the Triple C takes a very very dim view about. And it's exactly what I'm not going to do, because we should okay, let them do their job. Councillors, again, I appreciate that um, people are enthusiastic. Now, Councillor Cook, please. I I've tolerated an unusually high amount of interjections. I I've done so because I know that this is an important meeting. I know that there's a lot of important things happening and that people have some points they'd like to make. Yet, at the same time, I think that we need to hear what the principal speaker is saying at the time. So please allow the speaker to be heard in silence, Lord Mayor. So there is a fundamental pr principle at play here. Let the people who are authorised, who are funded, who are legally equipped to do the job, do their job. And don't jump to conclusions and allow, and, and there's a couple of lawyers over there, and, and they, would have sat in, they would have sat in university and learnt the fundamental pr principle of the natural justice and the presumption of innocence. And it's funny order, because Mr. they Chair. can apply that principle when it comes Lord to Mayor. Jackie Trad, but not Lord to Mayor. a councillor. Councillor Shree, you have a point of order. I'm having difficulty here in the Lord Mayor over the shouting in the chamber. Thank you, Councillor Shree. As I've asked a number of times, um, I expect the courtesies that are often requested in this place to be shown and received by all councillors. I would like very much for the Lord Mayor to be heard. Um, uh, this question time, I think, is very important. They all are, of course, but this one in particular. And I'd like, as I say, to get through as many questions as possible. So I would like to cease these interruptions so we can get on with the business at hand. Lord Mayor, please. Thank you. If you need any further evidence that this question is just a party political slur, you just have to look at the hypocrisy at play in the Australian Labor Party, because they were quite happy to back the Deputy Premier to the hilt point of order. when she had point of order a Triple C investigation Cassidy, against Mayor, her. There is a point of order. Uh, Councillor Cassidy, your point the of order. The Lord Mayor's not answering the question. It was very, it was very simple. What deal has been done? Uh -huh. there's, there's an assumption at the heart of that question, um, which went, which was much longer. Your uh, premise was a lot longer than that simple question, uh, and the Lord Mayor is addressing um, the point you were trying to make. Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you. Uh, look, I, I thank Councillor Cassidy for reminding me of that part of the question, because most of the question was just slur and mud and innuendo, but. I will tell you, Councillor Cassidy, um, I'm not in the Australian Labor Party, so I don't do dodgy deals. Oh. We do not do deals, and no deals have been done, because we are not the Labor Party. We don't operate that way. We are in a party that prides ourselves on having the highest standards of integrity. Okay. Please allow the Lord Mayor to provide his answer. It's pretty straightforward. Um, there was a question asked. The answer is being provided. Um, the points of order, I'm trying to uphold them um, as they've come in on this question. Um, I, like many, would like to hear all the answers. I'd like to hear a lot of answers, both questions and answers, in the next 45 minutes or whatever's left. Um, and so I invite the Lord, I ask all councillors once again to allow the speaker to be heard in silence, please. Lord Mayor. Thank you. So uh, I, I say again, there has been no deals done. I say that unequivocally. So we are not the Labor Party. There are former Labor Party politicians sitting in jail as we speak. We pride ourselves in being different to that. Now, the party itself has a process which they will run through, but ultimately that process, like any process, is the subject to Queensland and Australian law. And that is the way it should be. And so the appropriate entity to determine 
this investigation and to progress it is actually doing that right now. That is the way it should be. And I say to Councillor Cassidy, stop playing politics. Stop the smear. Come up with some policies. Further questions? Point of order. Councillor Davis. Uh, Councillor Cassidy, a point of order. I move suspension of standing orders to allow me to move the following urgency motion. That Councillor Richards be stood down from all official positions in the Brisbane City Council pending the current Triple C investigation. Seconded. Sorry, excuse me, just give, us a, just give me a moment here. There is an urgency motion before us. Um, it's pretty straightforward what you're saying. You have three minutes um, to determine urgency. And once again, um, this is the point of this is urgency, not the substance. Um, this is a sensitive topic. I remind you again that um, you've all, all of us, all councillors have signed waivers that uh, indemnify the organisation against things that are said and that is on you, your person, if you say anything that is defamatory. I say that not expecting you to, but merely reminding you to, as I often do, uh, looking out for the well-being and the welfare of all councillors in this room. Um, Councillor Cassidy, your three minutes. Um, thanks, Chair. This is an extraordinary set of circumstances. The Lord Mayor just said um, why this is so urgent that we deal with this today, because this is the last council meeting before the next election. Last year, the LNP, the party that this Lord Mayor leads in this chamber, referred the chief whip of the LNP, a deputy chair of a committee, a deputy chair that sits in for the chair in civic cabinet, to the Triple C over what they described the party. This is what I described it as. This is what the LNP described it as extremely grave concerns over what could amount to corruption. Now, th that's their words. That's the LNP's words. Yeah. Now, now, why do we as a chamber and as a council have to deal with this? Because the Lord Mayor refuses to show any leadership. He says, when you ask questions about the integrity of council, when you ask questions about potential corruption, that's just political mudslinging. He doesn't want to hear any of that. He doesn't want to hear any of that. And I wonder why, Chair. I wonder why the Lord Mayor doesn't want to hear any of that. I appreciate that, but just back to urgency, please. Because this is the last council meeting before the election. Point of order. Point of order to you, Lord Mayor. <clears throat> If it's the last council meeting, it should thereby follow that all positions become vacant at the election. So this is the reason for it not being urgent right now. Uh, well, Lord Mayor, that's not a point of order. Um, um, and again, please, I will not take submissions as points of, points of order, What's as that? submissions to arguments. No, don't interject. Don't communicate with each other, right? Focus, Murphy focus, says, I don't no, understand. No, no, focus I understand the, that this is an issue. Focus, this is an issue about the integrity Cassidy, of the I Brisbane City Council. On the on the there are multiple councillors that have been referred to the Triple C now. The local government minister has referred a slew of other issues to the chair of the, um, of the corruption watchdog. This entire organisation is heading towards a Belcara-style investigation chair. That's how serious this is. The Lord Mayor laughs. He laughs when the integrity of this council is brought into question. He thinks it's funny. He doesn't care because all he is interested in is continuing to pocket ratepayers' money. Okay, he, all he is interested in is the wholesale why theft is it, why is of urgent? Brisbane no, ratepayers' money. That, that's not even near the topic that you, not even near the substance of the urgency motion. You're just saying words right now in, in an order that to make yourself feel good. Get back to why this matter has to, be, has to happen uh, now, So corruption is not a feel-good thing, Chair. I'm sorry. All those LNP councillors that are sitting here laughing when we're talking about the integrity of the Brisbane City Council, well, you're about to vote whether this motion should go through. You're going to get your feet on the sticky paper, and all the people of Brisbane will know that when you are asked to deal with issues of integrity and issues of corruption, you may, you may in fact vote in favour of this motion, but I suspect you won't. But the people of Brisbane will, will, are about to see where you truly stand just 46 days out from the next election chair, or whether the LNP is a party that thumbs its nose at allegations of corruption and integrity at this council, or if they actually take it seriously, and, and whether they think a councillor who was accused of, by her own party should be sitting in civic cabinet should be the chief whip of this council. Well, Councillor Schrinner thinks so, but should this council allow that to go on? We don't think so. I'll now put the uh, resolution. All those in favour of the, on the matter of urgency say aye. Aye. 
the contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Vision. Vision. Vision called by Councillor Cassidy. Councillor Cook, eyes to my right, noes to my left. Please ring the bells. Attendants, please close the bars. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the uh, noes have it. The voting being five in favour, 20 against and two abstentions. The noes have it. Please return to your seats. I believe that, the, that Councillor Davis was on her feet. Can, uh, just let me let the room settle some. <laughs> Councillor Davis, your question, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. My question is to the Chair of the Public and Active Transport and Economic and Tourism Development Committee, Councillor Adams. Deputy Mayor, can you outline just some of the achievements from the Public and Active Transport portfolio from the last four years, which demonstrate that only this administration has the leadership, experience and ideas to run Brisbane? And are you aware of any alternatives? The Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Davis, for the question. It's my great pleasure to stand on this last council meeting of this four-year term to speak about the incredibly productive four years the Public and Active Transport Branch of Council has had, to talk about the policies and the initiatives that we went to the last election with and we have delivered. And that is what is the difference between Team Shrina and the smears we hear from the Labor councillors. This includes $100 million through the congestion busting Better Bikeways for Brisbane program. We have extended Brisbane's network of safe and connected bikeways. Kangaroo Point Stage 1 on Little Dock Street. Botanic River Gardens River Walk in time for Christmas, which really enhanced the river, Brisbane River as a recreational and tourist destination. Of course, we can't wait to get started on the Indrapilly River Walk in coming months just as the West Bug Group emailed to me last Wednesday and confirmed that they can't wait for us to get started either. It's all about getting the feet off the pedal and onto the pavement, and we are giving residents more options to do this. And of course, that will ease congestion. That's why we announced uh, the last budget, five, well, just before the last budget, with Lord Mayor Adrian Schuna, five new green bridges across Brisbane. We delivered the preliminary business case last September for Kangaroo Point Bridge to show that it's going to be cost effective and have long lasting benefits for Brisbane. Not long after, we dive straight into the community consultation on the other four bridges, and we're fi finalising that report um, and body of work to release out to the community. Brisbane's first double-decker city cat has begun on the water, and that saw a major spike in city cat patronage, with 50,000 more people using city cats this financial year than last. Our second double-decker city cat is currently under construction, and we are continuing, not slowing down when it comes to the remaining five. On the bus front, our highly popular city glider services continue to grow in patronage every year, with nearly three million trips being taken on the blue city glider last financial year. In the beginning of May, we will have our brand new articulated buses on the road servicing this popular route, which will carry an additional 40 passengers, bringing the total to over 110 per bus. With this capacity, and high frequency service runs. This will be Brisbane's best and most popular bus service. Today we did the media, Lord Mayor and I, on the free off-peak travel for seniors, and it has been a phenomenal success. We've seen on average a 35 per cent increase each week on the seniors using 
the free off-peak travel from what we had this time last year on the buses. Thousands of seniors getting out of their home and into the community. Barriers like loneliness, financial issues, they can stop a social life. And this has given our seniors a new lease of life to let them travel around. So instead of putting their money down on the bus, they can put it down on a cup of coffee at the local cafe. Because Every senior citizen that trips around Brisbane is a senior citizen that's going into our local shops, into our cafes, into our small businesses. And then we see every resident in Brisbane being able to give the success of seniors being out in the community, helping our local economy as well. And last but not least, because I'll take the interjection from the Leader of the Opposition, Brisbane Metro is underway. It's been a trying time with the state government playing politics for nearly two years, but we are glad to finally have them on board. Of course, we can hear who the only people are in Brisbane that don't support the Metro. They're again interrupting and interjecting, and they don't want to hear it, Mr Chair. And I understand right, why okay, they don't want to okay, hear stop. it. Stop. Hang on, councillors. Deputy Mayor, please. Please allow the Deputy Mayor um, to be heard in silence. Um, the, the Council has been excellent for the vast majority of this uh, answer. I just ask that that level of courtesy be extended to the completion of the answer. The Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. I understand why they don't want to hear it, because the vehicles are locked in. The early works on the depot has started, and the early works in South Brisbane will be beginning as soon as we can get some dry enough weather. Brisbane residents deserve more than that rabble that we see on the other side of the chambers. I am absolutely shocked at the level that they have gone to in the last couple of, the last couple of days, but at the same time, I really shouldn't be shocked. Because when you run out of ideas, you just increase the smears. I have to say— OK, councillors. Hang on. Councillor Strunk. Please, um, I would, as I've said this, one of the reasons that I, I ask for silence is to make sure that you get as many questions, the Labor councillors get as many questions today as we can. And the, for some reason, for some reason, and Councillor Johnson, don't shout at me, please. No, Councillor Johnston, I'm not. I look after you more than anyone else in the room. Uh, everybody, uh, everybody knows that, 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 um, that you get looked after very well these days. Now, um, now I, I say this because, um, because I, um, I want uh, as many opposition questions, minority questions today as we can possibly get through. So please allow the speaker to be heard in silence so that we don't waste time. The Deputy Mayor. Thank you, you Mr seconds. Chair. Thank you. We, the residents of Brisbane, deserve a council who's going to build the projects needed for a growing city, not, an a, not a rabble of Labor councillors who rely on calling councillor colleagues dogs and criminals. We are going to build the Kangaroo Point Bridge. We are going to continue delivering cost savings for seniors. They are not worth the risk. We have every piece of work underway and we look forward to delivering our initiatives and policies into expired. the future. Councillor Johnston. Yeah, about time. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, three people have died in recent years on Ipswich Road and Venner Road in Annerley, and our community has petitioned repeatedly to slow traffic to 40 kilometres through Annerley Junction to improve safety uh, and numerous other requests for improvements. How many more people have to die? before Council will take action on one of the state's most dangerous roads. The Lord Mayor. Thank you, uh, Councillor Johnston. Um, I really don't think that the tone of that question was appropriate, um, given that Councillor Johnston actually knows what is happening here. Nothing. The decision on the speed limit is based on state government guidelines on how speed limits are set. And we have, in fact, written uh, to yes. Minister Bailey asking him uh, to request a relaxation of those guidelines. Uh, and that has occurred. Um, so we are relying on the state government to take some action here. We have done everything. 
Councillor Johnston, Councillor Johnston, I appreciate this is a very sensitive topic, um, and that um, people. I, I understand. No, thank you, Councillor Johnston. Um, I appreciate that, and I appreciate that this, this is something that's very important to you. But I just ask, please, that you allow the person providing the answer to be heard in silence. Lord Mayor. The suggestion that any councillor in this place does not care, uh, care when people's safety are affected or when accidents or injuries or deaths occur is just simply not true. It's simply not true. And Councillor Johnston knows what the process is here. She knows. So that's why I said the tone of the question is, is not really appropriate. Let me go through the history here. Uh, back in August 2018, Council met with TMR to discuss their guidelines for a change to the speed limit. Council raised instances of where the guidelines are resulting in a less than optimum environment for safety. TMR confirmed uh, that in this case, the stretch of road does not meet the guidelines and acknowledged the limitations of those guidelines. Then, following that, on 5th of September, Council wrote to TMR to request TMR review the guidelines to improve the traffic environment for safety reasons. No response was received. On Ipswich Road? Yep, on Ipswich Road. Uh, in, on the 15th of October, this is 2018, Council again wrote to TMR to request a further review of the guidelines. On the 25th of October, TMR wrote to Council saying an amendment to the guideline, uh, advising an amendment to the guidelines. However, this amendment did not change the situation for this particular stretch of Ipswich Road, because it was a high uh, and, and suggested a high active transport user area might be appropriate for this area. On the 30th of November, Council wrote to TMR again, uh, assessing the schools against the amended guidelines. On the 4th of February, Council wrote to TMR again, requesting an amendment or relaxation to the state guidelines. No response was received. On the 25th of February this, uh, last year, Councillor Cooper wrote to Minister Bailey, requesting a relaxation of the state guidelines. No response from the minister was received. On the 13th of June last year, Councillor Cooper wrote again to Minister May Bailey, following on for her from her letter on the 25th of February requesting a relaxation of the guidelines. In August last year, the minister responded, saying no to changing the guidelines. So, as you can see, there is a long history of uh, action from council, correspondence pleading with the state government to change their guidelines. And as, as recently as the 4th of February this year, Chair, uh, Councillor McLaughlin wrote to the minister, advising that. Councillor Johnston, Councillor Johnston, you, you Councillor Johnston, there's no, there's no benefit to shouting out about some other road. Please, um, the, the, you, you, you have asked the, you have asked a question regarding Venner Road on a number of occasions. Uh, it is my view the Lord Mayor is providing a thorough answer. I think that it would be for the best if it was provided to the room. Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you. Um, so uh, once again, Councillor McLaughlin, uh, now as the chair, uh, has written again to the state government, advising that our assessment of their guidelines is that um, Ipswich Road and that section would not meet the recommendations for a change and asking them to reconsider changing the guidelines. So uh, there is a very long history here, and the suggestion that council doesn't care or that nothing's been done is simply not true. What is really going on here is that Councillor Johnston appears to be protecting her mate, Mark Bailey. And you know, I, I don't know why, I don't know why, because an effective local councillor would sniff out the root cause of this problem and realise it's state government guidelines, and they would go into bat and they would go in and they would, at the countless local meetings and community events where they bump into each other, they would say, Mark, Councilor please Johnson. help me out here. Change the guidelines. Children's safety depends on it. But no, she hasn't done that. She's just Councilor chosen Johnson, to play Councilor, politics. Councillor Johnston, you made the same interjection over and over and over. You've asked the Venner Road question on at least 
uh, and I'll say multiple occasions, the answer was being provided to you. Um, the answer doesn't improve if you shout out while it's happening. Please allow the Lord Mayor to provide the answer to uh, something that I know is very important to you. Lord Mayor. All right. Thank you. Further questions? Councillor Huang. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. My question is to the Chair of the Infrastructure Committee, Councillor McLaughlin. Councillor McLaughlin, can you outline just some of the achievements from the infrastructure portfolio from the last four years, which, de which demonstrates that only this administration has the leadership, experience and ideas to run Brisbane? Are you aware of any alternatives? Uh, well, Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Chair, and to Councillor Huang for your question. Um, your Southside community has seen firsthand with projects like uh, Player Street, which we've talked about in this place, the, the leadership and experience this, that Team Trina provides for our city. Uh, um, Mr Chair, in 2016, this administration again set the infrastructure agenda to deliver across the four-year term more than $1.3 billion worth of infrastructure through more than 90 projects for our network including uh, projects like the upgrade of the inner city bypass, the busiest arterial road under council's control, uh, delivered with over $50 million in savings and more than 12 minutes travel time savings for public transport users. Council has delivered improved access to one of our city's greatest natural assets, the Brisbane River, through the river hubs at New Farm, the City Botanic Gardens and Dutton Park. The New Farm hub, on average, having more than 14 boats visit each week and more than 1,200 residents and visitors enjoying this improved access. Council has delivered an upgrade on Montague Road and Vulture Street at West End, an intersection that carries approximately 13,000 vehicles per day and more than 660 cyclists. Council has delivered an upgrade of Juliet Street and Ipswich Road at Annerley, the Perrin Creek Bridge for the Southside Pony Club and the final stage of the Progress Road Corridor at Wacol, a corridor with approximately 15,000 vehicles per day travelling along it, a primary freight access and B-double route with truck volumes along the corridor representing up to 14 per cent of traffic during peak hour. Mr Chair, Council has delivered on all the key recommendations of the Parking Task Force, including the phased rollout of enhanced curbside ramps at set-down areas on loading zones to improve access to and from the road for motorists and their passengers, as well as people with limited mobility, as well as for couriers, delivery drivers, customers picking up goods from shops. Council has installed nearly 3,500 LED lights, which deliver approximately 60 per cent energy efficiency at more than 407 sites across our bikeways and parks through Council's LED light program. Council has worked with schools to complete 196 TMPs, transport management plans, and is working with another 23 schools, while also delivering school safety upgrades to the McGregor and Indrapilly State Schools. Council worked with Logan City Council to deliver an upgrade of the Stapleton and Johnson Road intersection at Heathwood, including installing glider poles. Infrastructure is a shared responsibility, Mr Chair, for every level of government, and Council has been doing the job that is traditionally the state government's in delivering $7 billion worth of infrastructure that has, been and that has removed more than 120,000 vehicle movements off our surface roads and delivered three cross-river bridges, the Clem 7, the Go-Between Bridge and the Eleanor Chanel Bridge. Mr Chair, I was asked about alternatives, uh, and there are, there are some sig significant alternatives to this track record that we've seen over the past four years in particular and stretching back beyond that. Uh, we've seen, for example, the ALP's transport plan. What was that that came out in 2003? A four, they wanted a $400 annual parking space levy on the CBD and the city frame. They wanted tolls on a series of, of cordons across the city. They wanted tolls on major new roads. They wanted to take the fuel subsidy off motorists and premium charges for quality public transport. In relation to the 2018 Councilor transport Cassidy. plan, the opposition ALP shadow for public inactive transport, Councillor Cassidy, did not bother to submit the draft transport plan to, to put in a, a, a submission on the draft plan, nor did the opposition ALP shadow for infrastructure. But we, we've had submissions from Councillor Strunk and Councillor Cook. 
They were the only two ALP councillors who bothered to make submissions, but then they abstained from voting on the final plan. So this is their track record. Flip, flop, flip, flop. We've seen that in, with Councillor Cumming, who said but that the CBD should have a, a 30 kilometre an hour speed zone in the CBD. I said, said, said the CBD 30 kilometre an hour speed zone was too slow. Then we're going to uh, introducing that under, under Councillor Cassidy, who says that the Australian Labor Party will drop the speed limit to 30 kilometres an hour. We've seen flip-flopping Mr Chair on KSD. They demanded in the first instance that it be fast-tracked. Then they said they'd rip up the contract. Then they'd they, but the, the consequence of that, Councillor Cassidy, of your plan would have been condemning cyclists to driving on a, on a corridor uh, of Councilor road Cassidy, or please. condemning them to... OK, Councillor McLaughlin, stop, please. Please allow... Um, councillors, please allow Councillor McLaughlin to be heard. Um, I am having trouble hearing him. There is a lot of uh, noise at the moment, and I just ask once again... Um, there's often times in this place people ask for courtesy. And I ask for people to extend the courtesy to others that they would expect for themselves. Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Chair. I know we touch a raw nerve when we point out they're flip-flopping on these issues, and we've seen that time in, time out from the ALP. Flip-flop, flip-flop. No wonder that they're not making any headway with putting out policies in this place, because they have no policies. All they can do is deliver smear and innuendo. That, that's Count all they've Councillor got. Councillor McLaughlin, your time's expired. Further questions? Councillor Cassidy. Thank you, Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, in the three months to December 30, the LNP squandered $2.4 million of ratepayers' money on a feel-good saturation advertising campaign of Clive Palmer proportions. In fact, the wastage on political ads more than quadrupled in the month following Pat Condren being announced as Labor's candidate for Lord Mayor. In December alone, spending grew to $1 million, more than seven times the August figure. You are responsible for the systematic theft of millions of dollars from Brisbane ratepayers to fund your election campaign. Are you really that scared of Patrick Condren? Lord Mayor. Um, it was, I, I'm not sure whether that was a question or a statement or whatever, but I'm happy, I'm happy to answer it. Um, first of all, I don't know where Labor got their figures from. Um, they're probably like all Labor figures, which are completely made up, completely fabricated, because we've, we've heard Labor figures. They throw out figures like KSD is $100 million over budget. Wrong. They, they throw out figures like Metro's, like, uh, Metro's $20 trillion over budget. Wrong. They, they literally make stuff up. And so I'm not going to take their figures as gospel um, because I can assure you uh, any, uh, any um, in, I guess, inspection of the figures would prove that Labor does make stuff up. And, and when they get increasingly desperate and uh, they are concerned about the upcoming election, then they get even more, um, I guess, hysterical and they make even more stuff up and they make even more outrageous claims. Um, so, you know, some of the language that is being bandied around here is just, um, look, you know, so, some people would take offence. I don't. Uh, it's water off a duck's back. We're talking about labour here. We're not talking about serious operators. We're talking about labour. Um, but the reality is this. Here's what's happening. That labour doesn't want council to tell the residents of Brisbane about the great stuff council is doing. That's all. That's all that's happening here. That is all that is happening. And then this claim that this is somehow political advertising, um, hands up, hands up in a Brisbane ad, who has ever seen a politician? Hands up in a Brisbane ad, who has ever seen a councillor? Never, never. So um, the fundamental claim that it's somehow political advertising is a lie, it is false. And what they don't like is that council has a very effective program of communicating with the people of Brisbane. They simply don't like it. And, you know, we, let's, let's be honest about why that is, because they would prefer people to be kept in the dark. They would prefer people not to know about seniors' free travel. They would prefer people not to know about the double-decker city cat or Victoria Park or the five green bridges or the discount rate for first home buyers. They would prefer people not to know about what we're doing to revitalise uh, business areas and, and village precincts through the Better Suburbs initiative. 
They would prefer people to be in the dark about those things. That's what's happening here. And so they can bandy around any made up figures that they like. They can make any outrageous claims that they like. Those claims have zero credibility. Zero credibility. Because it is clear to me now, because we, you know, we're more than part of the way through question time. In fact, we're approaching the end of question time. They're not going to come out with an alternative vision. It is quite clear. Because from day one, they, they thought they could rely on Uncle Sterling up the road to win them the election. They thought they could rely on Uncle Sterling to win them the election. Uncle Sterling came forward with voting changes, which were based on a Labor Party report done after the 2016 council election. And then he came through with all types of other proposed changes as well. And now we're here in question time that Uncle Sterling is trying to cook up some kind of manufactured uh, investigation as well. Yeah. Well, let's hope that Uncle Sterling is as effective as he has been to date with all of this stuff, because everything he touches is botched. So uh, Uncle Sterling won't win you the election. Smear won't win you the election. Coming up with an alternative positive agenda for Brisbane will win you the election. I shouldn't be telling you this. I shouldn't be giving you the big tip, but it's true. And so you keep doing what you're doing. It's not making any impact whatsoever. You might get a few union hacks and trolls excited, but the people of Brisbane are turned off order, by Mr. what Chair. you are doing. Point of order. The people point of, of order. Brisbane order, are man. turned off. Could you bring point, the... Councillor Strunk, do you have a point of order? Yes. Could you bring the Lord Mayor back to the question? And that was about advertising, their advertising, not about George Street. Thank you. Lord Mayor, can I direct you back to the substance of the matter, please? And please uh, Mr Chair, there was no substance 30, of the matter 36, from the Labor Party. Seconds. Um, but look, the, the reality is we have run a very um, effective program of communicating with the residents of Brisbane, and it is a positive one. It's a, it's a program that is all about what we're focused on, which is making Brisbane even better. And people responded really well to it, which, which is why the Labor Party hates it. They are positive about the future of Brisbane and they want to know what their council is doing. They want to know. They want to get access to information. They want to know what they can benefit from when it comes to discounts on public transport and rates and support for small business and new programs like green bridges Lord and Mayor, parks. Your time has expired. Further questions? Point of order. Point of order, Councillor Cassidy. Oh, thank you, Chair. I uh, move the suspension of standing orders to allow me to move the following urgency motion that all Brisbane advertising immediately cease. Seconded. There is a, yeah, this is a, um, a pretty straightforward urgency motion. Um, Councillor Cassidy, uh, moved by Councillor Cassidy, seconded by Councillor Cook. Uh, you have three minutes. Once again, we do this a lot, but I'm going to take an opportunity to remind you again. Please keep your comments to the matter of urgency rather than substance. Councillor Cassidy. Thank you, Chair. This Brisbane advertising campaign is the systematic theft of public money. It is no, no more simple or complicated than that. What we have seen is the Lord Mayor engaging in the theft of public money to yeah, promote— well, Councillor Cassidy, again, uh, like I just said, urgency rather than substance, please. Continue. So the Lord Mayor is spending $33,000 each and every day on this Brisbane advertising campaign, Chair. So that's got to stop today. It should, have stopped. it should never have started. It should never have started, Chair, because this is an advertising campaign about nothing. This is a campaign that was designed by the Lord Mayor and his team in the LNP to promote themselves for the upcoming election. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is an exercise in astroturfing, Chair. They are trying to lull the people of Brisbane into a false sense of security, that everything's fine, nothing to see here. Please, sure. please, please vote for the LNP Again, at the I'm just upcoming gonna, just election, ask Chair. Come back to urgency, please. This is urgent because the Lord Mayor is stealing $33,000 a day from ratepayers to spend on his re-election campaign. $33,000 each and every day. The January figures are due out in just a few days, Chair, and we'll know um, how much further this systematic theft has gone uh, in promoting himself, Chair. We have never seen Point of advertising. Order. Point of order, uh, Deputy Mayor. I know you've warned, on, you've warned on defamatory, but this is absolutely imputing motive and is oh. offensive. 
Yeah. He's not. No, he's... No, thank you, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, Councillor Cassidy, once again, as I as I said a few times today, I appreciate this is the last uh, meeting of the session, um, and that you have um, some points you'd like to make. Um, but this is not really the way you do it. Um, please, if you if you wish to make these points, there's a number of forums. But in this instance, I must ask you to return to urgency. But also. Um, also, can I ask you to bring some proportionality to some of your comments as well? That they are a touch extreme, and I would like it if they were just a little bit more um, proportionate. Please, Councillor Cassidy. The Lord Mayor would make Al Capone blush. This is the worst theft I mean, we have ever seen in Brisbane's history. Uh, point, point of order, yep. Chair. A point of order to you, Councillor Murphy. Uh, Chair, this, this is defamatory, what Councillor Cassidy is doing. I know he's trying to uh, channel Donald Trump here, but it's not working, okay, it's Councilor ineffective, Murphy, and it's against the law. Point of order. Um, now, uh, Councillor Cassidy, I've got to say, I don't appreciate that when I ask you to be more proportionate and respectful in your comments, you become particularly outrageous. Um, so can I just say, look, I understand that you have a, a, a a public administrative point you'd like to make, can you please keep some sort of realistic notions to the things that you're saying? Councillor Cassidy. The Lord Mayor just said he didn't believe the figures that were produced on the news last night, the Nielsen figures that were produced. But in his own answers to questions on notice, it says here $3.5 million, Chair. So he's getting up here saying, oh, there's fake news everywhere, fake news, don't believe numbers. Well, he's saying don't believe his own numbers, Chair. $3.5 million is being spent on this advertising campaign uh, again, to promote him again, in the lead up to the election. This is more the substance but, rather than the, than the urgency. So, so, so it's but, urgent but to stop this theft out. now, Chair. It is urgent that not another day goes by where $33,000 a day is spent promoting the incumbent administration of this city. Chair. It's another day, another rort when it comes to this LNP. But that can all change on March 28, Chair, if people back Pat, if people get behind Pat Condren for Lord Mayor. Not only will the, the rorts that we see from the councillors opposite, Chair, the free Qantas clubs, the free cabs, yeah, the hundred okay. grand is, that goes council, in the Lord okay, Mayor's back pocket. These Councillor Cassidy, um, this is an, it, it, like this is not only it's not the urgency that you've discussed earlier, it's not even the substance you discussed earlier. So once again, you have 35 seconds left. Um, please um, have your comments focused upon why this matter must be dealt with right now. Because the Lord Mayor refuses, Chair. So as a council, we need to set a standard. So far, every, each and every time that we have asked this council chamber to set a standard that is acceptable to the community, if those opposite think these political ads are acceptable to the community, I feel like they've never had a conversation with a voter in the last three or four months, Chair. People out there are sick and tired of seeing the Lord Mayor shove over six million flyers since he came to office into their letterboxes with his face all over it. The cinema ads, the billboard ads, the ads that are running ad nauseum in uh, King Councillor George Cassidy, Square, time this has, has got to end. Uh, councillors, to the matter of urgency, all those uh, who support urgency say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Division. Division called by Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Cook. Eyes to my right, noes to my left. Please ring the bells. Attendants, please close the bars. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chairs, so the uh, noes have it. The voting being seven in favour and 20 against. The noes have it. Please return to your chairs. Further questions? 
Councillor Toomey. Thank you, Chair. My question is to the Chair of City Planning, Councillor Burke. Councillor Burke, the state government has released a new koala habitat mapping for South East Queensland, which clearly neglects to incorporate areas where koalas are known to live. Can you please outline our position on this mapping? Councillor Burke. Thanks very much, uh, Mr Chairman. I thank Councillor Toomey for the question. I, like many people across uh, this city and the country, were absolutely devastated by the scenes of thousands of koalas being killed on Kangaroo Island in recent bushfires and across the East Coast bushfires and the government-sanctioned clearing of land in Victoria, Mr Chairman. And that's why I would have thought that this state government would have taken a bit more time than the rushed regime of changes to the koala protection laws here in Queensland. Now, Mr Chairman, for the benefit of the chamber, uh, let's just go through a plotted history around these particular changes to the koala protection strategy and also the mapping. Uh, of course, this is the koala protection strategy that was out for advertisement over Christmas. So it went out on the 8th of December and closed in mid-January so that everyone could have their say on it, of course. Well, no, Mr Chairman, because most people at that time are clearly getting ready for Christmas, organisations are on shutdown and completely locked out of the ability to have their say on this important strategy on protecting koalas across not just our council area, Mr Chairman, but indeed the whole of the state. What was more galling, though, was the mapping that was provided, Mr Chairman. It went out for public consultation, do you think, for a month? Do you think for two months? Do you think for four weeks? Well, no. For two weeks, Mr Chairman, two weeks the mapping for koala habitat across this city went out for formal consultation from the state from the 8th to the 22nd of December, Mr Chairman. Again, right in that peak period before Christmas when people obviously are thinking about other things rather than these particular topics. That's why last Friday, when that mapping was gazetted and went live, Mr Chairman, local governments across the state and indeed Brisbane City Council raised concern because we have raised concerns through the whole of this process. This is flawed, rushed changes to protection of koalas that will actually have the reverse effect. It will have the reverse effect, Mr Chairman, for a number of reasons. The state government has ripped Category X vegetation out of protection. They've ripped remnant habitat out of protection, Mr Chairman, and most of that land is valuable habitat, well, uh, habitat fauna, sorry, habitat flora, Mr Chairman, and there to provide connections and corridors for the movement of animals across not only our city, but indeed the whole of the state, Mr Chairman. They ignored council's concerns. We clearly said you should not be touching Category X vegetation. Ignored, Mr Chairman. But what they didn't ignore, of course, is their own exemptions, Mr Chairman, which is absolutely outrageous when it comes to the way that this state government operates. So we as a council, when we're conducting projects, if we're building a new road, upgrading a park, providing a community facility, and we have to remove a koala habitat tree, we must pay offsets. But of course, in true to form style by the state Labor government, they've exempted themselves in their priority development areas, their state infrastructure projects, from having to pay a single dollar. So committed to protecting koalas in this state, Mr Chairman, that they exempt themselves from having to pay offsets to restore and replace the vegetation that they want to rip down. Just like they did on the Gateway North project, Mr Chairman, they lack the integrity to put their money where their mouth is and rebuild the uh, habitat for vulnerable animals across this city when they want to rip it out for their projects but expect everyone else to do it. Well, it's not good enough, Mr Chairman. It's not good enough. But it gets worse. You couldn't think that it would get worse, apart from the fact that they don't want to pay any money. It gets worse, Mr Chairman, because not only have they exempted themselves, but the provisions around the collection of offsets now mean that the state government get the koala offsets that are collected in the city of Brisbane. Do you think, though, that there is mandatory requirements in these laws to make that money be spent back in the local government area where it's collected? Bow, bow, wrong answer, Lord Mayor. There is not. So the state government can not only rip money out of Brisbane City Council area for koala offsets, but they don't have to spend it back in this local government area. So the koalas of Brisbane and this council's track record of investing and buying thousands of hectares of bushland, restoring bushland, this state government wants to take offsets and spend them in Redlands or in Logan or in the Scenic Rim, Mr Chairman, when the money has been collected here and should be off offset here in the Brisbane local government area. I mean, they have no, they, 
They have no heart. No, they have, well, I guess they have, they have no morals, Monsieur. I'm almost lost for words. But what's worse, Mr. Chairman, what's worse, Mr. Chairman, is this. That those opposite, that those opposite were so strong in their condemnation of the Lord Mayor about having to purchase a block of land at Nathan next to Tui Forest because the state government wanted to sell it and it was valuable koala habitat. Well, is that block of Councilor land Burke, mapped Councilor in this Burke, mapping? No, Councilor it's Burke, not. Your time has expired. That concludes question time. Councillors, I draw your attention to... Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order to you, Councillor Strunk. Mr Chair, I ask that the standing orders be suspended so that I may move a urgency motion calling on Brisbane City Council CEO and indeed the Lord Mayor to immediately implement strict guidelines to stop the flagrant misuse of banner pole sets by councillors for self-promotion. Seconded. Uh, <coughs> Look, it's, it's a pretty straightforward resolution, so I'll accept it. But, but also, we do have an agenda. Thank you, um, thank you, Mr. Piers. Um, we do have an agenda, uh, so I, um, I will, um, we will accept this urgency resolution. But uh, I, I trust that there's not an intention by the opposition to clog us down for a long time with urgency resolutions. Uh, Point Council of order. Point of order, Deputy Mayor. Could I just have the um, motion read again? It kind of was a bit garbled in the middle. Yeah, if that's I, fine. Could just read um, it uh, Councillor Strunk, could you please read your resolution again? Yes. Uh, and then at your conclusion, I'll invite okay. you to begin your three minutes. Yes, I move the urgency motion to call on Brisbane City Council CEO and indeed the Lord Mayor to immediately implement strict guidelines to stop the flagrant misuse of war banner polls by councillors for self-promotion. All right. That, so that uh, urgency resolution has been moved by Councillor Strunk. I believe Councillor Cassidy seconded that earlier. Uh, I see Councillor Cumming is on his feet. Point of order, Mr Chair. Did you, did you say point of order? Uh, excuse me, Lord Mayor, I must deal with them in the order that they occur. Why is your mic sorry, going on? Right, no. point of sorry, order to you. Sorry, Mr Chair. Uh, just your comments, and I'm just concerned about uh, this, you're pro proposing there's some limit on urgency resolutions that you are uh, going to arbitrarily impose on the meeting. Is that correct? Well, what I'm saying, Councillor Cumming, is we've got business to attend to, and if, and if the, the tactic of urgency motions is used again and again and again to talk about your agenda, I would, all I would say is I strongly it, ask that people would consider such things for general business rather it than... It could mean a late, late night, uh, Mr Chairman, but that's uh, within the rules of the Council to have late nights. Yeah. Thank you. I suppose. Look, uh, Councillor, as I said, I've accepted the urgency motion. All I'm saying is that, um, that we, have, we have work to do. All right? I know that's, Lord Mayor, you've got a point of order. Uh, look, I, I believe that we should have a short adjournment of this meeting to seek some advice because I believe this motion is incompetent. There already are strict guidelines in place, so it's a completely incompetent motion in my view. No, they, they, it, listen to the wording. Point, listen point to of the order, wording. Mr Chair. This is an incompetent okay, motion. Okay, look, hang on, hang on, hang on. All right. Councillor Shree, I, I sense that what's going to happen here is there's going to be effectively submissions about whether this urgency motion is accepted or not. Now, no, Lord Mayor, I must apologise. I have said that I will accept it already, so therefore I will accept it. Um, I will allow the three minutes, um, unless, of course, Lord Mayor, you wish to move a motion for an adjournment. Uh, yes, yeah, I move that this uh, meeting now adjourn so that we can seek advice point, on the point of order. On point the of legitimacy order. of this motion. Point of I believe order. It is incompetent. Okay. Second. Sorry. I, um, point of order. On, point of order. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Well, Councillor Shri, you yourself made a point of order, and please don't like shout at me from the, the, your seat. Now, who? Um, I have a resolution about a short, a short adjournment. Hang on, Councillor Johnston. Please stop yelling at me. Um, I have an adjourn, uh, have an, uh, an adjournment motion for how long, Lord Mayor? Was the time? I missed that from the shouting. Enough time as you need to seek advice. Thank you. Uh, Point of order. Why are you yelling, Councillor Johnston? Because you I keep barely, ignoring me. I, well, I haven't. I haven't been ignoring you. I have to do things in a particular order. All right. Okay, I have to do things in a particular order. All right. So I have an hour resolution. Point of order. 
I have a resolution from the Lord Mayor, seconded by the Deputy Mayor. I also now. Point of order. I, please stop shouting. Point of order. I, I have a point of order from Councillor Johnston. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr Chairman, um, the rules of procedure indicate that there is a motion on the floor um, for the suspension of standing orders that you have accepted. That means that standing orders are no longer in force while the urgency motion is considered, and the Lord Mayor cannot move a motion to shut that down. No, no, so, that, Mr Chairman, you no, have to allow the urgency no, no, motion no. to proceed before returning no. to the Councillor ordinary Johnston, course of business. Councillor Johnston, your assessment is wildly wrong. Um, the, the resolution is the resolution proposed is to suspend the standing orders. They're not suspended. They're not suspended immediately. It's, you know that. They've got to be accepted. Gosh, you know this. P you point know of order. this. Uh, all right, point look, of order. Okay, point of order. I'm going to make a decision. Point of order. Yeah, point of order, Councillor Well, Cassidy. perhaps you're about to make this decision, Chair, but the motion that Councillor Strunk moved and I seconded was for the suspension of standing orders okay. to establish urgency. We're, we're not debating, as you continue to point out, yep. the substance of that. So the Lord Mayor and the Deputy Mayor are, in fact, very, very wrong. All right. Now, now uh, we have to make a decision in the order, um, in the interest of, of uh, the carrying on of the business of this chamber. My preference is that we allow Councillor Strunk his three minutes. However, I do have a resolution um, to suspend the meeting while we get um, legal advice. And Lord Mayor, um, would I could I please ask you to withdraw that, and we'll just get on with the show, if that's all right. No, no, and we're just going to get this. We're just going to have this urgency and move on. At, is, is at, at your request, sure thing, I withdraw. Thank you. Councillor Strunk, can you please, you have three minutes to your urgency. Uh, thank you, Mr. Now. Chair. Thank you, everybody. Mr. Chair, this matter is urgent. Um, as the abuse of the ward banner polls by councillors is egregious and not, and not for the intent that they were installed. The barrier polls were installed specifically to promote and inform residents about events and programs by Brisbane City Council and non-for-profit community groups and organizations, as stated in a letter from the CEO, of orders, which yeah, I think is in I my think possession. Councillor Strunk, uh, Councillor Burke, I suspect I know what your point of order is, but I'll As, as interesting as this is, it is not to urgency. It's a substantive speech that he's I, I agree with that. Um, um, Councillor Strunk. Please, this is an urgency resolution, not a substantive resolution. Can you please limit your comments to why this matter must be dealt with okay. now? Councillor Strunk. Thank you. Mr Chair, this matter is urgent to stop the flagrant misuse of the banner polls, as I have an example here for all to see. Okay, no, that's not. Do, 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 I don't speak for my own enjoyment, all right? Um, unlike some people here, um, can you please, when I ask you to bring it back to the substance, excuse me, to the urgency mm -hmm. rather than the substance of the secondary motion, I mean that. Um, that wasn't an invitation for you to show people photographs. It was an invitation to return to why, why we must do this right now. Councillor Strunk. Yeah. Mr Chair, um, the matter is urgent because I received a letter from the CEO as late as yesterday that said there was no guidelines, definitive guidelines, for the banner polls in regards to what you can advertise. So I hope that puts the Lord Mayor's okay, okay. Everybody, at rest. Councillors, councillors, th that, that was... Um, as, a, as effectively an audience to that, that was pretty funny. Um, but please, um, can you allow uh, Councillor Strunk? Can you allow Councillor Strunk? I'd to, like to to say what he's come here to say. I'm trying to give you cover, Councillor Strunk. Please, please speak. Um, uh, you've got. Let me. How long has it got? You've got a minute. You have a minute fifty-two, and to uh, why this is urgent, Councillor Strunk. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Listen, I would like to table the letter from the CEO in regards to this issue because it is relevant to my urgency motion. Mr. Chair, the use of banner polls by councillors, the proper use of banner polls by councillors is something that the community really love. And when you use them for self-promotion, it is not within 
uh, it's maybe within the guidelines because there is no guidelines, but it's not any thinking, sensible person, common sense would say that you wouldn't use them to self-promote. Really? Correct. And for that is the reason I'm bringing this urgency motion to this chamber so that we get those guidelines in place before the election because the temptation, Mr. Chair, the temptation will be to break or not break, but to, I don't know, just to do whatever they want to do with the banner polls and promote whatever they want to promote. And in this case, my worry is they're going to promote themselves instead of those community groups and organizations and the very order. events Sorry. that those Strunk, banner polls a, were There's a point of order against you, Councillor Strunk. Lord Mayor, the point of order. Well, will Councillor Strunk take a question? Absolutely not. I've been interrupted <laughs> enough. Councillor Strunk, um, you have... Okay. Now, 48 seconds. The, 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 the banner poll that I held up was that of one that was put up on three banner poll sets by Councillor Owen, which, which clearly was, was not, here we go, which, which was clearly not what they were intended right, this, for, this again, and that was to promote here. events, to promote events and programs of this council. And it's, they were not put up there to put out a season's greeting message, to ingratiate oneself to their community. And that's exactly what it was all about. Councillor Strunk, your time has expired. Thank you. Councillors, I now... Point of order. Point, point of order, Councillor Griffiths. Sorry. We have to have um, a resolution regarding urgency. We have to have a vote on the resolution regarding urgency. Um, and I'd like to do that now. So all those in favour of this matter being urgent, say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. No. The no's have Division. It. Division. Division. by Councillor Strunk and Councillor Cassidy. Eyes to my right, nose to my left. Please ring the bells. Attendants, please close the bars. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the noes have it, the voting being seven in favour and 19 against. The noes have it, please return to your seats. That's that, that's a print of that. Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order, Councillor Griffiths. Yes, uh, I'd also like to move an urgency motion. So I move suspension of standing orders enable, to enable me to make the following urgency motion. 
that this council calls on the CEO to investigate the rorting of ward budgets by LMP councillors, including Councillor Kim Marks, Councillor Vicky Howard, Councillor Krista Adams and Councillor Lisa Atwood for blatant self-promotion and electioneering in breach of council marketing, communication and advertising policy. Seconded. I have an urgency resolution from Sorry, Councillor Sorry. Griffiths. You have three minutes. You have three minutes uh, as to urgency. Yesterday, I had a gentleman arrive at the ward office with one of Councillor Mark's uh, pictures that he'd removed from a park. And it seems that this is happening more and more by LMP councillors, that they are blatantly using council resources to self-advertise, to advertise and promote themselves in council parks. Uh, this point of order, Chair. Is that a dog point of order park? To you, Councillor Murphy. Uh, has Councillor Griffiths just admitted to being in possession of stolen property uh, uh, from Councillor Marx's ward office? Is that? No, it, it is. A, no, Councillor Murphy. Um, mm. That, it, it, while that may be the case, that is not a point of order. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, and I just ask you again. Can we? I, I just sense. No, hang on, hang on. This is not an invitation to shout across the room, right? Um, Councillor Griffiths. Um, I just sense that you're drifting towards the substance rather than keeping your comments to urgency. And can I just please ask you or take the opportunity to remind you that the, the motion, the resolution before us is regarding urgency again. Councillor and, Griffiths. And this is urgent because we have a council policy with regards marketing, communication and advertising. And in that policy, it says that there will not be, there will be no essential or advertising in the three, in, in the three months before the election. So a councillor can't go out there and deliberately advertise themselves in the three months before the election. But that is what's happening here, and that's what that resident was angry about. I've had another resident from Councillor Marks' area who says that Councillor Marks is electioneering I, I, using yeah. her letterhead. This is probably Sorry, this is breaking item. a state Just legislation. Why? Why is it urgent? Why must we deal with it now? That's all, Councillor Griffiths. <laughs> this is urgent because council seems to be ignoring it. The majority LMP council or councils in this place seem to be able to get away with anything, be able to do any advertising they want wherever they want, and it seems to be that it's ticked off. I'm asking the CEO and to take action on this, to stop the LMP councillors from rorting their budgets from misusing their budgets against council policy. Similarly, Councillor Vicky Howard, lovely big photo of Councillor Vicky Howard in the cinema, in the cinema in the last three months, advertising herself. This is not appropriate according to our own guidelines, according to Brisbane City Council guidelines. Similarly, another ad for Councillor Vicky Howard in her electorate, advertising Councillor Howard on the side of a phone booth. Once again, this is again, misuse I mean, look, of... Look, Councillor, uh, Councillor Griffiths, I've been pretty generous, but again, can I just bring you back to urgency? Um, the, 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 the last 30 seconds have been substance. Please, urgency. This is urgent because so much of it is happening and because it seems to be that this council is turning a blind eye to it and because we are getting closer to an election. This is misuse of ratepayers' money. That's what it is. That's why this is urgent. This is misuse of ratepayers' money against our own guidelines. And like this one here of Councillor Krista Adams is like Broadway driving down Ipswich Road. A massive sign advertising Councillor Krista I get, I get, Adams. I get the point Once you're making, again, this Griffiths. is misuse. Councillor Griffiths, I get the point you're making, but, but that would be, this would be something that would happen in the substantive debate, not the urgency debate. And can I just ask you again, please come back to urgency. This is urgent because we are approaching an election. We are, in, we are at the last council meeting. There has been no drive from this Lord Mayor or this administration to do anything about ensuring we follow council's own policy, particularly for LMP councillors. It's absolute rorting of ward budgets. It's rorting of ratepayers' Councilor money. Councillor Griffiths, your time has expired. I will now, uh, to the matter of urgency, all those who believe this matter is urgent say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. No. The noes have it. Division. Division. The division called by Councillor Cook and Councillor Cassidy. Eyes to my right, noes to my left. Please ring the bells.
Johnston, please don't. Um... Attendants, please close the bars. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the noes have it, the voting being seven in favour and 20 against. The noes have it, please return to your seats. All right, is there any more urgency resolutions? Point of order, I knew Mr. there Chair. would be. I knew there would be. All right. One more urgency resolution. There might be more, Mr. Chair. Um, There's more, Mr. Chair. Oh, really? Um, all right. Well, well, I guess, Councillor Cook, I'd like to hear your urgency resolution, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the suspension of standing orders to allow me to move the following urgency motion that the Lord Mayor condemn the Deputy Lord Mayor, Councillor Krista Adams, the Councillor for Holland Park, for the blatant rorting of ratepayer funds through billboard advertising directly in breach of Council's policy. Seconded. Oh, gee, that's a lot like the last one. And it's, we just it's had a resolution. Condemning. We just had Mr. a resolution that, that knocked back the one that was immediately like it. Um, oh. It's just that it's just the thing is that when we have urgency, a series of urgency resolutions, the problem here is um, they're, they're effectively the, it's effectively the same thing as what we just had, which we just had a resolution of the council um, against it, right? So, um, Board of order, Mr. Chair. I think this one I'm going to have to ask for an opinion on because, as I say, um, it's just so substantially close to the other one, and that if that. That, as I said, uh, I don't mind urgency resolutions and I don't mind talking about these things. But the problem is, oh. is that if we keep them, keep, if, if they're effectively identical one after the other, we can spend a lot of time talking about the same things that, and they're not in the agenda. So, can I please have a resolution um, to um, for a ten-minute interval so that we can just check that resolution? Uh, just a point of order that adds to this. Uh, it, it's also worth asking whether council can require me to condemn something. You could say this council condemns. But you can't ask me to condemn my deputy mayor. You can vote on that. You can vote okay. on that. You can't ask yeah. me to condemn. Yeah, it's I a ridiculous understand. motion. I, I do understand okay. the point that you're making. I will make. Um, I'll make that part of my request. But I just want. Um, uh, I just want. I do. I would like some time to reflect on whether whether this new urgency resolution is substantially the same as the one immediately before it. Um, I move that we adjourn for a period of 10 minutes or as long as it takes for the chair to clarify um, the uh, motions before us. Seconded. Um, it, there's, there's a resolution that we take a small adjournment to determine, um, determine the uh, rules, and legality, uh, rules and legalities around this particular resolution. Councillor Cook, may I please have a copy so that I can show it to the legal uh, team? You don't have a copy? Okay. Uh, I trust. Uh, all right. Look, I'll just put the resolution for the for the adjournment. It is a procedural motion. All those in favour, say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Thank you.
and um, I'd like to thank you for uh, your generosity in allowing us a moment just to reflect on the rules to make a decision. The rules are silent as to whether uh, a uh, urgency motion that's effectively identical to the one before can be moved consecutively. Um, and because the rules are silent, there are other rules that allow the good management of the meeting, which if there's a third one that's effectively identical, we can deal with that. But I will allow, um, because the rules do not expressly identify uh, any rules around this, I will allow it. Um, um, Mr. As I say, thanks, Councillor Cook. As I say, I try my best for this to be a debating chamber, and I try to have uh, a bias towards the more open interpretation um, of the rules. However, please don't take advantage of my generosity. Councillor Cook, to urgency, please. Uh, point of order, Mr Chair. Yes, point of order to uh, you. Thank you. Uh, in light of your comments earlier, I'd like to withdraw that urgency motion. Okay. Thank you. And uh, make a fresh urgency motion. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, but Mr. you do understand Chair. that I have allowed Thank you. Okay. I do. Right. I do, okay. Mr. Chair. I do, Mr. Chair. I've reflected on your wise words and counsel. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you. Uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I move the suspension of standing orders to allow me to move the following urgency motion: that this council ban billboard advertising utilising ward office budgets. Seconded. All right. Three Mr. minutes to urgency. Please. Thank you, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, this is urgent because every day in this city, across the city, this LNP council is rorting the residents of Brisbane with billboards that are blatant political advertising and shameless self-promotion. It is time for the Lord Mayor to take a stand against the rorts and against his own deputy, Councillor Krista Adams, uh, the councillor for Holland Park, who has been uh, blatantly disregarding Council's own policy on this issue. Mr Chair, we've just heard uh, my colleague Councillor Griffiths talk about uh, these rorts mm. and this very large electronic billboard featuring a large name and photo of Krista Adams appeared on Ipswich Road with a large BCC logo, no party endorsement and citing a Council email address. Mm. So, Mr Chair, it is clearly a council paid ad, paid for by the yeah, ratepayers of I, this city. I understand that, but can I just, I'm just going to bring you back to urgency, please. It's urgent, Mr Chair, because it's not even happening in her own ward, Mr Chair. It's on Ipswich Road using ratepayer funds, and it is a blatant rort. This is urgent because we are coming up to the election. It is non-essential advertising. I would love to hear a contrary view, Mr Chair, mm. and if the LNP want to support this motion, um, we would be happy to have their support on this today. Uh, this billboard was seen on the 3rd of February at 8.57pm, clearly within the three months of an election. Others have been spotted across the city, Mr Chair, uh, none of those from people on this side of the chamber. Uh, it seems to be an LNP exclusive, these billboards, Mr Chair. Um, this is urgent because it's wrong. It's wrong and it needs to stop. It's happening across the city. Ipswich Road, as we've heard today, has got some serious issues that need addressing by this council. These monies would be best spent on issues affecting the residents of this, issue, of this city, yeah. not on blatant political advertising and rorting of ratepayer funds. Today, we've heard Bruce Better has cost us $3.5 million again, in recent months. Can I just bring you back? Just, uh, just to ur urgency, $3.5 million. Uh, and again, I mean, Bruce Better, it's even, no, sorry, Councillor Cook, even if we were talking about a substance, Bruce Better is th this. this the substantive resolution behind the urgency resolution talks about ward offices as well, which Bruce Better is not part of. So can I just ask you to bring it back to urgency, please? It's urgent because there are millions and millions of dollars that could be spent in many other ways across this city actually helping the people of this city. Mr Chair, if this was money going to a local club to support their enterprises as a sponsorship opportunity, that's a different thing. This is an electronic billboard that says supporting our community. The money is going to private enterprise. It's not going to support a charitable club. It's not uh, going Councilor to Cook, support a sporting expired. club. Uh, can I please now put the resolution on the matter of urgency? All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. no. 
No. The noes have it. Division. There's division. a division called by Councillor Cook and Councillor Cassidy. Eyes to my right, nose to my left. Please ring the bells. Attendants, please close the bars. Clax, please read the result. Mr. Chair, the uh, noes have it. The voting being seven in favour and 20 against. The noes have it. Please return to your seats. Council, I draw your attention to the consideration of committee reports. The Establishment and Coordination Committee, please. The Lord Mayor. <clears throat> uh, thank you, uh, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting held on Monday, 3rd of February 2020 be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by the Lord Mayor, seconded by the Deputy Mayor, that the report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting dated Monday, the 3rd of February 2020 be adopted. Is there any debate, Lord Mayor? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, As I referred to before uh, in question time, uh, it is the last meeting of the term. Uh, and I wanted to take this opportunity, um, it's the last ENC report um, this week of the term as well. Uh, and I want to take this opportunity to thank my colleagues in ENC for the hard work they've done. And in fact, uh, my colleagues in the wider team for the incredible work they've done over the last four years and their commitment to Brisbane and their dedication. As you know, uh, ENC um, sets the tr strategic uh, approach for Council, the strategic direction, and plays an important role when it comes to setting the policy agenda and the projects and initiatives that go forward uh, from this Council. And uh, uh, we've done exactly that, and it is very clear uh, what we stand for, what we're delivering, and what we're focused on going forward. It has been a term of council in which this uh, particular administration, first under the leadership of uh, Graham Quirk as Lord Mayor and more recently uh, with myself as Lord Mayor, has set out a bold and long-term vision for the city. We've delivered on our promise to uh, purchase 750 hectares of bushland, which is the equivalent of uh, 100 Suncorp stadiums. And we've heard today what the state government's approach is when it comes to protecting koalas. Uh, they uh, believe that they should be exempted from any requirements to uh, protect koalas. They should be exempted not only when it comes to state government priority development areas, but also when they're doing a road upgrade or a, or a state project, they shouldn't have to contribute to offsets, even though council has to, even though uh, property developers and other builders do. Uh, so the contrast couldn't be clear. We're getting on with the Brisbane Metro project. Uh, we awarded the tender for the Metro vehicles last year, uh, and that uh, project is moving forward and underway. We've seen early works kick off, and they will continue uh, in 2020, and it's a very exciting new stage for the project. We're moving forward with the Oxley Creek transformation project. And this is one of the little known uh, projects that the city uh, is undertaking, which will make such an incredible positive difference uh, to uh, a large part of the city. Uh, and also we're kicking off and, uh, uh, a work on the, um, or more work on the Norman Creek Master Plan, in particular around Hanlon Park as well, uh, which is very exciting. And we've done so much more though than just keeping our 2016 election commitments. Uh, we have introduced, uh, since April last year, 
a bold new vision and agenda for the city that is focused not only on the coming months or the coming years, but the 5, 10, 15 and 20 year agenda for the city. Uh, and that includes on the very first day uh, as Lord Mayor, the commitment to building five new green bridges and the commitment to undertake a record investment in parkland and green space. And we are doing exactly those things. We're moving forward with the Green Bridges project. Uh, we are moving forward with the acquisition of new land for parkland. Uh, we are rolling out our vision for Victoria Park. And that is a vision that has been embraced by the community. And uh, we, we have seen 16,000 people involved in that engagement process and more than 5,500 submissions as well. So uh, people are coming on board. Uh, we've also delivered a rates cut for first home buyers. Uh, we've lowered fees for small business. We've introduced a new, a new local buyer procurement policy. We're investing in our suburban shopping villages. We've delivered free off-peak travel for seniors. Uh, we've delivered the first of many new double-decker city cats, which is now on the river. And I'm very proud of the fact that this vessel was not only designed here in Brisbane, but it was built in Brisbane by Brisbane residents. Uh, and it is the first of many more to come. Importantly, uh, this administration and its predecessors have overseen 16 balanced budgets in a row. Now, no other level of government has managed to achieve that. Uh, and that is a quite clear, distinct record for council. Now, the Labor Party has peddled in the past uh, the claim that, oh, no, we're, we're legally obliged to run a balanced budget. That is not the case. We're, there is no legal obligation to run a balanced budget. And I probably shouldn't have told Labor that because we know what they'll do if they ever get in. They'll be running up deficits before you can blink. But as I reflect on the coming six weeks and indeed the coming years, uh, I mentioned before that I was hoping that question time would be uh, an opportunity for Labor in this last council meeting of the term to enunciate and put forward an alternative vision. Even a snippet of an alternative vision, even a little morsel of an alternative vision, a taste, a sniff, a whiff, but we got a whiff of something else. Um, and it was the mud and the muck and the smear and the personal attacks. Uh, and that is all we got. But the people of Brisbane do have a choice to make in six weeks time. And they will make that choice based on what it means for Brisbane. And they will rightly ask, what does Labor actually stand for? What would they do if they are elected? And people should be asking that question. People really should be asking that question. Uh, what is Labor's policy on protecting green space and koalas? Is it the same as the state government policy? Or do they have a different one? We don't know. Uh, will Labor scrap the fully funded Brisbane Metro project? Will they? They have announced a review, which is a you know, classic Labor trick when they don't really want to say they're against it, but they want to can something. Uh, let, me, let me be clear. When when we say Brisbane Metro is underway, it's underway to the tune of 115 million, which is the latest investment that this city has made in the project. That's how much has been invested. So when Labor says nothing's happened, well, $115 million worth of investment and work has happened. And so if Labor refuses and fails to commit to delivering and continuing the Brisbane Metro project, that is $115 million of ratepayers' money down the drain. And we've seen this happen in other states in Australia where they have cancelled major projects, costing taxpayers dearly for that mistake. Now, isn't it funny that Labor likes to talk about things like um, the benefits package that they introduced when they were in administration? Um, the, the one that they introduced and the one that suddenly they are against and they call it a rort. This is their this is the Labor benefits package. And, and they like to attack the rules of council, which they all use to their benefit, yet now suddenly there's an election coming and they're against it. And they like to say that ratepayers' money is being wasted. But the amount of ratepayers' money involved 
in Brisbane Metro is $115 million. And that is what is going to be wasted if Labor gets in. $115 million. So let's not talk about banners or signs or allowances. Let's talk about $115 million that is at risk uh, if Labor is successful in getting into office. That is not small change. And that also raises other questions. Will they invest in upgrading roads? We know that they are desperate for Greens' preferences at this election. They are desperate. And we know what Labor will do to strike up a deal for preferences. They will sell their soul. And so what does that mean? Are they going down the anti-car, anti-motorist path of the Greens? We wouldn't know. The only thing that we are aware of is a little taste. And that taste is that they are going to drop inner city speed limits to 30 k's an hour and they are going to roll out bike lanes in the CBD. This is one of the few policies they've actually announced. But having said that, no one can work out whether they have promised bike lanes or just a study into bike lanes, because their Lord Mayoral candidate announced a study into bike lanes, and then their candidate for Central Ward announced that they would roll out bike lanes. So I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know which one it is, but I think what they are doing is they are gearing up uh, to get in bed with the Greens, to get those preferences. Uh, they know that Uncle Sterling wasn't able to get their preferred voting system in place, so now they're actually going to have to work for the preferences. And just wait, they'll, they'll be going down the anti-motorist, anti-car path before you know it. Uh, Lord Mayor, your time has expired. Thank you. Move for an extension. Seconded. There's been, there's been an extension of time moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Marks. All those in favour say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Thank you. Lord Mayor. Uh, but there are far more unanswered questions as well. And these are basic fundamental things which Labor has not said a peep about. Will they continue the free seniors off-peak travel or will they cancel it? Will they scrap the rates discount for first-time home buyers, or will they, will, will they support that, or will they scrap it? Uh, will they progress the Victoria Park vision, or will they scrap it? Will they commit to building five green bridges, or will they scrap the program? Uh, will they keep the Green Future Fund, or will they scrap it? Because they have already said in the past that they will scrap the City of Brisbane Investment Corporation, and to me that means they will scrap the Green Future Fund. They will scrap the fund that is supporting investment in new parkland. And more importantly, it comes back to the issue I raised before. Will they commit to running surplus balanced budgets, or will they take this city into deficit? Our record is clear. Every LNP budget has been a balanced budget in surplus. Every LNP budget has been a balanced budget in surplus. But on the other side of the coin, Labor's record on financial management or mismanagement is very clear. Whenever they have gotten into government at other levels of government, they have run up deficits. They have sent the budget into deficit. And I have no doubt they will do the same thing in council. Hang on, Count Councillor Johnson, you've been, out, you've been out of the room most of the speech, please. Can you just allow the speaker to be heard in silence, Lord Mayor? But here is another really important question, Mr Chair. If Labor is successful in the election, who would make up their civic cabinet? Because the last time I checked, there were eight members of civic cabinet. Uh, Labor only has five councillors. How's that going to work? So what that means is this. There's two options, really. What this means is this. Option one, minority administration with Councillor Shree and Councillor Johnston pulling the strings and holding the balance of power. And more scarily than that, those two in civic cabinet. Because they don't have the numbers. They don't have the numbers amongst their sitting councillors to fill a cabinet. So guess what? Jonathan Shree, the chairman for infrastructure. Hang on. Councillor Johnson, please stop shouting out. Lord Mayor. 
Uh, and it is a legitimate question. So if, if they're going to rule out um, dealing with Councillor Shree and, and Councillor Johnston in that way, then what is the other alternative? Councillor Johnston, please. Lord Mayor. What is the other alternative? The other alternative is that they will put some of their candidates straight into cabinet. People with, people with no experience in council will suddenly, will suddenly be running Australia's largest council. And, and look, I'll take that interjection because not only did Campbell have a career in the military, he also had a distinguished career as an engineer and as a business person. And he did a fantastic job as Lord Mayor of this city. And it'd be nice if Labor had candidates like Campbell Newman with actually right, some okay. experience. Um, but what they've got is someone who thinks they can run the city from a Twitter account. And someone who thinks that the job of Lord Mayor involves showing up to one press conference a day, waving your hands around a bit and then going home. There's a little bit more to the job than that. You can't run Australia's large, largest council via Twitter or via press conferences. That is a fraction of the job. What, 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 what about when it comes to all of the things that we all do as councillors on a day-to-day -day basis, the work we do out in the community, all of the meetings we go to, all of the work we do supporting our community? Even Labor councillors know that. Their Lord Mayoral candidate doesn't know that. Um, because he's not involved in any of that and has no interest in that. So what we've seen here is not only a Labor team with no experience, not one of them has ever been in administration or in cabinet. Now, Councillor Cumming, to his credit, has been in administration, but he wasn't in cabinet. But get, look what they did to Councillor Cumming. It was the, the night of the long knives. The one person who has actually been in an administration, the one decent Labor councillor, got knifed in the back on Riverfire night. Yep. And then they knifed their Lord Mayoral candidate. And I've got to say, look, everyone has a view on Rod Harding, but I give him credit for coming around a second time. I give him credit for his commitment to say, I ran, I didn't get it, but I'm going to go again. Credit to him. Credit to him. And at least he showed an interest in Brisbane City Council. Their current Labor candidate for Lord Mayor, in fact, likes to boast that he didn't actually want to be the candidate and he was approached by the Labor Party. He's like, oh, look, I didn't really want the job, but they tapped me on the shoulder. They, they approached me. I didn't want the job, they approached me. And I would think that the people of Brisbane should want a Lord Mayor that actually wants to do the job. One that is passionate about doing the job. One that has some ideas and plans for the city. One that actually wants to do it. Okay, Councillor Strunk, uh, please uh, allow the speaker to be heard in silence. Lord Mayor. So uh, they have taken away an experienced leader of the opposition and a relatively experienced Lord Mayoral candidate and replaced them with two completely inexperienced people. And they expect the people of Brisbane to have confidence that those people can lead a team that runs Australia's largest council, manage a $3.1 billion budget. That should scare the hell out of any Brisbane resident. The prospect, the prospect of Australia's largest council being run by people with no experience. And, and this is a legitimate question that every voter will be asking, every voter should be asking uh, as we go forward. Now, the only thing that we've seen this meeting um, is the continuation of uh, the mudslinging, the attacks, the name calling, uh, and, and it's reached a whole new level. Yesterday, the leader of the opposition was calling us dogs, yeah. dogs. Now, like I said before, I have a pretty thick skin. Um, it's water off a dog's back, but is that really appropriate? 
Is that really appropriate? And All right, come on, okay, Mayor now, no name calling, please. Lord Mayor. And uh, earlier in the meeting, um, I was compared to Al Capone. Uh, yesterday, I was compared to the Godfather. Um, and, and, and look, the Godfather, fascinating series of, um, of movies. But my favourite quote from the Godfather is something that maybe Councillor Cassidy uh, should learn from. The, uh, the Godfather said, never hate your enemies. It affects your judgment. And that is exactly what's going on here. These, these people are motivated by hatred, uh, motivated by spite. Uh, they're, they're only interested in personal attacks and mudslinging. And, and that is not is what required to run Australia's largest council and to take our city forward with a positive plan. Uh, there is nothing of that sort that has come from the opposition uh, and they're running out of time. Six weeks to go. They've had their candidate uh, since September last year, six months out from the election. And at this point, with a matter of weeks to go, no policies, no agenda and nothing uh, but mudslinging. Our administration uh, is fuelled by delivering infrastructure, uh, enhancing our parkland and green space, building new bridges, delivering better public transport, uh, and it's fuelled by responsible financial management as well, and that will continue. But most importantly, is fuelled by passion and experience, which is really uh, two of the most important ingredients when it comes to running Australia's largest council. And so I had hoped that today would be different. Um, I had hoped that we would have a debate, a genuine debate, about the future of our city and some positive initiatives. You know what? I, I would love it if Labor brought out another light rail plan. You know, let's talk about that. Let's, let's debate the pros and cons. Brisbane Metro versus light rail. Let's have that debate. I'm comfortable with that. I would appreciate it if Labor brought out another way of delivering uh, green space and parkland, an alternative vision for Victoria Park. That's fine. We can debate those things. We might not agree, Lord, Lord Mayor, but time at expired. least we can move for an extension. An extension of time has been seconded. Moved by, been moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Marks. All those in favour, um, say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Lord Mayor, please continue. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would appreciate it if they, if we could have those debates. And we're, we are up for those debates. We've been up for those debates for months and months. Uh, and so it is quite shameful that on the last meeting of council, in the last session of this four-year term, that it was about banners. It was, lit it was literally like the battle of the banners. And you know what? I, I can easily wave around all of the examples of Labor hypocrisy. You know, the Councillor Cassidy banners I assume funded by the ratepayer that are up on state government property on state schools, advertising himself with his smiling mug on the, on the fence of a local state school. And there's a couple of them here. Or I could show you the Councillor Charles Strunk banner in a park. I, I literally, I, I will give it context. I will give it context because I acknowledge that Councillor Strunk admitted that there needs to be guidelines because some councillors can't resist the temptation to self-promote. Right. And he was speaking from experience there because he obviously can't resist the temptation to self-promote. Neither can any of those Labor councillors. Or I could show you the photos of the Kara Cook billboards all around the place. Every school and community group has her face on it, I assume funded by the ratepayers. But that's OK. That's OK. One rule for the administration, one rule for them. They basically are quite happy to do all of these things. They just don't want us to do it. But, but all of this is pathetic. All of this is pathetic. I'm not interested in a battle of the banners or a battle of the billboards or a battle of the signs. I'm interested in a battle of ideas for the future of our city. I wanted to stress the importance of ensuring that uh, the alternative administration has a clear plan and agenda. I wanted to make the case, but I think today what we've seen is that 
Labor has made a far better case than I could ever have made because they squandered this last meeting of council on banners and on smear and on trivialities where they are proven quite easily to be absolute hypocrites. They talk about allowances and rorts. They, they are the ones that introduce these things. They talk about misuse of banners and signs. They're all doing it themselves. It's pathetic. It's pathetic. Uh, uh, Councillor Johnston, please, J just allow the Lord Mayor to speak. Lord Mayor. And so going forward, uh, my commitment to the people of Brisbane and the commitment of the entire Team Shrinner is that we will continue to focus on the things that are important to people out on the streets. And I can tell you they're not banners and billboards. They're not the minor things that Labor has been talking about. They are the things that make a difference in people's lives. They are the plans to build a better Brisbane, to deliver a better Brisbane. And guess what? The people of Brisbane want to know about those plans. And when we tell them about those plans, Labor attacks that as well, because apparently we're not allowed to talk to the residents of Brisbane. We're not allowed to communicate about those plans. Uh, so we will keep focusing on those things. Uh, that is my commitment to the people of Brisbane. That is the commitment of the entire Team Shrinner. I uh, also wanted to talk about, uh, as I usually do, some of the council assets that are being lit up for great community purposes. Uh, on Friday and Saturday this week, Redicliffe Place, Victoria Bridge and the Story Bridge will be lit, lit up red to support the 75th anniversary of the fall of Singapore. Uh, the uh, Second Tenth Field Regiment Association uh, remembers this event um, and we acknowledge the soldiers, sailors, airmen, women, nurses who lost their lives uh, in the Second World War battle for Singapore. On Sunday and, uh, and Monday through next week, we'll light up the Victoria Bridge Story Bridge and the Tropical Dome in light and dark blue, as well as pink, in support of the uh, International Cricket T20 Women's Cup uh, World Cup prep. Uh, Brisbane has been chosen as the women's preparation hub in the lead up to the ICC T20 World Cup in February, uh, and that's happening at the Allen Border Field. And I wanted to give a shout out to the Aussie women's team who will play against India, Pakistan, West Indies and Thailand. So uh, good luck to that team. I'm sure you'll do us proud. I also uh, wanted to acknowledge uh, two members of the team as well. Um, in particular, or well, to start with, um, Councillor Matthew Burke, who has been an invaluable, important member of our team since his election in 2008. Uh, and he has served in a number of chair roles as part of Civic Cabinet. Uh, but the thing that I will always remember that stood out to me uh, with Councillor Burke uh, is the work that he did during the 2011 flood out in his community. Uh, and that, you know, it is really, you know, when the, the rubber hits the road, the test, uh, he was out there uh, helping residents in need, um, just coordinating the efforts in his area. And I know that his residents in his community will never forget uh, that work that he did. Uh, but he has also been, as I mentioned, a senior member in the cabinet uh, and is an example of the great experience that we have in our team uh, across different portfolios. Uh, he uh, represented the Lord Mayor on the City Hall Restoration Project as well, uh, and that was a fantastic project which has delivered an incredible uh, uh, outcome uh, for the people of Brisbane and, and indeed for this building. Uh, and he's also done a fantastic job in the challenging role that he holds at the moment uh, when it comes to neighbourhood planning. Uh, and development assessment, um, and that is no easy task. Um, that is, is, it is one of the more challenging civic cabinet roles, and one of the ones that generates uh, a lot of the controversy, um, as councillors are all very aware of. Uh, I know on a personal level, um, I, it, it has been great to have Matt as a member of the team. He has been a consistent uh, friend and a colleague, um, and I know that when you come into politics at a relatively young age, um, you get to a point where you think, well, I've, I've been doing this for a while. You know, tw it's been 12 years. Um, and uh, you know, maybe there's other opportunities going forward. And that's natural. And that's a, you know, it's, it's a process that uh, many people go through. 
Um, the average length of career these days is quite short. And so to be in this job for 12 years is an achievement in itself. Uh, to be under the, the pressures and stresses that this job uh, brings for 12 years is also um, a consideration as well. So I want to uh, personally wish uh, Councillor Burke all the best for the future. Um, and I know he won't be a stranger. I know he'll still be around. Uh, and also I'd, I would be remiss not to mention the work that he has done with the Local Government Association of Queensland and in particular his strong advocacy against Uncle Sterling's um, outrageous laws and, and the great win that the LGAQ had uh, in uh, pushing back against those laws. I also want to uh, thank and acknowledge Councillor Richards as well. Uh, as we know, uh, Councillor Richards is not standing uh, as a member of Team Shrina at, at the upcoming election. And um, hang, on, hang on, Councillor Johnston. Lord Mayor, please. Thank you. <clears throat> and um, I know that uh, Councillor Richards has always done this role with commitment, uh, with passion, with determination. Uh, and I, I really want to place on the record uh, again, what I said before, which is people should not jump to any conclusions about the circumstances uh, under which Kate is not continuing on. They should certainly not do that. We are all entitled to natural justice when claims are made. Uh, we are all entitled to the presumption of innocence when claims are made. But putting all that aside, as a person, as a fellow member of a team, uh, when someone has those type of claims made against you. Uh, we can all surely imagine the incredible stress and pressure that that places someone under. And I know Kate has been placed under that incredible stress and strain. Okay. Councillor Johnson, this isn't about you. Please, mate. Just, just allow, uh, allow another person a moment, hey? Lord Mayor. And and I simply want to say, Kate, I genuinely uh, wish you all the best for the future. I genuinely do. And I appreciate your contribution to this team. Um, and I uh, will continue to say uh, that, uh, what I said before, which is people should not jump to any conclusions. Um, but I know that, that Kate, um, from the first day as a local councillor for Pullenvale Ward, has been a very strong advocate for that part of Brisbane. Um, and has advocated forcefully and continuously for her local community. Um, and I know that's what she is passionate about. Uh, Kate has a long experience prior to council as well in construction and construction um, management. Time's expired. No, thank you. Move for an extension. Seconded. Extension of time has been moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Marks. All those in favour say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Lord Mayor, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, and I was talking about the experience that Kate has uh, prior to coming into uh, the role as councillor in construction and construction management, in procurement. Uh, and I certainly uh, hope that her future is very successful. Uh, and I know that her skills and experience will stand her in good stead uh, going forward. So thank you for the contribution you've made to Team Shrina. Uh, obviously, um, you know, these, these are difficult circumstances we're in at the moment, but uh, we, as a team, uh, want to thank you for the way that you've handled yourself during this period uh, under really, really difficult and personally stressful and cha challenging circumstances. Moving to the uh, formal items uh, that are before us. Now, we have the contracts and tendering report for uh, December 2019. Uh, and I just wanted to remind uh, councillors of our uh, local by procurement target, where we're, um, we're aiming for 80% of contracts to be awarded to local companies. Uh, so we continue to strive towards that target. Uh, I can say that um, in the year to date, uh, there has been, um, so since we introduced this policy compared to the previous year, there has been a uh, around a 10% increase in contra contracts going to local companies, uh, which is fantastic. So we're striving to, to award more and more contracts uh, to local companies. We want to award as many as possible to local companies. Uh, and uh, I think uh, we'll continue to see positive outcomes being driven by this policy and this new approach to procurement. 
I think it is a good thing, and particularly now more than ever before. Uh, we'd like to see more of those opportunities for local companies to, to build things like the Double Decker City Cat and local companies to be involved in delivering the range of projects and services that we uh, offer as a council. Uh, and we will continue to push for that local buy component and continue to strive uh, to get those targets uh, or exceed those targets. The item B is the uh, suburban shopfront activation. And this is something that, uh, this is one of many initiatives we are rolling out uh, to support uh, local shopping precincts or local village precincts. And it's, it's a really important thing. There are a whole range of factors that um, are making it hard for village precincts around the city. Uh, and the level of competition has never been higher. Um, the rents in many cases are very high. Uh, labor costs continue to increase. Electricity costs in, uh, continue to increase. So there's a lot of pressures on uh, local business. Uh, and we know that uh, council has reduced the fees for small business by $2 million this year. Uh, in addition to that local procurement policy. Uh, we know that we continue uh, to run programs that support small business out in the community. We continue to fund projects that help revitalise suburban shopping precincts and village precincts. And there's an $8 million investment we're making in village precinct upgrades and projects. Uh, and they may be uh, major, major works to upgrade footpaths and public space, or they may be things like um, uh, lighting of trees along village precincts, which really help brings an area to light. Uh, this particular initiative, I know the Deputy Mayor will speak of uh, more, involves um, support to help activate vacant shops. And we've all seen examples of where shops have sat uh, vacant for too long, and we'd like to get pop-up businesses in there. So this is a, a trial program. I have no doubt we will learn from this trial and we will be able to update and adapt and roll it out further as we go forward. But I think it's a really good start in helping to activate some of those uh, vacant shops. Uh, item C, uh, this relates to changes that the federal government has made to Centrelink payments. The changes including, uh, include stopping new start allowance, sickness allowance, wife pension and ber bereavement uh, allowance, and instead introducing a new benefit payment the job seeker payment. Uh, so it's rolling um, various different allowances into the new job seeker payment. Under council's partial rate remission policy for pensioners, a person receiving either the wife pension, new start sickness or bereavement allowance was eligible for a partial rates remission. Uh, with the discontinuation of these payments, this policy is being updated to remove them from the list and to add the job seeker allowance instead. So this is is pretty much a substitute for those uh, to continue, and I'm sure it will have the support uh, of all councillors. Item D is the quarterly report for December 2019, and uh, item D shows the whole wide range of projects we're investing in to build a better Brisbane. Uh, it shows the range of work that has been completed to date, uh, including an acceleration of work on Brisbane Metro with uh, an extra 24 million from memory uh, uh, advanced on that project. Uh, which I'm very excited about. Uh, we have seen around 40% of our budget expended to date uh, to the date of this report. Um, and uh, we've delivered on a number of key uh, projects like the seniors free off-peak travel, the 50% discount on rates for first home buyers, the new double-decker city cat, and also successfully securing the 750 hectares in bushland acquisition, which was a, a key election commitment for us last time. Uh, we've also had a number of pool refurbishments occur and library of refurbishments occur as well during this period. We've seen the major refurbishment of the Langlands Park pool. Uh, the, uh, yeah, that was a great one. Um, and to, to be down there with Councillor Cunningham for uh, the celebration was fantastic recently. Uh, the upgrades to the Bell Bowery pool were also completed in November. Uh, and. Uh, we will continue to upgrade those facilities, uh, pools and libraries uh, as we've been doing. Uh, we also opened the uh, CBD Botanic Gardens Riverwalk and River Hub, which was, is a fantastic asset, uh, active travel asset and also recreational asset with the River Hub, uh, which will help um, deliver more to see and do. Uh, Mr Chairman, I know everyone's been patient for a very long uh, speech, but uh, I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Councillor Richards. 
Mr Chair, I now move that Council now adjourn for afternoon tea for 15 minutes, which commences only when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. Seconded. I have a motion to, uh, for the Council to break for uh, the purpose of afternoon tea for the, the length of 15 minutes, commencing when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. All those in, in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Thank you.
Welcome back, councillors. Uh, are there any further speakers on the ENC report? Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes. I rise to speak on the ENC report, which I have, oh goodness, have here. Sorry, I wasn't expecting to go first. Here it is. I rise to speak on item A, B, um, C, and possibly D if I have time. Um, I'd just like to start with the Suburban Shopfront Activation Grant Pilot Program. Um, it is without doubt that there is a uh, problem in numerous uh, suburban high streets around our city. I think probably almost all councillors have examples of where um, there are empty shop fronts. And unfortunately, in my ward, uh, it's at Sherwood. Uh, it is diabolical. I would say 40 per cent of the shops or more are vacant. Um, I am aware of, you know, because I talk to the local shopkeepers, um, that rents that are being requested in this area are extraordinary. Over a thousand square, a thousand dollars a square metre for some of the premises, which is more than double what you would pay for A-grade office space in the city. Um, we are losing businesses to other centres, uh, and that is problematic. <clears throat> In my view, there are a number of reasons for this. Uh, firstly, of course, um, these high rents, which are a significant disincentive uh, to small businesses to get started. Small businesses uh, often you know, have a lot of uh, upfront costs when they're first getting started, and it can be very difficult for them to get a foothold. Um, so it is certainly an issue in terms of costs, not only um, from rent, uh, but also electricity and all those other reasons the Lord Mayor mentioned earlier. Um, however, um, it is um, really disappointing to me that there are some owners, building owners, who are failing to invest in their properties. And many of these buildings out at Sherwood are very old. Um, they are failing to seek out tenants uh, to uh, fill the vacancies. And um, there is a problem with the fact that there is no financial reason for them to do so. Um, if they take a drop in rent, it affects the valuation of their properties uh, and uh, that affects their overall portfolio. Um, it is massively problematic in my view. Now in Sherwood, for example, there'd be no reason why many of these owners cannot redevelop. It's zoned for five storeys. Um, the community I represent was happy enough to see some five-storey development around Sherwood and Corinda shops only, um, but this um, administration ignored all of that and forced five storeys on huge parts of the suburb. And instead of seeing that investment go around the existing shops and the existing rail line where it should have been, um, developers have purchased every little character house in my area, knocked them down and put up these cookie-cutter, um, prefabricated box-like units, and it's really problematic. I don't think that this grant um, is the right thing to do. In my view, this grant is rewarding um, people who are doing the wrong thing, and that is the property owners. Um, we need to make sure uh, that they are not being subsidised subsidised um, because they are part of the problem, if not the significant problem in my ward. Their rents are too high. Um, we need to find solutions, in my view, uh, that make sure that uh, business owners can um, upgrade their properties, invest in their properties, make a profit out of their properties, um, but ensure that there are tenancies in those properties um, and that we have vibrant business hubs in our suburbs. Now, another big part of the problem from this administration is the fact that they keep approving out of centre development. So because this administration allows performance solutions and out-of-centre zoning, shops in areas that are not zoned for it, childcare in areas that are not zoned for it. This is happening all the time in my ward. It means that someone buys a block of land in an area zoned residential and then applies to put a commercial development on it. Now that is happening absolutely everywhere in my ward. It is cheaper for those owners to do it under this council's planning scheme um, than it is to reinvest in an area that is appropriately zoned for centre development. 
That is a direct result of the way in which this administration administers city plan and the rules that they put in place in City Plan 2014. It is not on. The out-of-centre creep that is happening in my ward and other wards around the city is inappropriate, and it means that there is cheaper competition and these areas that are zoned appropriately um, are not seeing the investment. Now that is happening uh, at Rock Lee, that is happening at Corinda, that is happening in Sherwood, and our community has to fight major commercial developments being proposed in residential areas or areas zoned for industry um, because this administration refuses to do the right thing and ensure that the rules for our planning scheme are properly enforced. Now that is a problem everywhere. When you flood the market with certain types of development, it makes it cheaper in those areas. And, uh, and then these businesses are moving to where it is cheaper because, of course, the first reason I outlined. So there's a significant problem going on here. And what is this administration's solution to that problem? Um, they're going to provide more uh, business welfare to the people uh, who are not necessarily helping themselves, and that is the owners of these um, properties uh, who are um, you know, asking for ridiculous, ridiculous rents. Um, and you know, I, I was the, the latest business to move out of Sherwood is my own um, Pilates studio. I was bowled over by what the small business owner told me they were charging her and then what they wanted to increase her rent to. It was phenomenal. Phenomenal. She's gone down the road to Rock Lee, which is bad enough on its own, and it's half the amount down there. That's an industrial area that's not supposed to be a retail centre. Um, we lose a business that brought foot traffic in uh, to the precinct to service the cafes, um, and it is just, it's such a bad outcome. Um, and I do not think that the administration has got this right. I do not think that the administration has got this right. There have to be other ideas. This should be something that we are talking about because it is across the city. It's not just one ward. It is happening everywhere and it is only going to get worse. This is an election stunt to look like you're throwing money at a problem when all it is doing is rewarding the bad behaviour of some owners who are refusing to acknowledge the current market conditions and adjust their behaviour um, in a way um, that reflects uh, you know, community expectation and the financial circumstances in today's market. And I think that this administration um, has got this wrong. Um, I think they should be... Um, convening some sort of round table. That would be, I would think we would st should be starting with some sort of discussion and put all ideas onto um, the table, all of them. I noticed the Property Council was having a go at the administration over the weekend about this as well. Um, so there is a lot of discontent out there and putting a Band-Aid on it like this is, um, you know, offering our small business liaison officer to work with property owners to help find suitable pop-up tenants well, what, there's one or two small business liaison owners, pop-up tenants, how much are they going to be charged? Honestly, you, you, you guys are just missing, you're missing the point. I just do not understand why um, you are not uh, engaging, given all of the resources that you have, all of the connections that you have, all of the committees with business representatives on it that you have, and this is what you come up with, a grant for the people who are doing the wrong thing. I, I just say that's not good enough. Very quickly on uh, the contracts and tendering, um, I just want to uh, speak on contract five, which is the uh, construction of the culvert at the Brisbane Corso Fairfield. We have major flooding and drainage problems um, in Fairfield, Yoronga and other suburbs in my ward. This project was promised two years ago and was rolled over in the June 2019 budget. I note that the June uh, budget last year uh, uh, actually budgeted $463,000 for this project, yet the administration is slashing the amount of investment in this um, drainage infrastructure and will only spend $246,617. Uh, I will be following up to make sure that that will fully complete the project, because I don't want another example, let's say like Norm Rose Park where uh, council's putting $95,000 into the lights, but the officers have told me that will only pay for the earthworks. 
There's no actual lights coming this year. And there's no money to put the lights in. Just the earthworks for the project, because it's on contaminated land, um, is going to eat up the whole budget. So um, I flag I'll be moving. Uh, uh, Councillor uh, Johnston, um, your time's expired. Um, further speakers? Councillor Cassidy. Thanks, Chair. Um, Coach asked that item A and D be taken seriatim. I'm going to repeat that to you. A and D? Yeah, together. Together, and seriatim then, for voting. Then B and C together for voting, thanks. Please proceed. Thanks, Chair. So, uh, starting on A, contracts and tendering report um, for December 2019 before us here. Um, yet again, we have um, what is uh, almost $160 million worth of expenditure on behalf of the people of Brisbane uh, and uh, what you know, is public, publicly accessible information and documents for the people of Brisbane uh, amounts to, in most cases, just one line of information here. Um, this is, as we know and as we have discovered um, over this term of council, and I'm, I'm sure before the most secretive administration uh, in, uh, in uh, Brisbane's history, Chair, uh, and what that has led to what that has led to is what we have uncovered over the last few months, Chair, uh, and that is uh, across a whole range of program areas within Council, uh, some of the most heinous and hideous rorts uh, that people have seen. But what these contracts also um, do expose, Chair, uh, is this administration's um, uh, bent on inner city projects uh, at the expense uh, of our forgotten suburbs. And I talk about contract seven, toilet upgrades, multiple parks, Chair. Toilet upgrades. You ran out of time, Councillor Johnston. So uh, when I saw this up, the, the toilet upgrades, multiple parks, and had a look through there and uh, saw a few of those uh, amenities, uh, new amenities and upgraded amenities, uh, you know, we can see um, for some of those, uh, the Lord Mayor and Chairs of committees pocket more cash uh, than is being spent on some of these suburbs. Uh, and we're talking over multiple, multiple years. And that got me thinking about a recent example where I received a memo from the Lord Mayor himself. And he said of that memo that uh, he had attended a, a local event and someone had approached him about the fact that the suburb of Zulmia, and the suburb of Zulmia in my ward uh, received over the last four years consistently the highest increase in rates, uh, well over 4% um, uh, each and every year. Uh, this is a suburb that is one of the lowest socio-economic suburbs in Brisbane. A full 50 per cent of the people who live in the suburb of Zulmia fall in the bottom 20 per cent, the, the, the bottom quintile, when it comes to economic inequality. And so this person approached the Lord Mayor and said, Lord Mayor, will you fund a new toilet for Zulmia? Not, just, uh, not another toilet for Zulmia, but the suburb of Zulmia doesn't have any public amenities whatsoever, even though they pay the highest rates out of anywhere in the Deegan Ward. And the Lord Mayor's response to that was to write to the local councillor and say, maybe you could think about funding this out of your suburban enhancement fund. With everything else you're expected to do. So the Lord Mayor, who, who comes up with a $3.1 billion budget, um, you know, pays himself hundred grand in cash into his back pocket chair a year, um, you know, spends what we've seen today three and a half million dollars promoting himself through the so-called Bruce Better campaign, puts out six, over six million, 6.2 million flyers with, with images of, his, of himself on them, Chair, yeah. out to the people of Brisbane, can't fund enough toilet upgrades, can't fund enough footpath upgrades to keep up, with, not just keep up with development, but keep up with the terrible backlog. Um, our, in our community, can't fund enough pothole repairs, can't fund enough mozzie spraying chair uh, to, to combat the plagues and mosquitoes we've seen. So these contracts, as well as, as, well as item D, the, the quarterly, uh, the quarterly um, progress report, just lay bare the priorities of this administration, and their priorities are themselves. Their priorities are holding on to power at any cost, spending any amount of money they think necessary to promote themselves to stay in office. Uh, it is absolutely extraordinary the lengths that they will go to. And which brings me to item B, something that you know, they got a little sugar hit in going out to the media and saying, oh, you know, uh, they supposedly have a plan to revitalise um, suburban um, villages and um, high streets by having an activation grant 
which was $48,000, less than half of what the Lord Mayor pays himself in his slush fund. Less than half. So for 24, 24 little shop fronts will get $2,000 each. Just $2,000 each. A lot of these businesses that have been established for a long time are paying way, way, way more than that in their footpath dining tax. Way more. And, and supposedly, this is the Lord Mayor's plan to revitalise high streets. So it's got to be some sort of joke. Less than half of what he pays himself in cash into his slush fund. Um, absolutely extraordinary. So, you know, this is, this is the big agenda. This is the big agenda for this administration, Chair, going into the election. Now, the Lord Mayor can stand up and smear all he likes at the start of ENC and attack his opponents and talk about Labor instead of his own record for 20, 30, 40 minutes, whatever. Uh, but this here, this here is his record. His $100,000 slush fund is his record, Chair. Uh, look, I, I've, I've allowed you to bring it up three times, but it's actually not in the report. So can I just ask you to, to into the future? Oh, it's funded in, it's funded in item D in the budget, Chair. All right, well, as, as are I all say, these I've, I've only, I only bring it up now yeah. after you've done it three times, right? Sure, so. sure, sure. So, so lay before us the last council meeting um, before the election uh, is this administration's priorities, uh, Chair, uh, and they are all wrong. Further speakers? Uh, oh, point of order. Point of, uh, point of order to you, Councillor Johnston. Yes, thank you. Um, could I just ask item B be taken seriatim for voting purposes? Item B for voting yes, purposes. I've separated. Okay, uh, the Deputy Mayor. Thank Actually, you. sorry, Deputy Mayor, before you ca uh, continue, can I uh, recognise uh, former Councillor Mills in the uh, gallery as well? Welcome back. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. I rise to speak on item B. And um, it seems that the budget information sessions are a long distant memory. I'm pretty sure Councillor Cassidy was in uh, my budget information session as my um, uh, opposition leader in. Uh, uh, PAT economic and tourism development, but this information around local economy support was in the budget information. I spoke about it in the budget information session, talked about the program that we we're going to be rolling out. The economic development team would be working it over it on the six months. Councillor Cummings asked many questions about how they could get it down to Wynnum, how it was worked. He was very excited about it, pretty sure he still is. Um, and it was very clearly there. So this is not one little thing for a, I, I think he called it a sugar hit. Um, this is not about a sugar hit. This is about the initiatives that we announced in the budget in June um, under 7512 Local Economy Support, supporting suburban small businesses. It had suburban shop, free, shop front activation, which we're talking about today. It had the Maker Entrepreneur Program, which uh, commenced yesterday on the 10th of February. We have the Create and Connect Conference, which is being co-hosted on the 6th of March with Bristyle. And it has the High Street Precincts Promotion Plan which uh, economic development are delivering in, um, in uh, partnership with Brisbane Marketing. It is part of a suite of things that we are doing in local economy support. And the website is open now to register. And already in the first week, we have got eight participants keen onto the register already to talk about whether their tenancies or their properties and the opportunity. Now, I have to say it, and I hope everybody's sitting down. Councillor Murphy, you might have to sit down. I'm about to say I actually agree with something that Councillor Johnson said this afternoon. I agree that one of the largest issues we have in these empty shop fronts is that the rent is too high. There's many cases where the rent is too high. There is many cases where absentee owners don't care whether their shop front is open or not. But I don't think they also realise that having somebody in the shop front that generates people coming down there and walking past all the shops in these precincts generates a buzz, gets everybody down there, gets people interested, and then they may be able to get that rent that they're asking for. If you can get more feet on the pavement down there from the locals, buying locals, having a look at what pop-ups are available, activating the shop front, something to look at as you go down and buy your coffee. Who doesn't have a precinct, a shopping strip in their ward where the new coffee shops popped up and it is buzzing with people because everybody loves to be able to walk to the end of the street and get their coffee. Other shop fronts with things to see and do and this is what this program is about. Councillor Johnson continually says, I don't think they've got it right. I don't think they've got it right. I don't know what the answer is, but I don't think they've got it right. 
Well, you know what? This is a pilot program. We're working through the program and we'll work with the tenancies and properties and we will continue to work with the 124,000 businesses that are small businesses in this city to support them. We are the administration that are the most business friendly council in Australia. And that is what this is all about. Making sure that we are supporting our entrepreneurs, supporting our pop-ups. People that usually work from home in their garage and they go on and do Etsy or they go to markets, they can actually have a brick and mortar building for six months. It's very, very exciting. And I can assure you the shop fronts that we're talking to are excited about the opportunities that they see here. It's about giving our local businesses, the established ones and new ones, every opportunity to be a success. We're backing our local precincts. We're backing our businesses that need to support, need the support as well. We have our small business liaison officers. We'll then be able to assist our suitable tenants and our landlords to enter into a short-term lease with each other. This is going to be a really good, much needed economic boost to not only the match participants, but the shops that surround them in these precincts as well. This pilot program, as I mentioned, is supporting not only the local business that wants to pop up into the bricks and mortar, but the tenants to encourage them. One of the, the, the biggest difficulties we found in the six months that our team have been on the ground speaking to people is short-term leases. Not only are some of the rents too high, but trying to convince our local shopfront owners that it's worthwhile to have short-term leases. Because as soon as the site's seen as an attractive, it's going to be better for them in the long run as, long run as well. So there is a few eligibility requirements, because I heard the, oh, you're so CBD focused, it's all about the CBD earlier today. One of the very first eligibility requirements is it is outside of the Brisbane Central Business District. It's vacant, unused or awaiting redevelopment. Located in suburban shopping strips, not indoor shopping centres. Safe for immediate use, usable with functioning utilities like electricity, toilets if that's required, and available for short-term use with a minimum of 30 days. So it may be a month, it may be three months, it may be six months. It depends when we start to get together and have our perfect match of tenants and rental availabilities as well. So we ask councillors to get on board with this pilot program. Speak to your small businesses, encourage them, particularly those who are interested in activating their local precincts, to get online and register. So that if they're suitable, we can match them up with a space, or if they're a space, we can match them up with a pop-up as well. We have seen so much growth in startups and social enterprises in the last two years, and with the uh, opportunity of hosting the uh, Social Enterprise World Conference in 18 months' time, we really are also becoming the social enterprise capital of Australia as well. It's for not-for-profits, it's for creatives, it's for home businesses who just want to try out having a commercial space. This is a fantastic pilot program, and it's disappointing to hear those on the other side with no ideas but plenty of smears. Further speakers? Lord Mayor? All right, I'll now put those items. I'll begin by putting items A and D together. A and D, all those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division. Division. Division called by Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Cook. Eyes to my right, nose to my left. Please ring the bells. Attendants, please close the bars. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the ayes have it. The voting being 21 in favour, one against and five abstentions. The ayes have it. Please return to your seats.
Uh, now, uh, I will now put item B alone. Item B alone. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division. Division called by the Deputy Mayor and Councillor Burke. Eyes to my right, nose to my left. Please ring the bells. Attendants, please close the bars. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 25, sorry, 25 in favour and two abstentions. The ayes have it. Please return to your seats. I will now put item C. All those in favour of item C say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. Uh, the ayes have it. Point of order. Point of order. Uh, Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, I move uh, the suspension of standing orders uh, to enable me to move the following urgency motion. Uh, that the $216,000 left over from the Brisbane Corso Fairfield drainage project is reallocated to the following projects. One, $100,000 to complete the Normrose Fairfield lighting project, and two, $160,000 to undertake the zebra crossing and build outs to improve access to Fairfield and Graceville rail stations. Seconded. Thank you. So that's moved by Councillor Johnston, seconded by Councillor Griffiths. That's a little more complicated than the earlier ones. I trust you've got that in writing. Um, could, could you please? I just, um, we, I will allow it. I just, I just want to make sure that everything's, that everyone understands what it is. Thank you. So it's a, uh, the resolution. Does anyone want Councillor Johnston? Do you have two? Do you have your own copy? You're right. Okay. Does anybody want to hear that resolution again? All right. The resolution is that the $216,000 left over from the Brisbane Corso Fairfield drainage project is reallocated to the following projects. One, $100,000 to complete the Norm Rose Fairfield lighting project, and two, $160,000 to... So is it only 16? Okay, well, that's not what's written, but I'll write 116. Point of order. Uh, to undertake the zebra crossing and build outs to improve ac access to Fairfield and, Gra uh, and Graceville rail stations. Point of order to you, Lord uh, Mayor. So, j just to confirm, does this relate to item D? Is that what you're talking about? The quarterly report? But it relates to, court to item D? It, it's a, yeah, sorry, Lord Mayor. Um, sorry, this is not mm. how it works here. Um, I, the, the, I've checked with our clerks. The resolution is acceptable. Um, and Point of order, Mr Chairman. My order. understanding is that when uh, there is to be a reallocation of funds, it should specify the specific program numbers that it's coming from and to to be competent. Yeah. Look, um, I know what you're saying. I, I do th suspect that's a budget item. Um, I believe that because Councillor Johnston has identified uh, identified where the money is going and has, has been specific, I will, in this instance, allow um, consideration of urgency. Um, Councillor Johnston, uh, three minutes, please, to urgency, and please uh, don't take advantage of my generosity. Oh, you are wise, Mr Chairman. Oh, my God, quick, get it on record. Uh, now, thank you for allowing the urgency motion. Um, when I read the council minute, and this is why this matter is urgent uh, before us today, in the council budget uh, in June, council allocated $463,000 to do the drainage upgrade to the culvert underneath Fairfield Road at Fairfield. 
Um, so when I read with interest that after two years they were finally uh, delivering the project, I was concerned um, that they were only spending uh, 246. Uh, $1,617 actually on the uh, construction project. Um, so that leaves a surplus um, that is unallocated of approximately $216,000. There's a little bit more than that. Now, I do not want to see that money go back into uh, consolidated revenue and spent in LNP wards. Tennyson Ward is underfunded and it is urgent that this money is reallocated to other projects in Tennyson Ward that are awaiting funding. Council officers last week told me that the $95,000 allocated in the budget to do the lighting upgrade in Normrose Park, where a woman was viciously assaulted a few years ago, is only enough to do the earthworks because there's contamination issues. So it is urgent. Um, that the funds that are surplus to needs for this project are reallocated back into delivering the lighting project in Fairfield. Equally, um, improving access to um, stations, rail stations that are being upgraded, that is on our council roads, is critically important. This council supports active travel solutions for our communities, but is not investing in the infrastructure that is needed. Um, and now that we were promised in Graceville. Uh, a zebra crossing across a Pell Street when the Graceville station was upgraded. Two years on, despite the petitions, despite the pressure from me, this council is only just now doing the plan. Um, and Fairfield, uh, there's no discussion, and I've been at that in the neighbourhood plan for years. It is urgent this money is redirected into these local projects in Tennyson Ward so this community is not ripped off. This money is allocated in the budget to be uh, spent in Tennyson Ward, and the surplus of some $216,000 must urgently be redeployed into local projects that deliver for Fairfield and Graceville residents. I encourage all councillors today to support um, this motion and then the Lord Mayor to go out and deliver. He might even get a vote or two in Fairfield if he's lucky. These are important local projects that will make um, it safer for residents to walk and move through my local community. It is a wise investment and it will deliver on our promises to the community we all represent. I now put the ma that matter uh, on the topic of urgency. All those who believe it is urgent say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. No. The noes have it. Uh, division. Division called by seconded. Councillor Johnson, seconded by Councillor Griffiths. Eyes to my right, noes to my left. Please ring the bells. Attendance, please close the bars. Clerks, please read the result. Mr. Chair, the ayes have it. The voting being seven. Sorry, the noes have it. My, my mistake. And that's seven in favour and uh, 20 against. The noes have it. Please return to your seats.
All right, we're going to move on to the, uh, the ENC report special, but I just wanted to note that it's Mr Tan's first, uh, first day in, in the main chair here, so I just wanted to recognise him and just thank him for what he's done today. And thank our team up here as well. All right, um, the ENC report, Lord Mayor. Have we finished voting on everything else? Is there vote on D? It was A, it was a and D, then B, then C alone. So A and D so first, good. Okay. And C alone, and, uh, B alone, and C alone. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move that the report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting held on Monday, 10th of February, 2020, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by the Lord Mayor, seconded by the Deputy Mayor, that the report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting dated Monday, the 10th of February, 2020, be adopted. Is there any debate? The Lord Mayor. Thank you. Um, before us, we have the most famous city plan amendment ever, I think, um, Major H, um, which is the uh, provision to prevent townhouses being built in low density areas of the city. Uh, one that, um, depending on which day you're on, all councillors in the chamber support, but some days all councillors don't support it. Um, but uh, one that we have consistently on this side of the chamber supported uh, this came out of our future blueprint consultation, which was the biggest consultation ever done in the history of the city when it comes to planning matters, uh, and which saw uh, more than 100,000 people engaged and participating in the process, and which saw uh, a wealth of feedback come back from the community. Uh, and uh, the fundamental principle here is that low density areas um, should stay low density areas. Now, um, the interesting thing is that it was the 2000 city plan, which was a labour plan, where townhouses were permitted to creep into low density areas. And uh, those creeping townhouses um, were uh, available for cases where there was blocks of more than 3000 square metres. And so what would, uh, what would often happen is that uh, amalgamation of blocks would occur. Uh, so uh, property uh, speculators would buy several blocks, amalgamate their blocks to create a parcel of more than 3,000 square metres, and then they would put in an application for townhouses. Now, when you move into a low density area, you do have a reasonable expectation that it will stay low density. When you move into an area that is predominantly uh, standalone houses, in a suburban area, that is what you are buying into. Now, um, it is a different story altogether where you are moving into a low medium density residential area or a medium density residential area or indeed a high density residential area. There's a different set of expectations there. Um, and having said that, when you move into a low density residential area, I think it is perfectly reasonable to expect that it will say a low density residential area. And so this is exactly what we put forward uh, with this proposal, uh, which now, with the support of councillors, uh, will come into effect. Uh, we have been through the different state interest checks. Uh, we have been through public consultation. Um, and uh, this uh, amendment, I believe, genuinely has the support of the community. Uh, it, is, it is an amendment which will apply to 63% of residential areas across the city. Uh, it's been interesting to hear some of the commentary from Labor because uh, one minute they're saying, oh, you should have done all this sooner. And then the next minute they're saying, oh, it, it doesn't really count because it only applies to a small percentage of the city. So which is it? Um, do they support it? Don't they? The reality is this. 63% of residential areas are zoned as low density. This applies to 63% of residential areas across the city. Now, it doesn't apply, um, you know, there's, there's big parts of the city that are zoned for other purposes, like commercial or industrial areas. Uh, there's big parts zoned as parkland and bushland. But if you look at the residential areas, this applies to a clear majority, 63% of all residential areas in Brisbane. Um, so there can't be any suggestion that it is somehow a tiny fraction of the city. Uh, anything along those lines are simply weasel-worded, 
and are not true. This townhouse ban applies to 63 per cent of Brisbane residential areas. I think I've made that point clear. Um, we undertook public consultation during July and August last year. The council received more than 1,400 submissions. Uh, the majority of those reflected support for the proposed amendment. The Queensland government has provi provided approval to adopt the proposed amendment to the planning scheme, subject to a condition requiring the release of a detailed housing strategy within 12 months. Now, I did want to um, just specifically address some of the feedback from the industry. So there were members of the property industry who actively opposed this uh, amendment. And their line of argument was um, along the lines of people deserve housing choice and there should be a city plan that provides housing choice. Now, there are plenty of other zones in the city of Brisbane that are low medium residential, medium residential, high density residential where you can get that choice. Uh, so the choice is there. The choice is clearly there. And my view is that that choice exists and I don't think uh, that the argument that this somehow impacts on people's choice is, is accurate. I think that is not the case. I think this is just about preserving the unique character and livability of those low density residential areas while allowing still in appropriately zoned parts of the city housing choice. So that is what uh, we are delivering. That is what this amendment delivers. Uh, and I heartily support this. Uh, I, um, I, I am a big supporter of this amendment. I think it is the right thing to do. Uh, I thank the state government for their support of this amendment. They did face a lot of pressure from the property development industry uh, to reject this. And indeed, I'm aware there were um, postcard campaigns um, against this. Uh, and so despite the best efforts of some to try and uh, have this voted down, when it comes to the submissions, um, the state government did the right thing, and I urge all councillors to also do the right thing today by supporting this amendment. Further speakers, Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks, Chair. I think this is um, litigated to death. This issue, uh, and we have at every um, step of the way said we support this because um, we have seen representing our communities um, the wholesale destruction um, of backyards. Um, of character housing, um, of the look and feel of communities at the hands of the LNP chair. Uh, so when the Lord Mayor gets up and says, and his predecessor did, that they were single-handedly uh, preserving and saving the backyard, they forgot about um, the last uh, 15 years or 16 years uh, on their watch, the last 16 years of backyards the tens of thousands of backyards that have been destroyed on their watch. Now, Lord Mayor talks about the 63% of Brisbane that is zoned low density residential. Uh, yep, granted, we accept that uh, this townhouse ban in low density residential areas means no townhouses or units in low density residential areas, except for the fact uh, that um, when you look at where units and townhouses have been built over the last five years or so, um, just three to four per cent of those developments of those DAs that have proceeded to construction have been in the low density residential area. So Lord Mayor is out there spreading mistruths, complete and utter mistruths. I'm not sure whether he intentionally lied um, to the media uh, or whether he accidentally lied uh, when it comes to um, how much uh, development of units and townhouses would cease around Brisbane, giving people the impression that uh, units and townhouses would stop. But what won't stop and what hasn't stopped on the LNP's watch, as we've seen um, over the last uh, many years of their um, long uh, and soon to be ended rule in this place, Chair, uh, is the um, continual rezoning of uh, parcels of land, not just emerging communities' land, but, but others that are, were previously low-density residential or previously CR1 character residential into CR2, uh, into LMR zoning. Uh, he attempted it in Deegan uh, just last year when he tried to slip that into the uh, draft strategy for the Sangha District Neighbourhood Plan, tried to rezone whole blocks from low-density residential to LMR. So granted, if this you know, townhouse ban goes through, and it will with our support, 
those areas wouldn't have townhouses and units in them, but when they try and slip them in without consultation into a neighbourhood plan and upzone from low density residential to LMR, that's when we're going to get units and townhouses. That's right. Or when you attempted to uh, rezone thousands of properties in the Cooparoo District's neighbourhood plan to CR2, um, what do we see as a result over there? Units and townhouses, dozens, hundreds of units and townhouses shoehorned into the backyards of character residential homes. And I'm sure Councillor Johnson has seen more than a few in her area. More than a few in her area. So, look, we, we're not arguing about um, the fact that uh, what is currently zoned low density residential will be protected from developing units and townhouses in there. We support that. Uh, but what we don't support is this Lord Mayor going out there and spreading mistruths in the lead up to an election. Uh, telling people there's nothing to worry about in terms of um, development and overdevelopment and bad development uh, occurring on his watch, whether it was you know, sanctioned in his dodgy neighbourhood plans or whether he allows his developer mates to come in and put applications in that are well and truly over and above the limits set by neighbourhood plans. So, Lord Mayor, you might try, you might try, but you can't pull the wool over people's eyes when it comes to this. They're not as stupid as you think. The residents of Brisbane are not as stupid as you think, Lord Mayor. They have seen on your watch and your LNP predecessors the wholesale so destruction— through the, through the chair, please, mate. Uh, um, through you, Chair, to the Lord Mayor. Did you call me mate? We're all mates. We're all mates are we? Here, are we? we all mates in here? We're all mates. We're all mates yeah, right We're now. all mates no, in here. Actually, no, are we? No. Yeah. No. 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 Different use of the term, perhaps. Um, <laughs> mate. Um, so, so, Chair, um, the people of Brisbane know, the people of Brisbane know uh, what this LNP's record is when it comes to planning. They know that not one single uh, neighbourhood plan has ever, on its merits, won an award. Uh, they know that when a, a neighbourhood plan sets a height limit for four storeys yes. and a developer made of the LNP comes in and says, I'd like six or seven or eight, maybe. Yes. They know that they're going to get waved through. And even in the first instance, if council knocks them back, they know that if they challenge that in the planning environment court, this administration will roll over. There will be a negotiated outcome that is completely and utterly confidential, and the residents will never ever know the dodgy deals that this LNP administration makes with developers, Chair. So yes, we support this, but what we don't support is the appalling track record of this administration's destruction of our communities through their dodgy neighbourhood planning process. Further speakers? Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. And I rise to speak on this item and say thank you to Councillor Burke and the team that have worked so hard on this amendment. Um, it is extremely welcome in the Holland Park Ward, where we know we have just been in Planning and Environment Court last week for one of the examples that the Lord Mayor is talking about specifically. So what we heard from Councillor Cassidy is that the Lord Mayor is saying there will never be any more apartments and there will never be any more townhouses. That is not what the Lord Mayor has said. He has said in low density residential, we are protecting those areas from townhouses and apartments. Of course there will be apartments. Of course there will be townhouses in LMR, in high density residential, in many other areas around the city, but not in the 63 per cent of the suburbs that are low density residential. And this is the concern that this was causing. Areas that were never along corridors like Logan Road, where I have low medium residential and accepted by the people because we have one of those outstanding neighbourhood plans that they keep jumping up and down about, where the people had their say and said, yes, put the density around Malkravat Central, put the density down Logan Road and put it well and truly around the principal regional activity centre of Upper Malkravat. But when you start getting three, four, five blocks back from major roads in the middle of small streets where six houses are all of a sudden bought up in a low density residential area and the developer says, we're going to do townhouses under the Jim Sawley 2000 city plan allowed introduced and allowed if 3,000 square metres were actually put together by one owner to put townhouses on it. And this was the case that we saw at Eric Road at Mount Gravatt East. Very early on, when we were in the amendment side and we were first working through the amendment. All right, okay, councillors, please allow, councillors, allow the, councillor Griffiths, please allow the deputy mayor to be heard in silence. 
They love their history lessons, but they don't like getting the history lessons back. Well, uh, Councillor Cribbers, please allow the deputy mayor to be heard in silence. So Eric Deputy Road is a prime example of residents that were most upset that there was a possibility that on these six housing sites next to a childcare centre that there could be 29 townhouses go in in this area. Now we had local meetings down on site. My opposition came along for the first week. She had to come along with Councillor Griffiths holding a hand the second week because she didn't quite get it right. And what did they offer? I'll tell you, Lord Mayor, they actually put an offer on the table for this one. There was a policy. There was something that they offered the locals. We think you should just decide how many townhouses you can have because that's as good as it's going to get. That was the offer for the opposition. Well, I'm proud to say that I stood with this administration and said, no, the people of Brisbane don't want townhouses in low-density residential. We heard it very clearly in the Brisbane Future Blueprint consultation. And the state government has agreed with us, thank you very much, Mr Dick, and in closing arguments last Wednesday, in planning an environment court after this administration, the council officers went through the process and said no to those townhouses. This amendment was put forward as a part of the reason why it can't go ahead. It was like something out of the castle. It was the last minute, closing arguments, the amendment was put forward. That is the determination that we have on this side of the chamber to make sure we are representing what the people have. I hear from Councillor Cassidy, he mentioned about the Lord Mayor about, don't know if he's lying on purpose or lying by mistake, but we repeatedly, repeatedly hear over here the defamation that they sling and the concept of above and beyond any limits allowed. Well, it's about time Councillor Cassidy went and spoke to Uncle Sterling and understood about performance outcomes. But I'm pretty sure, as a planning minister himself, performance outcomes are what allows people to go above the code accessible limits. Performance outcomes. But townhouses on 3,000 square metres are not actually performance outcomes. They're not actually even code accessible until we stood up and said no. And now not only are they not impact accessible, they're not allowed. And I thank Councillor Burke and the team for working so hard on this. I thank the state government for seeing sense. Of course, they've exempted their own land, but we'll leave that to another time. But uh, well done to Marikovat East for standing up. I'm glad I was bet there beside you. And there won't be townhouses in Eric Road. Further speakers, Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I rise to speak on the uh, item A, the major amendment to City Plan 2014. Um, I think I think where I'll start is just to say I reckon this whole term on planning has been about the Save Krista Adams yes. campaign yes. in Holland Park Ward. Yes. I mean, millions of dollars spent to buy back land with no trees on it. Um, you know, uh, it now. She's taking credit for uh, uh, you know this uh, change yeah, because uh, a few uh, townhouses are going bring it back into to her the ward. Report, please. So you know it's really fascinating, isn't it, that uh, all of this effort is about saving a few blocks of land in LNP wards. Yes. I read the Courier Mail with great interest today, the story uh, running down the side of the column, and I looked at all the suburbs that were listed. Uh, all of the suburbs—they were all LNP suburbs, yes. all of them, all of them. Now let's uh, let's talk about what's been going on um, with this amendment before us today. It is already um, you're not allowed to have uh, units on low density uh, residential land uh, that is already not allowed under the current planning scheme. The change that is being made today is um, to uh, to stop uh, townhouses on blocks 3,000 square metres or higher. So. The uh, misinformation that has been put out by the Lord Mayor, the previous Lord Mayor, about this change is extraordinary. They make a blanket claim that they are saving Brisbane's backyards. Now that gets quoted to me quite often in my area when all the uh, developments that shouldn't be happening, I get beautiful, ordinary Brisbane residents who come to me and say, Nicole, this development shouldn't be happening, which I agree with. Um, and the Lord Mayor told us he was going to save Brisbane's backyard. And when I explain to them um, what is actually happening uh, with the amendment that is proposed, they are shocked. Shocked. Yes. Um, and 
it's being very quickly found out um, that this administration is over-promising and under-delivering when it comes to city planning. They botched City Plan 2014, and for those of us who were here in the week-long debate for that, every single problem that was raised has bitten them for the last six years, and they're still furiously peddling their wheels trying to fix these problems. And now, what do we got? I don't even know when Jem Sawley was Lord Mayor. Was it 30 years ago? 30 years. They've been in charge of the administration of the city since Campbell Newman was Lord Mayor in 2004, 16 years. But it's still all Jim, Jim Sawley's fault from 30 years ago. Take responsibility for your actions. There's nothing wrong with the proposal before us today, but it does not do what you say it will do. It does not assist residents in my character suburbs who are watching their blocks get carved up. And I will give everyone the example of Sherwood Road. Um, and I want to put on the record my thanks to the neighbouring resident who stuck with the appeal the whole way. Council bailed out, council pulled out of the appeal. The resident was so disheartened. Um, we had a beautiful character block. Um, they were going to chop the back off the house and stick a second block in the backyard, which is not supposed to be allowed. Um, now, I just have to thank the resident very much for persisting. It cost him a lot of money, a lot of heartache. He got an outcome. Council pulled out. They didn't stick with it. An individual Brisbane resident did to try and save our backyards. That is because the planning scheme under this LNP administration is so pro-development um, that we are not seeing character areas protected, we are not seeing low density areas protected. Do you know what's happening in my ward? Low density land is being bought up for commercial centre development. I've had five blocks bought in the last two years and huge childcare centres are being built on them in low density and some are low to medium density areas. None are, uh, are generally allowable in terms of the planning scheme, and they are causing enormous distress to the residents who live in the low density areas around them. These are huge commercial premises. This LNP administration has failed Brisbane residents when it comes to planning. They are trying to uh, put a band aid on something that they have botched, botched in 2014. This is simply protecting a few LNP wards um, and trying to make it look like they are doing something when, in fact, um, it is character suburbs that are being carved up. If you go into any of my suburbs in Fairfield, in Annerley, in Corinda, um, a house, a beautiful character house on the front of the block, is having modern units built right onto the back of it, reduced setbacks, half a dozen units, no parking, no landscaping. And that is what this administration is doing. These are terrible planning outcomes, and they are being allowed under the um, lax and flexible performance solutions that this LNP council is administering. It is unacceptable, and Brisbane residents have had enough of it. Um, this, admin this little tiny amendment today is like a drop in the ocean about what needs to be fixed with city plan, and it is not good enough that this LNP administration, and particularly Graham Quirk and now uh, the Lord Mayor Adrian Schrinner, is out there saying this is about saving Brisbane's backyard. This is about saving endangered LNP councillors, and it is doing nothing to protect low density and character suburbs where planning uh, decisions are being made that are eroding the protection of our backyards, our gracious homes, and it is not on. Further speakers, Councillor Richards. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I rise to speak on item A, Major Amendment H, townhouses. Kenmore is a beautiful leafy suburb. It's within 10 k's of the CBD, and it's known for its large blocks and homes that are perfect for families. Chapel Hill also a gateway to Mount Cutha with lush green areas and large, substantial size lots. But since being elected in 2016, many local residents have raised their concerns to me about the impact of our local traditional lot size homes and being, and being turned into cookie cutters, sardine city and the impacts to our local streets, which are completely out of character to the townhouse style, de style developments. Kersley Road, Margaret Court, 
the Misty Morn site, Gem Road, Kirkdale Road, Kenmore Road, are just to name a few local streets whose residents have been impacted by multiple dwelling townhouses. Housing choice is important. Housing choice is, is in keeping to the many house styles of the street and the neighbourhood are also important. Multiple dwellings are a type of housing choice that chosen for their lifestyle choice, which I also support. Yet my lo local community are not against this type of housing choice. These housing choices are an excellent choice for the neighbourhood streets that serve the local character. The key is serve the local housing character and neighbourhood structures. It is this package H major amendment to amend the planning scheme to remove provisions allowing multiple dwelling townhouses in the low density residential zone and other associated parts, parts of the planning scheme. As the local councillor for the Pullen Vale Ward, I've heard you, the residents of my ward, who have voiced their concerns and today we're making this amendment to protect our suburbs on how multiple dwellings inter integrate with the built form outcomes. Thank you to the members of the Pullen Vale Ward community for advocating for our local built forms that keeps what is unique about our ward, where city living meets country lifestyle. I commend this item A to the Chamber. Further speakers? Councillor Arwen. Thank you. Um, Mr Chair, I rise to speak on this amendment tonight, and it is a very important amendment, particularly for residents in Stretton. And it's interesting that um, we do have the former councillor Bob Mills here tonight because back in the late 1990s, this was an issue then because residents were very, very unhappy with Sawley's sardine city plans and the impacts that they were having then. This is an important amendment. It gives the certainty to the residents in those areas that they're not going to have buckets of townhouses dumped in their area. What is important as well is that we hear from the other side that they, they talk about wholesale destruction without consultation. Well, that's exactly what former Premier Bly did to the residents within the Oxley Wedge. So if you want to really talk about history lessons, there's a lot that goes behind this. And it's interesting as well that the uh, councillor for Tennyson can't do her maths again. Um, because it was only um, 2003 when Jim Sawley's reign finished, not 30 years ago. So again, you know, she's got to uh, put some accuracy behind her comments. But one thing that is important, and that has come across through all of our planning processes, through the implementation of the neighbourhood planning process, residents are now given more and more certainty. In the days of the local area outline plans that were introduced under Labor, they had ridiculous situations such as streets closed at both ends. And this is the sort of thing that back then residents came out in their numbers to say that they were not impressed with the way that Sawley Sardine City plans were going to take this city in. They were sick and tired of local area outline plans that did not Councilors take into account to to in silence, please. that Councilors. did not take into account what residents knew was fact. They completely overrode the reality of the situation in neighbourhoods. Whereas now we have a neighbourhood planning process that does permit engagement, that does permit consultation that does permit communication of what is going on. Because I can tell you now, under Labor's LAOPs, it was all in the bottom of the drawer. It was all hidden from residents. We had to fight tooth and nail to get that information. And what was Jim Sawley's response to it all? Turning his back on petitions at community meetings, sitting in this council chamber, signing Christmas cards and being too busy to respond to official council business and respond to residents' concerns back in 1995. And they were the exact words that I spoke in this chamber back then. And it is true of the Labor Party today. They do not understand the local neighbourhoods. We are delivering what it needs for our communities. We are delivering what our communities need. 
and this is the certainty. And I know the residents in Stretton will be very pleased that this amendment is going through. It will give them certainty for their housing choice, for their neighbourhood, and also it is about time that they know that their investment in their homes, along with every other resident across this city, is going to be secured. Further speakers? Councillor okay. Burke. Thanks very much, Mr Chairman. I just rise to enter the debate on item A, which is the only item. Uh, and this is Major Amendment H, which is the final step uh, in what is one of the biggest changes to our city plan, uh, certainly in my 12 years in this place, Mr Chairman. And it came directly from the feedback of residents of this city about uh, how they would like to see their local neighbourhoods go forward and how they would like to see their local neighbourhoods develop. A process that has been derided every step of the way by the Australian Labor Party. So while they claim support, while they claim to be part of this and, and championing and going forward with the idea, Mr Chairman, they have every step of the way through Plan Your Brisbane and Brisbane's Future Blueprint and even the process for Major Amendment H stood in the way, obstructed, tried to play silly political games and not listen to the residents of Brisbane. They are literally, we hear about the Canberra bubble. Well, they are in a caucus bubble over there, Mr Chairman, because they don't understand the issues that are actually facing the residents of Brisbane. Well, they like to claim to, but they don't. Where is the once great Australian Labor Party that was the champion of the poor people in this, in this world, Madam Chairman, Mr Chairman, sorry, Mr Chairman, or the champion of those that need a, a hand up they don't want to support housing affordability in this city. Because what we just heard from the Leader of the Opposition is not only will they ban townhouses in low-density residential, they will go even further, Mr Chairman, forcing up housing prices. How is that going to help housing affordability? Clearly, they have not even read the letter from the minister, which talks about the need for affordable housing, diverse housing, and an opportunity for everyone to access housing in this city, Mr Chairman. Because that is what this administration has done for the 16 years that it's been in power with the Lord Merrilty and the 12 years that I've been here. While those on the other side like to play games with neighbourhood plans, we on this side, Mr Chairman, go through the process and engage with the community and we listen. And we put the development around the transport nodes and the corridors that can support it, Mr Chairman. Because while they have, at every election that I've stood at, championed this cause about how they believe that the city might be overdeveloping, not once. Not a single once have they said, here on a map is where we think there should be more development, Mr Chairman. And again today, they do it. Their Labor Lord Merrill candidate went out and said he's going to review every single neighbourhood plan in the city straight away. Well, good luck to him, Mr Chairman, because clearly it shows they don't have an understanding about how planning works. They don't have an understanding about how planning works. They have no plan. They've got no experience, no vision and no idea when it comes to planning this city, Mr Chairman, because not once in the four years they've had since the last election have they put pen to paper and said, we will think that it's appropriate to put more density in this suburb or this location. But what they have done is said, we don't want it here or we want to ban more development. Well, how are they ever going to meet their targets from the South East Queensland Regional Plan? They're not. They have obligations. If God forbid they ever got onto this side of the chamber, they would never be able to meet their obligations to the South East Queensland Regional Plan and their Labor mates down in George Street. Because they know that they wouldn't change a thing, Mr Chairman, through you. Because you need to put density in well-located places across this city. You need to engage with the community. You need to respond when the community puts forward different ideas, as we did up in Deegan. They don't have that plan, though. All they have is political point scoring and cheap political stunts, as we've seen through the 18-month process of this amendment coming here today. Compare that with the diligent, thought-through processes that this administration's had when it's come to planning in this city, particularly over the last two to three years through Plan Your Brisbane and Brisbane's Future Blueprint, where we have delivered fundamental change to respond to the concerns of residents listening, acting and delivering for the residents right across this city. While those on the other side might like to say, oh, it's only changing in LNP wards, well, it's not. And to put forward that myth and, myth and furphy is an absolute uh, decry of any decency when it comes to thinking that voters are thinking people. Because they know suburbs like Maruka have low-density residential. 
They know that there's low-density residential up in Councillor Cassidy's ward in Zilmere and other parts, other suburbs up there. So it doesn't just apply to what apparently are LNP suburbs. I've never actually seen a map that just says that's an LNP suburb, Mr. Chairman. This applies to 63% of the residential zoned land across the city. So to destroy the next myth from those on the other side, which is this is only three or four percent of developments, the most recent development applications we've had for townhouses in this city are amalgamations of low-density residential land. Why? Because the economics of buying four or five or six, six or seven hundred square metre lots now stack up. And that opens up 63 per cent, 63 per cent of this city to the potential of, of townhouses going in to suburbs that were not designed for them. And we are closing that loophole, Mr Chairman. Whether the Labor Party like it or not, whether the Independent likes it or not, Mr Chairman, we are closing that loophole. And we are giving residents surety about what they can expect when it comes to development areas that were designed for one and two storey homes. And that's what the residents of Brisbane want. It's not some idea that I came up with. It's not some idea that the Lord Mayor came up with uh, on this side of the chamber. It was feedback from the residents of Brisbane. And we've gone through the process of preparing the amendment. We've engaged with the community and with industry as we were directed to by the minister. We've taken their feedback. We've looked at the points and concerns that they raised. And then we have delivered an amendment, gone through the process and gone to the state and had that approved by the state government. And they have put a condition on it to deliver a housing strategy, a process which we have already started. We've done industry engagement on the housing strategy and we'll soon go out to engage with the broader population as well. But I tell you what, Mr Chairman, that's a stark contrast from the ham-fisted approach to planning that we see from the Australian Labor Party. They've had 12 years that I've been here. They've had four years in this term of council to come up with a real plan when it comes to planning, but they haven't because it's all about the smear, Mr Chairman, for them, and they have no ideas when it comes to actually running this city. And I'm glad that we're dealing with this matter today so that residents of Brisbane can have surety around the development that will happen in their local area, and I commend item A to the chamber. Further speakers? Councillor Cumming. Thanks, uh, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, look, I, I've got a lot of townhouses in my ward, and uh, uh, people live very happily in townhouses. They're very convenient uh, type of housing for uh, a lot of people. Uh, in fact, the, the greatest thing about them is they're affordable. They're affordable, and my area—it's roughly—you uh, could buy a townhouse for about 100,000 less than the alternative, which is a small lot, uh, low-set brick uh, house. Uh, neither of which have got much by way of backyards, by the way. So uh, I'm not sure how uh, a, a, a reduction in the number of townhouses is going to preserve too many backyards. It won't. It's rhetorical rubbish. Uh, the other thing is the Labor Party didn't start townhouses. Oh, well, sorry, we, we, didn't, we didn't start them all together. They were in place before then. They were in place during the Atkinson period. It used to be the original uh, requirement for uh, the original requirement for townhouses used to be about 10,000 square metres, then it was reduced to 5,000, then it was reduced to 3,000. So it's been a progressive change and it was in place th through the six years the six years of the Liberal point administration of order, here in City Hall, it was there. Councillor Cumming, point of order to you, Councillor Shree. I've just noticed a few councillors calling out during this speech, and I'd just urge you to be diplomatic and even-handed in terms of how you guide the chamber. No, I appreciate that. And as I've said a number of times today, I expect uh, courtesy, courtesy to be shown to all councillors, um, and uh, in particular Councillor Cumming at this point. So and please allow him to be heard in silence. Of course, the Liberal administration has been here in City Hall since, was it 2000? And uh, and uh, so they've they've taken a long time, haven't they, to get around to changing this? But anyhow, in my area, in my area, the uh, townhouses were built. Uh, there were small acreage areas. People would just buy one block, remove the house, and you'd have 3,000 square metres or more of land. Uh, and I've probably got about, I'd say, estimate off the top of my head, in the suburb of Wynnum West, one part of Wynnum West between Kyanawa Road and Wynnum Road, there'd be about uh, 10, uh, probably 15. Uh, uh, sets of townhouses, and uh, I estimate they would take up about 10% of the land area of that uh, of that area of uh, Wynnum West, and about 25% of the population. And uh, the other thing about townhouses, because they're cheaper to buy, they're also cheaper to rent. So anything up to about $100 a week cheaper for to rent as well. And uh, 
I can understand. I can understand what is happening now is different to what what uh, ha has happened in my ward. In other words, the uh, purchasing of uh, uh, a number of houses in a in a sort of what you'd normally call a, a built-up uh, built-up uh, residential area, uh, rather than a uh, an, an acreage-style situation, and that people are concerned about that. And uh, I'd, I'd wish that there was some way that we could could uh, allow uh, townhouses to uh, continue in the acreage situation, but perhaps somehow be discouraged or stopped in the other. But anyhow, uh, I just wanted to uh, make that, those points because I think that uh, for a lot of people, uh, it's the, the first entry into the property market is a townhouse. It's a, it's a way of uh, people who've got less money downsizing. They can't buy a flash high-rise unit, they can, but they can buy a low-set low set townhouse. And uh, as I said, people with limited income, I think a lot of them will be forced out of Brisbane altogether by this change. They'll, be, you know, it'll have, they'll have to go to Redlands Port or Logan Port or, Port or Port Ipswich. Port they, won't, they won't be able to Port afford Port to live in Councilor Brisbane. And, uh, Hang, Councillor Cumming, there's a point of order. Oh, point sorry. of order, Councillor Cumming. That's my last council meeting. Will Councillor Cumming take a question? Councillor Cumming, will you take a question? <laughs> go on. Oh, yeah, right here, right here. Right right yeah, yeah, yeah. Councillor Cumming. Councillor Cumming, if you're so concerned about uh, the ban on townhouses in low density residential, do you want to tell us what your thoughts are about the Labor Party policy to ban townhouses across even more residential zonings in the city? Oh, you've, you've just got carried away with that. You've, uh, you, didn't listen, you didn't listen to Councillor Cassidy uh, correctly. Um, the other thing is, it's, it's, it said oh, you can just go to low medium, but the cost of land in low medium, everyone knows, is much higher. So instead of you getting your townhouse in Wynnum West, or in fact, and there's no low medium in Wynnum West, uh, for 350,000, it's suddenly 450, 500,000. See you later, Brisbane. We're going to have to go and live in, uh, in Ipswich or Logan or whatever to be able to afford. To. And a, a lot of uh, lower income people, of course, uh, uh, a townhouse, as I said, is a start into the, to get into the market, and then one day they might be able to gr graduate up to a uh, to uh, a detached house or something like that. So, so anyhow, uh, I just wanted to make those points. Uh, I'll be supporting this resolution, but it's uh, I, I don't I don't uh, I, I want to stand up for the fact that uh, townhouse developments have existed and been well built and well accepted by the local community uh, in my ward, and I'm sticking up for the, for those townhouses. Thank you. Further speakers, Councillor Mackay. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I rise to speak on uh, item A, major, major Amendment H. And, Chair, this is a great day for the people of Brisbane and especially for concerned residents from Walter Taylor. Major Amendment H, as you would know, has been a process going for two years with the state government. And from July 2019, community consultation was conducted through a variety of means. And I am going to talk a little bit about the community consultation tonight. And uh, that community consultation took place through things such as newspaper notices, council website, email, newsletters, uh, talk to a planner sessions and letterbox drops. And the feedback from Brisbane's western suburbs came through loud and clear. There were 741 submissions that supported the Lord Mayor's proposal to restrict townhouses from being developed in single home areas. 399 of those submissions came from Brisbane's western suburbs, suburbs like Chapel Hill and Fig Tree Pocket. This shows great support from the residents of Walter Taylor, and I congratulate them for their proactivity in supporting the proposal, and I congratulate them today for the result that we see coming. Overwhelmingly, those in support noted the importance of preserving single home areas to retain diversity of housing choice through a mix of residential areas of different types and densities. Now, Chair, I didn't make that up. That was straight out of the consultation report. And Chair, I'm sure you'd be interested to hear about some other factors raised by those who supported the amendment. So I'll tell you about them, Chair. They had concerns about the impact on neighbourhood character, the capacity and efficient use of infrastructure, car dependency, environmental impacts, density, social impacts. So Chair, while we are focused on building the infrastructure our city needs, we are also protecting our suburbs by ensuring any development fits within its existing surroundings. These changes will protect the iconic Brisbane backyard and the city's unique character by ensuring our planning scheme reflects community expectations. Further speakers? There being none, Lord Mayor. I'll now put the item. All those 
In favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division. Division. Called by the Deputy Mayor and Councillor Burke. Eyes to my right, nose to my left, please ring the bells. Attendants, please close the bars. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 27 in favour. The ayes have it. Please return to your seats. Councillors, the Public and Active Transport, Economic and Tourism Development Committee, please. Mr Chair, I move that the report of the Public and Active Transport, Economic and Tourism Development Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 4th of February 2020, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Davis, the report of the Public and Active Transport, Economic and Tourism, Tourism Development Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 4th of February 2020, be adopted. Is there any debate? The Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. Last week's committee presentation was on the fantastic active travel opportunities that the Victoria Park Vision will provide. So we love our Victoria Park Vision. The Lord Mayor announced it in June last year. And from 2021, we will see works commence to transform the current golf course into Brisbane's biggest new public park in 50 years. So we know that we've had so many people help shape this vision now, 16,300, more than 5,400 5, ideas shared. And uh, one thing we clearly heard from the people of Brisbane when they spoke to us is some of the features they really wanted to see was cycling, pathways, connectivity, and accessibility. And that really does fit into the guiding principles that we heard through the presentation around recognition, restoration, and reconnection. So in particular, through my portfolio, the aspect of reconnection with the um, transforming those connections that we have there even into a better connection to all of those bikeways that we have that feed into the park as well. We'll really stitch that parkland into the, cent into the city and the heart of the city as well. So it is really critical that we get this right, obviously, with our clean, green, um, sustainable city that we are. We've got two metro stations that will be servicing um, Victoria Park and, of course, the Cro Cross River rail as well. And we know that active travel will be a very big part of that. I think what we need to realise, though, that there is also a lot of different types of active travel that will be in Victoria Park. So we've got routes that go to Victoria Parks. We'll have routes that go through Victoria Park. We'll have both recreational and commuter cyclists. We have to make sure that we have the current route that goes through there, um, making it easier. It's a very complicated journey through the CBD and around this site at the moment. So we really want to focus on that primary connection for cyclists. Once we can streamline the journey so that commuter cyclists can get into the CBD faster, then they really are going to want to use this area. The second option, obviously, is once we've got that sorted out, we go into the recreational loop that is the opportunity for the people that are just wanting to have a lazy day on the bike and take in the beautiful area that will be there and the new features of the park. So they may include the ridge loop, which is a two kilometre shared pathway, the valley loop, which is a longer shared pathway at three kilometres, and of course a whole network of pedestrian pathways at varying grades. Some of them will be um, shared, some of them will be for recreational sites, some of them won't be disability compliant because of the lay of the land, but you will still be able to get around on different grades and different ways for cyclists, for walkers, and for those with impairments as well. The existing walkway of the rail line will be investigated for a potential upgrade, as well as connecting the existing 
building a land bridge over the inner city bypass with the North Brisbane bikeway. It is just going to be so exciting, the improvements we are going to see, and it definitely reflects not only the trans transport plan for Brisbane, but the focus that we have here in Team Schrinner is the clean, green and sustainable city with a Victoria Park that is a natural retreat, an urban park for an adventure, discovery, and with the bikeways opportunities, reconnection as well. It will be an absolute game changer for Brisbane, and I can't wait um, to get started on the planning for that. We had four petitions that came through committee last week, one on the Polara bus services, one concerning lights at Rock Lee, the bike lanes at Highgate Hill, which we've discussed here in, um, in depth, and the Wollongabba bikeway extension through Cooparoo. I will leave those petitions to the chamber. Further speakers? Councillor Shree. Thanks, Chair. I rise to speak briefly about the petition regarding the proposed extension of the Wollongabba bikeway down Stanley Street um, through East Brisbane. And I, I know that in an election year there's a lot of competing priorities and a lot of distractions, but I just wanted to reiterate for the Deputy Mayor, and hopefully the Deputy Mayor will bring this to the attention of the Mayor as well, that I consider this a very high priority and a key missing link in the inner south side bikeway network. As I've said previously, there's plenty of space along that stretch of Stanley Street. It's a very wide road. Um, as local councillor, I'm open to conversations about losing some of the street parking along those stretch, that stretch of Stanley Street to facilitate bike lanes. I'm also open to conversations about removing one of the lanes of general traffic in, in the vicinity of La Trobe Street in order to facilitate barrier-separated bike lanes. And I, I think there's a real opportunity here to deliver this project much more cheaply than the first stage of the Wollongabba bikeway. Um, I think there's an opportunity to uh, experiment with tactical urbanism approaches so that rather than simply going straight for a final solution, we use te more temporary forms of um, barriers to trial different lane configurations. I understand this is an option that the bikeways team have been considering in the past for other lanes and other parts of the city. Rather than spending millions and millions of dollars building um, big concrete barriers straight away, you can drop in some of the temporary um, barriers, leave them in place for six months, see how much use they get, see how that impacts traffic flow in the area, and then formalise it later um, as a final design. That's an approach that's been used in other cities around the world, and I hope the Deputy Mayor will seriously consider that. Um, after, after Vulture Street, I would say this is one of the highest priorities for bike lanes in the inner city, um, but um, I'm, I'm obviously losing this part of of East Brisbane from my ward uh, after the 28th March election. And so I hope whoever the new councillor is to represent that area, that they're also cognizant of the importance of introducing separated bike lanes and that um, this isn't something that drops off the agenda. There's, there's a really good opportunity here to deliver a safe separated facility all the way along Stanley Street, stretching back to the Norman Creek bikeway. So. Um, Let's not leave this one on the back burner. Let's not put it in the too hard basket. In terms of um, the amount of money you'd have to spend to deliver a good bike lane there, it's gonna yield better value for money than a lot of the other areas that the council has been looking at in recent years, mm -hmm. simply because that road corridor is so wide and there's so much space to play with there. I've spoken to local residents who live along Stanley Street East. One of their biggest frustrations is that the growing number of cyclists are often using the narrow footpaths and that causes stresses when cars are pulling in and out of side streets and driveways. It also causes stress when um, pedestrians are sharing narrow footpaths with fast moving e-scooters. The best solution to that is separated facilities. So let's create separated bike lanes to get the cars, the pedestrians and the cyclists out of each other's way. Hopefully the deputy mayor will take that on board. Further speakers, Councillor Owen. I rise to speak on item B, and this is an item which I know that many residents throughout the Southwestern Corridor will sincerely support. The implementation of dedicated bus services that will service the suburb of Pallara is needed, and it is needed now. The amount of residential growth in Pallara as a suburb is exceeding 20.41% 20, 20 annually. And particularly in the last two years, we have seen the growth 
and the number of houses coming into Pallara absolutely escalate. So when we have a new suburb coming online, we need to look after those residents, particularly when they are looking to, to utilise public transport. We have an obligation to advocate on their behalf, and certainly I am prepared to do that. We have a lot of residents in Pallara who are currently driving to Heathwood, getting on the buses at Heathwood in order to get to their work, to university, to access other shopping centres and other facilities such as medical facilities. So this petition is important. It is something that TransLink needs to act on sooner rather than later. And I, for one, will be advocating loud and clear to TransLink that we do need this service. We do need to support the people of Pallara. And I do know that the growth will certainly substantiate the need. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Cunningham. Thanks, Chair. I rise to speak briefly about item E. This administration wants to get people home quicker and safer, and that's why we allocate funds to a range of projects that provide choices for commuters and families. Just this term alone, and I, and I note the comments from Councillor Shree, $100 million has been spent extending our city's network of safe and connected bikeways, and the Woolloongabba bikeway is a great example of that. The first example of a future bikeway project for the Cooperoo Board, which I'm fighting for, is in this Stanley Street East corridor. It's a busy section during peak hours. It's a popular arterial route connecting the eastern suburbs with the city. It's also recognised as a primary bicycle route in the bicycle network overlay within the city plan. More cycling infrastructure in this corridor will help provide choices for residents and commuters. So I was pleased to read in the petition response that the project has been noted for inclusion in a future capital works budget. I know and residents know that critical but expensive projects like this can only be delivered with sound financial management, something that only a team with experience can provide. I've already spoken with the chair about the project and provided my support for it to be considered as part of upgrades to cycling infrastructure in the east. I'll continue to fight for more travel options in the east, whether that be bikes, buses, cars or walking paths. This kind of infrastructure is what we need to make our city cleaner, greener and more active for our residents Point to get order, out Mr. and chair. enjoy the climate. Point of order Thank to you, you. Councillor Shree. Will Councillor Cunningham take a question? I feel that she's concluded. Oh, okay. Um, further speakers? There being none, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair, and thank you for the councillors for their responses to the petition. Um, as Councillor Owen would have seen, we have written to TransLink to um, push forward having a, a loop to get to the Salisbury station for those residents that are moving in there. Um, with regards to the Woolloongabba bikeway, this petition in particular asks for a two-way protected bikeway along Stanley Street East as far as the Cleveland Rail Corridor. Um, obviously, that will require that one in particular, that design would be a removal of a traffic lane. And there's a lot of work you would need to do to talk to residents around that that live on that stretch. We've got to remember there's a lot of small businesses along there as well. Um, and uh, as Councillor Shree knows, our conversation with Jornock Terrace, the removal of on-street car parks can have a huge impact on local residents. But we are definitely recognising this as an important link. We're reviewing our active transport network plan. And as uh, Councillor Cunningham said and Councillor Shree, um, it is a key corridor to improve connectivity and safety. And it definitely is going to be um, looked at as our future uh, projects as we look at that co connectivity through the south. Right, and our <clears throat> I'll now put the report. All those in favour say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillors, the Infrastructure Committee report, please. Oh, thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 4th of February 2020, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor McLaughlin, seconded by Councillor Huang, that the report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 4th of February 2020, be adopted. Is there any debate, Councillor McLaughlin? Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. The item before us. Um, um, the first item was the, uh, the Infrastructure Committee report that we had in committee last week, which is a, a, uh, an update on the left turn on red trial, which we've talked about in this place previously. So I'm just happy to, to report to the, uh, to the chamber that the state government has 
uh, graciously extended the trial until the 31st of May 2021. So this continues as an ongoing trial. Uh, we would like to see it adopted as a standard operating procedure under the Manual of Uniform Traffic Devices, uh, which the state controls. However, we are pleased that uh, the, uh, the state is uh, TMR Transport uh, and Main Roads, Department of Transport and Main Roads, is prepared to extend that trial um, through to the 31st of May 2021. We believe it provides considerable uh, improvements to traffic flow in those locations where it's safe to provide this particular movement. Um, and uh, currently we have 17 locations across the city where this uh, trial is um, underway. It does, uh, and independent reports have been uh, conducted into this, and uh, this was con uh, considered in the committee report. Um, it does reduce delays of left turn movements from uh, 31 to 22 seconds, and uh, I think the majority of residents and visitors to our city uh, accept and approve of, of this. It's, uh, it's common practice in New South Wales. The, uh, the, the, the standards that we've adopted have been adopted here in Queensland are the same as for New South Wales. And of course, anybody travelling overseas knows that it's a standard operating procedure, uh, albeit on the other side of the road, uh, but a standard operating procedure in, in other locations. So we believe this is a, a good trial uh, and, uh, and long may it continue. Well, it will continue at least until the 31st of May. Um, 2021, and we hope that it is adopted as a standard practice after that. The other matters before us were two petitions uh, that related to requests for uh, slowdowns in, in slowdown in traffic or traffic calming. Uh, I'm happy to talk to those issues if uh, debate uh, follows. Thank you. Further speakers? Anyone? Councillor McLaughlin? I'll now put the report. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillors, the Planning Committee report, please. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I move the report of the City Planning Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 4th of February 2020, be adopted. Seconded, Mr. Chairman. Been moved by Councillor Burke, seconded by Councillor Toomey, that the report of the City Planning Committee meeting dated, meeting dated Tuesday, the 4th of February 2020, be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Burke. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I just want to uh, comment on the items before us, uh, but before I get to the committee presentation and the petitions, uh, I just want to take this opportunity uh, to thank and acknowledge uh, all the fantastic council staff that I've had the pleasure over the last two years of serving with in uh, the city planning part of council. Uh, so to Andrew as the divisional manager, Marcus Dye, uh, Annabelle, Sharon, Omar, and the whole teams uh, of staff that we have that assess development applications, uh, look at uh, design, uh, do the planning amendments that we debate in this place, do the community engagement around neighbourhood plans, and deliver so much of what this council does in terms of improving and enhancing public open space across this city uh, and urban areas. I want to say a very big thank you for all of your dedication and hard work, uh, not just while the time that I was chair, but indeed in the time that other councillors uh, have been the chair of planning. And I know just how hard you actually work. Uh, I know how dedicated you are to a better Brisbane, and I know how seriously you take getting good planning outcomes for the residents of Brisbane. In some cases, it's very difficult. There is a lot of competing interests, but you do your jobs as best as you can uh, and you try to deliver the best outcomes for the residents of Brisbane. We had three items on the agenda last week, Mr Chairman. Two of those were petitions relating to uh, village precinct project initiatives. So one was at Oxford Street uh, shopping precinct uh, and the other one was Arminia Street uh, down there in Mansfield, Mr Chairman. Uh, and these are both uh, contenders for future funding as part of uh, our village precinct project, another one of those initiatives where we enhance and try to support local businesses across our city in the suburbs. Uh, and the committee presentation was about Brisbane's knowledge corridor. So because of the state government's delivery of the Cross River Rail project, uh, there is a number of sites across this city, five of them where you will see priority development areas happening, Mr Chairman. The priority development area relates only to the state government land that is part of the delivery of Cross River Rail, but around those sites, there is going to be massive changes as that infrastructure is delivered. And we have started the process in conjunction with Cross River Rail to deliver the planning of those precincts that is required. And so the committee got an overview of the priority precincts uh, as part of this, uh, Mr Chairman, uh, and the plans for each one of those precincts will now flow out for public consultation in May. And I'll leave the committee report to the chamber. Further speakers? Anyone? Councillor Shree? Thanks, Mr Chair. I um, realise that 
I'm required to speak on the report itself, but I just want to rise really quickly to thank Councillor Burke for his time as chair. Um, I've had my differences and difficulties with him, but I acknowledge that he's put in hard work over that time, and I'm, I'll, I'm sure people will be sorry to lose him. Very nice. Further speakers? Councillor Burke. No? I'll now put the report. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillors, the Environment, Parks and Sustainability, Sustainability Committee report, please. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, I move that the report of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 4th of February 2020, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Hammond, seconded by Councillor Richards, that the report of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 4th of February 2020, be adopted. Is there any debate, Councillor Hammond? Thank you, Mr Chair. At the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee on the 4th of February, um, we had a fantastic informative update of the Bushland Acquisition Program. Let me remind people the Bushland Acquisition Program in 2020 celebrates its 30th anniversary um, with, 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 oh, I can't speak. And I must thank um, the former Lord Mayor, Sally Ann Atkinson, who launched this in 19, uh, 1990 for her foresight in this wonderful program. Since 1990, Council has preserved a total of 4,274 hectares of land through this program. An exciting development in this space is our achievement to protecting over 750 hectares of bushland since 2016. In December 2019, we won a 15-year battle to stop development over the site of 818 Rody Road, Stafford Heights, and secured this land through the Bushland Preservation um, Acquisition Program. This brought our total up to 752 hectares in 2016. The presentation highlighted some of the properties we've acquired since 2016. These include land at Wakeley, Pallara, Karawatha, Carindale, Chermside, Bracken Ridge, Colo, Burbank, Mogul, and Deegan. The <laughs> councillors, councillors, <laughs> deputy mayor. We, I will remind the chamber that we are going to listen to other councillors in silence, as the chair has indicated. We are going to express. Uh, the respect that we expect back in return. Thank you. Councillor it's Hammond. interesting that some councillors in this ward don't understand what Labor wards are. There's not many of them, um, but they certainly punch above their weight in considering their numbers of how many ALP wards, as opposed to LNP wards, have received bushland acquisition in their area. Not only not only does this support native species, help preserve precious bushland and secure wildlife corridors, it helps increase the community's opportunity to connect with and learn about our natural environment by turning the land we require into conservation reserves. So it is purely protected for future generations and not to be tempted if those opposite get to be on this side of the chamber. They will not be able to do a grab for cash and sell off this land for future development. We also had a number of petition items. Um, we had a petition for the request for um, Council to purchase 818 Rody Road, Stafford Heights through the Bushland Acquisition Program to ensure the long-term preservation of the land and protect its biodiversity. Great work, Councillor Davis. You've done wonderful work trying to secure this land and your long-term fight over the many years to preserve this land for the Mountains to Mangroves Corridor, and I thank you for your work. A request for Council to not approve or proceed the proposed community garden at James Warner Park, Kangaroo Point. Interesting enough, next one is. A request for Council to support a community garden at James Warner Park, Kangaroo Point. Petitions requesting that Council install lighting to improve safety in Delphin Street Park, Delphin Drive, McGregor. A request that Council place a vegetation protection order on a mature leopard tree located at 15 to 17 Priory Street, Indrapilly. Um, as this tree is um, a street tree, it is protected by the now. Um, a request that Council provide seven to 10 acres of land in Victoria Park, Hurston, 
for the purpose of growing food for those in need as part of the Victoria Park vision. Petitions requesting the council name a section within Brisbane Corso Park, Yoronga, as James Walker Place in honour of the late James Walker for his fabulous 45 years of service to the local community. I'm happy to respond to any questions. Further speakers? Councillor Johnson? Uh, yes, just briefly on the uh, petition naming for uh, John Walker Place in um, Brisbane Corso Park at Yoronga. Um, I'm sure many people have uh, residents like John Walker in their communities. Um, in the 12 years I've, uh, I've been the councillor for Tennyson Ward, he certainly attended uh, pretty much every meeting of Neighbourhood Watch and the Yoronga District Residents Association. Uh, uh, and um, been a vocal advocate for our community. Um, uh, I know that uh, his passing last year was a uh, very sad occasion for his family, and they are seeking to have uh, John Walker Place uh, named uh, in his honour uh, within the Brisbane Corso Parklands, which was not too far from his home. Um, John particularly was active back in the 70s and 80s um, in supporting a number of uh, community activities, including the Yoronga State High School PNC and uh, the uh, Yoronga Neighbourhood Watch and the Yoronga District Residents Association, um, in addition to many other uh, names, uh, any, sorry, uh, many other groups. Uh, certainly, um, it is important that we name our public spaces after people who've made a significant contribution uh, to our community. Um, I note this is a two-step process, um, and now Council has to go away and do the second part of this, um, but I look forward to uh, the naming occurring in due course. Further speakers? There being none, we'll put the resolution. Uh, all those... Oh, sorry. Uh, Councillor Hammond, any reply? All right. I will put the resolution. All those in favour say aye. Aye. The noes? The ayes have it. Right. Councillors will move on to field services. Councillor Howard. Thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. I move that the report of the field services committee meeting held on Tuesday the 4th of February 2020 be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Howard and seconded by Councillor Marks that the report of the Field Services Committee dated Tuesday the 4th of February 2020 be adopted. Councillor Howard. Thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. We had a very interesting presentation on our field services achievements for 2019. And um, I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank um, our executive manager and the entire field services team for their work throughout the year, but particularly the work they're currently doing in terms of uh, the weather that we're experiencing. And I know that many, many of you have told me how fantastic uh, they've been in getting out and fixing those potholes. And uh, I think that uh, we should all uh, make sure that we are passing on our sincere thanks to all of those guys and girls that are out there doing that fantastic work. So um, thank you to the fabulous field services team. And I'll... Uh, any further speakers? There being none, Councillor Howard? No, we're all good. Uh, we'll put the resolution. All those in favour of the field services report, say aye. Aye. Those against? The ayes have it. And we move on. Councillor Maddock. I thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. I move the report of the Community Arts and Lifestyle Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 4th of February 2020, be adopted. Seconded. Uh, it's been moved by Councillor Maddock and seconded by Councillor Cunningham that the report of the Community Arts and Lifestyle Community meeting dated Tuesday, the 4th of February 2020, be adopted. Councillor Maddock. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. There's one item, and that was the committee presentation on the Lord Mayor's uh, seniors' Christmas parties. I'd like to thank the officers for the presentation and updating the Chamber on um, this amazing event that means so much to all the community. I know that all councillors very much embrace uh, the Christmas parties and that uh, the tickets are sold out pretty quickly once they go out on sale. So I'd like to thank the officers very much for their hard work uh, in organising those parties, but I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank them uh, for all their work over this uh, term. Um, 
uh, it's been my great pleasure and honour to be the chairman for the last uh, since uh, July 2018, um, and I greatly appreciate the opportunity to uh, to do that work. I want to acknowledge the work of Councillor Burke as the chairman uh, for the first half of the term and the significant amount of work that he did uh, and uh, on so many different areas uh, between the Brisbane Portrait Prize, uh, his work with uh, officers in regulatory services. Um, it just goes on and on, but uh, it is a great honour to be in this portfolio and the officers do uh, amazing work. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Maddock. Is there any debate? No, there none being, Councillor Maddock. All good, put the resolution. All those in favour say aye. Aye. The noes, the ayes have it. Councillor Allen, finance please. Thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Finance and Administration Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 4th of February 2020 be adopted. Second. It's been moved by Councillor Allen and seconded by Councillor Murphy that the report of the Finances and Administration Committee meeting dated Tuesday the 4th of February 2020 be adopted. Councillor Allen. Thank you, Mr Chair. I'll be brief. We uh, had a very uh, interesting presentation yet again on uh, net borrowings, cash investments and funding for the December 2019 quarter. Importantly, it uh, highlighted some of the risks that might come out of uh, the emerging situation in China and how that might impact the economy. In addition to the presentation, there were uh, a number of regular reports that were tabled, and I'll leave further debate to the Chamber. Is there any further debate? There being none. Councillor Allen, put the resolution. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary to the noes, the no noes, the ayes have it. We move on. Uh, councillors, are there any petitions? Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Chair. I have a petition. Uh, for residents around uh, the corner of Laura Street and Sexton Street, Tarragindi, and some difficulties in crossing, asking for traffic management plan to rectify. Councillor Howard. Uh, Mr Deputy Chair, I have a petition regarding the bus terminus at Mountford Road, New Farm. Councillor Mackay. I have a petition request for council stop for removal. I have a petition requesting council stop the removal of a tree on council land between 56 and 58 Alpha Street, Turinga. Thank you. Councillor Johnson. Yes, thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. I have a petition on behalf of some almost 400 residents asking for them to stop the McDonald's in Sherwood. Councillor Cumming. Yes, uh, four petitions, three in relation to parking times in Edith Street and one in relation to parking time in Wynnum Central generally. Councillor Richards, may I have a motion, please? I need the microphone. <laughs> Um, so, Mr Chair, I move that the petitions as presented be received and referred to the committee concerned for consideration and report. Second. It's been moved by Councillor Richard, seconded by Councillor Shrunk, that all petitions as presented be received and referred to the committee concerned for consideration and report. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Noes. The ayes have it. Councillors. Councillors, are there any items of general business? Councillor Burke. Thank you, Mr Chairman. My earliest memories of this council and aldermen and councillors go back to the late 1980s, when on successive Christmases um, there were large storms at our house and the inside downstairs was flooded. Each morning, each Christmas morning, I remember our then alderman, Bob Mills, who's in the gallery today, coming around and helping to clean up the mess of mud and water. It was the inspiration of these events that I've tried to replicate in my time as a councillor. I have, for the 12 years, had the great honour to represent the residents of Jamboree in this place, to share and celebrate the various achievements in the good times, and to console and support in the not so good times. It's been a roller coaster of a journey, and I'm thankful for the chance to serve my community. I was elected on the back of a tide of change in 2008 that saw Campbell Newman re elected into the mayoralty with an LNP majority. Since then, I've had the privilege of serving with three Lord Mayors, each different in their own way and with a different vision for our city. And I know that Lord Mayor Schrinner will continue to deliver on his vision for our city after March 28. I want to thank Campbell, Graham and the current Lord Mayor for the faith that they put in me as part of Civic Cabinet over the years. 
I've had the opportunity to work on some amazing projects and deliver some fantastic programs. From the work we did on City Hall to kick-starting the restoration of Anzac Square, overseeing the transition of South Bank and Roma Street parklands back to council, the new libraries we delivered in Chermside and Bracken Ridge, and over the last two years, delivering on our commitment to the residents of Brisbane as part of Brisbane's future blueprint. Working on the City Hall restoration project was a standout of my first term here. The chance to be a part of a project that was a once in a generation opportunity. City Hall is a building that holds a special place in so many people's hearts, including my own, and will stay a feature of our city now for a long time to come. Soon after starting on the project, we were in a meeting about some of the communications uh, that were going out about the closure of City Hall. And one of the young comms officers uh, with her manager were running through the plan of how we were going to tell people that City Hall was closing for three years. And I can remember, I can't remember the question, Mr. Chair, uh, but I asked the officer something. And without missing a beat, she said, but dude, if we do that, and I could see then the horror on her manager's face. And without missing a beat, I said, councillor dude. And that's the, the humour and the approach that I've tried to bring to my time as a councillor. All of the officers on that project were amazing and truly dedicated to making sure that the project was delivered as best as it could be. And today, this building is a testament to their hard work, and I am blessed to have been a part of that, Mr Chairman. All of these projects and many more that I don't have time to list were highlights of the fantastic work that Council does on a city-wide level. But more importantly, I think where our work as councillors really matters is in our wards. To support our residents, community groups and community at large, while the cut and thrust of the council chamber may be fun and entertaining at times, our real work where we do the most value is when we are working out in our wards. We've delivered in the last 12, 12 years new roads like Walston Road, the upgrade to the Dewporth Road and Newmonks uh, Roundabout. We've secured a new community hub. We've built our new BMX hub at Dara. We've supported community groups with a new rowing club at River Hills, upgrades at St Catherine's Football Club, the Jindalee Jags, and Atho Parks, and many more. But I couldn't have done this job without the likes of Sue and Dick Stanton, Tricia and Warner Dakin from Meals on Wheels, Keith and Caroline Hamilton from the Chamber of Commerce and the Historical Society, respectively, Mal Lancaster and Alan Worthington from the RSL, the two Lisas and Michelle from 4074 Community and Beyond, Mark Spicer from St Catherine's Football Club, David Cope from the Men's Shed, the whole Carnegie and Cozy family from Centenary Community Connections. Suffice to say, I could go on with an extensive list of these people, Mr Chairman, but my role as a councillor is made that much easier when you are blessed with amazing volunteers and residents who freely give up their time to run community groups, service organisations and sports clubs. The Jamboree Ward has countless of these wonderful individuals, and as I said, I can't name them all here, but to each and every one of them, I say thank you. Thank you for the work that you have done, for the passion you show and support you gave me in doing my job in serving our community. I also want to pay tribute to some who aren't with us anymore, but played a big part in my time as a councillor. My good friend and mentor, Bob Harper, and other pillars of the community who took me under their wing as a young councillor and gave me advice and help along the way. People like Kath and Jim Haynes, Jake Lauren, Phil Lawson, Mick Swain, and Bob and Thelma Woodland. As the Lord Mayor said, one of the hardest things, uh, hardest times that I had uh, as a councillor was dealing with and helping to respond to the 2011 floods. I, like many in my community, will never forget the mud, the mess, the tears, and the heartache. But what came in those days and weeks that followed was the very best of our community, our city and our state's spirit. With the support of council and residents, our community recovered. It wasn't easy, but we did. And then out of that terrible disaster, good things came. We saw new and restored facilities, better connections in our community and community groups like the formation of the Centenary Suburbs Men's Shed. Politics though, Mr Chairman, can be a rough and tumble game. There are some light-hearted moments, though, and some stories to tell. Some of my fondest memories are in the council chamber, particularly uh, when Councillor Hinchcliffe was with us in this place. Yeah, yeah. And I remember David Hinchcliffe uh, when we were going through one of the debates on changes to the community title scheme. And he was standing up over in the seat that he had on the other side of the chamber, and he informed the, the Lord Mayor of the day that the residents had a single-digit response 
to his double-digit rate rise and then proceeded to flip the bird at the Lord Mayor. On another occasion, the Lord Mayor delivered, sorry, on another occasion, David was delivering a speech using New York, New York as the theme, including removing his shoe at the appropriate time for these vagabond shoes are longing to stray, Mr Chairman. Uh, this humour was something that was a hallmark of the council chamber over the 12 years that I've been here. In my time as Lifestyles Chair, I had the uh, challenge of dealing with a number of issues around dogs in our uh, pounds, Mr Chairman. And on one such occasion, a dog had been impounded and the appeal from a resident had come in and we were considering the appeal. And the appeal was to waive the fees because the dog had been captured as part of a break and enter. And I had quickly thought that the dog had been let out when someone was trying to rob the property. But no, the council officer was very quick to inform me that the dog was actually the lookout for the person <laughs> doing the robbery. And having bailed herself out, the lady would then now like to have her fees waived for the dog. Suffice to say, the fees weren't waived, Mr Chairman. Another great story that came uh, in my first, time, first term as a councillor was when a lady came to see me about her mother, uh, who had suddenly taken to not wanting to leave the house. And this was because of the delivery vehicle for the new business that had been set up by her next door neighbours. And after a very quick conversation, I found out that the delivery vehicle was a hearse and her new next door neighbours ran the local Hell's Pizza branch. And after a phone call and a chat to them, they decided to park it on the other side of the house instead of out of the front of this 80, 80 year old lady's house. Mr Chairman, one of the greatest changes in the 12 years I've been in this place is social media. Uh, it does a powerful good in our community, but can also do some terrible things in our community. And words, whether they're said to someone's face or written on social media, have the same effect, Mr Chairman. And all of us, including me, have their own personal challenges in life. After all, we're all human. And a little more kindness and a little more thoughtfulness is what's needed, I think, in this world. In the last three months, I've been overwhelmed by the messages of thanks and support from my community and others since I announced I would not be contesting the next election. And I want to thank everyone that has contacted me. This council is an amazing organisation. The staff are truly dedicated to a better Brisbane. And I want to thank the CEO, his executive team, to all the staff in my previous portfolios, thank you for your help and support. To Andrea, Di, Marcus and the teams of development services and city planning, thank you for a massive two years of challenges and changes. To the staff in asset services, who, as we, who we as councillors have the most to do with, I cannot give enough thanks to you. You truly are the heart and soul of this council. I want to thank my amazing staff, Marty, Claire, Judy, Lucy and Griffin. And I particularly want to thank Sue, who has been with me for 11 and a half years. She's seen me at my best and my worst, but always supported me. I want to thank the staff in the Lord Mayor's office, and in particular, Chris Anstey, for all their support and help over the last 12 years. I want to thank the Lord Mayor, my colleagues on both sides of the chamber. We haven't always seen eye to eye on every issue, that's both sides of the chamber, <laughs> but I respect you for the job that you do in your communities. And I also want to thank former councillors, Julian Simmons, Geraldine Knapp, Jane Prentice, Margaret DeWitt and Norm Wyndham. I want to thank the residents of Jamboree Ward who put their faith in me to listen, act and deliver. I know that on March 28, a re-elected team Schooner with Sarah Hutton as the councillor for Jamboree will continue to deliver for our community. I can think of no one better to replace me than this dynamic young mum of three who grew up locally and now lives in Dara. And finally, I want to thank my family, my friends and those closest to me. Thank you for all your love, support and help over the years. The 27 of us have had the privilege to be in this chamber, doing so standing on the shoulders of the councillors and aldermen that have gone before us, with one aim, to make the Brisbane of tomorrow better than the Brisbane of today. And I know that the Jamboree Ward in the city that I live is by far a better place. My hope is that in the opportunity that I had to serve my community, that I may have inspired someone like I was all those years ago. Thank you. For the debate. Thank you, Deputy Chair. I just rise to briefly um, put on record our uh, congratulations and thanks to Councillor Burke for his service uh, to the people of Brisbane and to his ward of uh, Jamboree over the last 12 years. As he said, politics can be a bruising sport. Uh, I um, had the uh, 
opportunity to sit opposite Councillor Burke in a couple of committees. Thought I got away from him when I left the Lifestyle and Community Services Committee over City Planning, and he promptly followed me uh, over to that committee as well. Um, uh, of course, uh, as he said, we haven't always seen eye to eye um, uh, on political issues, uh, but I've always found you, Councillor Burke, through you, Deputy Chair, to be um, a decent bloke. Uh, so I wish you all the very best uh, on whatever your future holds for you. Thank you, Councillor Cassidy. Councillor Richards. Thank you, uh, Deputy Chair. I rise to speak on Brisbane, City Hall, the community of the Pullen Vale Ward and my vision for the future. Brisbane City has had many innovative leaders, change makers, from Sir Thomas McDougall Brisbane, whom the city was named after being a noted soldier and astronomer, to John Petrie, a notable builder and stonemason, elected as the first mayor in 1859. To 1924, the year of the City of Brisbane Act was passed, forming a single local government area with a newly elected council led by Brisbane's first Lord Mayor, William Jolly, in 1925. Fast forward to Sally Ann Atkinson, the first female Lord Mayor in 1985, and then the 2011 devastating floods, where Brisbane's people's resilience and pride came together to form the Mud Army. It was at this time when I was the Brisbane City Council contract superintendent for the reconstruction of seven ferry terminals and two moorings that were rebuilt within the time frame of three months. That I knew I needed to take a risk to give back to this great city and its people in a greater capacity and consider stepping into the political arena of local government. Yet, as I've mentioned previously, it was also a great time of family tra tragedy and loss for me. I point to a time where the decision to stay or leave Brisbane was being considered. Yet my being, my purpose, was always drawn to being home, being here in Brisbane. It is home where my family is, where I'm married, and where my husband and I have chosen to raise a family. For me, it's the lifestyle. It's the iconic green spaces, the climate and the structures, particularly City Hall, being the people's place and the heart of this great city that I could not leave. That was my why for stepping up to put myself forward into the public arena to be elected as a councillor for the city of Brisbane. I've worked within Brisbane City Council as a council officer over a period of 10 years and this building, City Hall, which I worked on during its restoration, is a symbol of local government's civic pride. It is within this place that others in this chamber seem to see a faceless coloured brand with malevolent agenda, instead of people with heartbeats. Women and men who deserve respect, who are daughters, sons, wives, husbands, partners, mothers and fathers, whom the people and children of this city look upon to grow this city through tough times and good times. Today, more than ever, through social media and print, members of this chamber need to realise that your targets are real people with heartbeats, who should benefit from researched facts, not be impacted by political agendas. As a journalist wrote just recently, perhaps the meanness needs to stop and a bit of dignity and respect for everyone needs to take place. As I know, the truth will be revealed. And so too the faceless men who have bullied, harassed and acted on threats. It is the unseen bullying that must stop. To experience what I have had in the past couple of months and continue to, as well as media releases from members in this chamber who have not researched their facts has been appalling. 
I took the declaration of office oath on the 12th of April 2016 as the councillor for the Pullenbau Ward that I would faithfully and impartially fulfil the duties of the office in accordance with the local government principles under the City of Brisbane Act 2010 to the best of my judgment and ability. Despite what I have been put through, I am standing by my oath of office as the councillor for the Pullenbau Ward and continuing to turn up every day, meet with residents, work with council officers and deal with the flooding these rain events are causing in my ward. It's business as usual. As I care about my community and I truly love this city, Yet, faceless men have taken the integrity of a person to set up their chosen one. It is courage, strength and resilience for which I stand, as this is who I am. I am the people of the Pullenvale Awards Choice in 2016. And I have not taken that commitment lightly. I am blue. I remain true to those values. I am, will continue to be, and shall support Team Schrinner. What I am clear with is that the vision for the community of the Pullenvale Ward is one that requires hard work, integrity, and delivery centred on livability, which underpins our diverse and accessible green spaces, land uses, outdoor recreation, wayfinding walking trails, additional infrastructure, improved and expanded public transport, festivals and community gathering events. The role of councillor is not simply a title or a family tradition or even a job. It's a vocation. Thank you to all of the council officers who I have met, worked alongside with, and in particular through the 2011 floods and CAPEX, laughed and shared a tear. I respect what you do and I honour your dedication and passion for this great city. To fellow councillors, thank you. Thank you, Deputy Chair. Thank you, Councillor Richard. Is there any further general business? Councillor Marks. Uh, thank you, Deputy Chair. I rise to speak on um, Councillor Richards and Councillor Burke's last evening here in Chambers. Um, it actually only struck me an hour or so ago that this was going to be Councillor Richards' last um, night in Chambers. Um, so I just want to say thank you to Kate. Um, we are geographically the furthest apart, pretty much. <laughs> she's old, I always said she's the other end of the world from where I am. Um, and um, one thing with Kate is um, she was always there on the other end of a phone. For me, we spoke every week, um, sometimes more than once a week, and I'm, uh, and I'm damn sure that that is going to continue into the future, regardless of what happens. Um, I, we all have challenges in our, our, our own wards. Um, Kate, Councillor Richard's particular challenge has been purely the ge geographic size of her ward. Um, I did go out with her in, in, in the early days when she became the councillor because in, every week she'd bang on about how big her ward was and nobody understood the size of it and they're like, oh my God. So I went for a drive with her in her big truck that she has to have to just get around her ward and, and yeah, it, it is massive. Nobody has any concept until you've been out there just, just how big it is. I mean, I can drive my ward in a day, no problems. Yeah, but no, yeah, 
two weeks for Councillor Richards to drive her ward. So that was a real opener for me. So I think you know the, the people of Pullenvale are, are losing a, a very good and dedicated councillor. Um, she certainly put in the hours in that truck, I can tell you that. Um, I struggle as a councillor with two teenagers. I don't know how Councillor Richards has done it with three young children. Um, that's a, it's, it's, a, it's a tough gig either way, and to do both at the same time is extraordinarily tough. Talking about children, I want to mention Councillor Burke, one of the few councillors <laughs> who doesn't have children, but was there for me in my time of need. I had an extremely stressful um, time. I had a, a dreadful phone call that I received um, to do with one of my children. Um, and, and Matthew was the only, and he knew there was something wrong. And um, he took me aside and he said, what's wrong? And I didn't want to tell him because it was so bad. Um, but anyway, he, he persisted and um, he took me by the hand and he led me into the Lord Mayor's office and made me sit there and tell the Lord Mayor what was happening. And then um, one of the things he said to me to, was I needed to make sure I put an hour for lunch every single day in my diary, because he knows how goddamn hard we all work, and I was never taking that hour a day. So, Matthew, I will never, ever forget what you did to me on that day. And, and I want to say thank you. And, and you will be missed so much, you have no idea. Um, and Kate, so phone calls are, will continue forever. Thank you. Is there any further business? Deputy Mayor. I'm going to try and stand up and not cry now. Thank you very much, Councillor Mars, Councillor Richards, and Councillor Burke, who had some tears as well. Oh, thank you, Matt. Thank you. See, he's such a caring man. Um, I am standing up on behalf of the Lord Mayor and myself, and the Lord Mayor mentioned some words in ENC as well, but can I just say on behalf of the, both teams, we are losing two very committed local councillors tonight. We're not losing them. They're still going to be friends and they're still going to be close by, but we are going to miss them not being with us every day and being with us here on Tuesday. I'll start with Kate because it's a bit longer on Councillor Burke, but Kate, you joined us in 2016. I didn't have the pleasure of knowing you through council before that when you were here. But the one thing that struck me from the day you joined us till the day you finish, which I'm sure will be the 28th of March and no earlier, um, is that you are a compassionate and hardworking local councillor and you definitely get out and about in that very large ward as well. I did have the pleasure of knowing your ward quite well, obviously, having taught at Kenmore High for 15 years and knowing the treasures that live out there and the hard work that it is with some of the uh, residents out there as well. Um, but you took it all in your stride and you had some hard times, but you always stood up to the challenge and you are a fantastic local councillor for that. The people of the Pullen Vale Ward have no idea what they're missing out on, absolutely no idea. And unfortunately, I think it will be a case of sometimes you don't realise what you've got until it's gone. I hope that you find whatever makes you happy after March. I hope that the talent and the skills that you have, which you definitely have, transfer into your next phase of life um, so that you and your family uh, have great success in whatever you choose to do because you deserve to have great success in whatever you choose to do and know that the team here, the team Schooner, will be there behind you all of the way as well. So thank you very much for your time here in council. Mm -hmm. Councillor Burke, another committed local councillor who, as he said, came in in 2008, which is when I started as well. Um, very, very hard working, and we saw very early on a natural leader in this place. He had some great influences, and one of them is sitting up there, Councillor Bob Mills, and I'm sure Bob, as I know, Alderman, I should know better with my mother, Alderman Mills, um, I'm sure is extremely proud of the 12 years of commitment that Matt has put into this place. Um, he, has, he had very big shoes to fill with some of those uh, Western Suburbs uh, councillors like yourself, but he's done an absolutely outstanding job. Um, it was in the early days that uh, even though at the time Councillor Burke was one of the youngest councillors to come on uh, into council, that his leadership qualities were very, very clear and he was chosen very early on, as he mentioned, by Campbell for Cabinet. And I've had the great pleasure for the entire time that I've been in Cabinet as well, working with uh, Councillor Burke on Mondays and Tuesdays 
as well as the rest of the week as well. He has the most amazing passion for Brisbane um, and even more so for the Jamboree Ward, which is why I was a little bit um, bewildered, I have to say, when he decided he wasn't going to join us after March 28. But I do understand that 12 years is a long, hard time. I do understand now why my mum decided 12 years was enough. I do understand why Alderman Mills decided that 12 years was enough. Uh, and it is a tough job and it does take its toll and the wonderful opportunity for uh, Matthew is that he has got many, many years ahead of him to do whatever he wants to do now as well. Um, he's always been a level head um, within Cabinet and within Party Room. He has always given considered and intelligent advice. See, now I'm going to cry. For me and for the whole team whether it's from parks to lifestyle or now planning, he has made a big impact on not only the Jamboree Ward, but the Greater Brisbane. Council won't be the same without you, my good friend. You've been a great confidant and I will truly miss you and your great memes, <laughs> as you know. So on behalf of the team, who all seem to not be able to cry tonight, can I say best of luck to Kate and to Matt. You deserve all the best into the future. We will miss you, but we will stay in touch. Thank you. Councillor Murphy. Uh, thank you, Deputy Chair. Uh, I rise to make some valedictory remarks about uh, my good friend, Councillor Burke. Uh, and I hope that whoever's chopping the onions in here stops doing it immediately. Um, and it's very weird to me, Deputy Chair, because um, it still isn't quite real to me that there will be no more Councillor Burke. Um, I'd only known Matt for 18 months uh, when he was first elected to Jamboree Ward in 2008. Um, and I have to say, like many people in this chamber, um, I know Matt almost exclusively uh, as a city councillor. So much of my experience of who Matt is is tied up in his service to local government um, and what service it has been, Deputy Chair. 12 years in council, uh, much of that as uh, uh, chairman for the environment, for parks and sustainability, for Brisbane lifestyle, and most recently in city planning. Um, and of course, there's many achievements uh, in those roles that he has to be proud of. Um, of course, uh, one of my favourites is in, uh, introducing uh, fully featured outdoor gyms to Brisbane uh, to help people exercise free of charge in, in 2014, which he um, helped establish in my former ward of Doughboy. Um, then as city planning chair, finishing the great work of Plan Your Brisbane uh, and delivering on the outcomes of Brisbane's future blueprint, which has given Brisbane residents a, a very clear voice in how this city, uh, how planning operates in this city. Um, but Matt can also be justifiably proud of his service to LGAQ and the wider institution of local government. Many people in this chamber would not be aware of the contribution uh, that Matt has made to many debates, both within LGAQ uh, and between that organisation and the state government uh, for the benefit of the institution of local government. You will have no idea of the work that he has done uh, there. He is an outstanding advocate for local government. And I know that if there is anyone who will miss Matthew Burke more than us in this chamber, it will be those at the Local Government Association of Queensland when his term expires. Um, but I think, Deputy Chair, the people that will miss Matthew Burke the most are the residents of Jamboree Ward, uh, who have shown repeatedly their affection for this man at the ballot box. That has been affection well earned, and not only through Matt's diligence his work ethic and his approachable nature, um, but for going beyond the call of duty for them time and again. And it is not for no reason that he is the only councillor in this place to be awarded a National Emergency Medal for his work with his community during the 2011 floods, when he quite literally worked himself to the bone, ensuring resources got where they needed for those who needed it most. Councillors like Matthew Burke, are a rare breed indeed. Matthew is also the only councillor who I know who got sprung by the media for dropping his dax during a rousing rendition of the Eagle Rock at uh, the Pig and Whistle uh, pub as a newly minted councillor. 
uh, it wouldn't have been a very good day point to of be order, the keyboard Deputy Chair. On, on Campbell order, Newman's Deputy Blackberry Chair. that day. Point, point of order, Councillor Murphy. Would Councillor Murphy take a question? Uh, Councillor Wines, uh, I will ask that, but I just want to remind you, as Chairman of, of Chamber, it's, it, you shouldn't be interjecting. <laughs> Councillor Murphy, would you... Happy to take a question from Councillor Wines. Wines. Does Councillor Murphy recall it was not the venue he said, but rather the Red Room at UQ, where Councillor Burke uh, no, and, and Hotel LA, two separate occasions. <laughs> well, we might have a third shooter on the grassy knoll there, uh, uh, Councillor Wines. Look, I don't know how many times he's done it. All I know is how many times he was caught. So, uh, uh, but Matt, I must say, uh, Councillor Burke, you have well and truly earned a break. Uh, I'm very sure that this won't be the last time that we see you in political life. I want to thank you for being a mentor uh, and a friend to me over the years. I want to thank you for always being straight with me and even when I didn't want to hear what you had to say. I want to thank you for the Simpsons memes. I want to thank you for the same speech you give about the socialist template. This council, uh, it won't be the same without you, Matt, uh, but our loss in here is your friends and family's gain. I'm sure um, they can't wait to get to know Private Citizen Burke, a man with the same sense of humour, same dedication, same work ethic and diligence, but with a hell of a lot less stress. The next councillor for Jamboree Ward, Sarah Hutton, has enormous shoes to fill, and we will all make sure that she lives up to the fine example that you have set. Thanks, Mark. Any further business? Councillor Wines. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Chair. I just rise to um, make a few uh, comments about our, uh, our colleagues who are retiring. And I just wanted to say that what a sad, it is sad it's, um, to say goodbye. And I, I remember when uh, Councillor Burke called me to tell me that he was uh, retiring, I told him, uh, quite frankly, that he was wrong, <laughs> that he would regret it, and that I was personally very sad about the. the uh, the decision that he'd taken to retire. Um, a, a lot of comments today have been about Matt's uh, professional life here as a councillor, but uh, many know, but not all know, that I've known Matt since uh, I was, what, 16 or 17? And what were you, 18 or 19 at the time? Uh, and I found recently some paperwork while I was going through some old folders that showed the fig tree pocket young Liberal executive, vice, branch vice chairman Matthew Burke, Branch Secretary Andrew Wines. That was 2004, um, and I just wanted to, you know, reflect. Um, Matt was always a great believer in local government, and uh, um, I see in the gallery uh, Bob Mills was very much someone that um, that Councillor Burke looked to as, as as sort of a community inspiration. And Matt always, with Councillor Burke, always believed, um, in particular, in the nobility of civic government, and in particular the Brisbane City Council. And it was. Um, and I, I know that, uh, I can say this, for a long time uh, he wanted to be here in this place. And I'm very, I suppose, proud to be able to say that, to, to see you be in this place and be part of, part of this. I see uh, your mum in the gallery and it's so great to have uh, Sue here with us as well. I know that your family have been so important to you. Um, and I just wanted to say, uh, to, to recognise their support and commitment of you, but also how, how close the Burke family is and just, uh, just recognise um, that. I have many, many stories about Councillor Burke and Private Citizen Burke, which I will tell at a different story, and diff those stories at a different event. They are not for here. They are for more relaxed circumstances. But um, as I say, you know, we, we joined council together. We were, uh, in, we were young Liberals together um, from a person who thinks that's a good thing. I know that not everyone does, but it's, a wonderful, uh, it's wonderful to be able to look back and say, um, to be able to serve in a place like this with a friend for so long. And I just wanted to say, um, well done and congratulations. And I look forward to seeing you in the future. Any further business? Uh, before we close the meeting, I just want to uh, wish Councillor Burke and Councillor Richards all the best for the future. And I'd also like to wish everybody else uh, all the best for March 28. And also, can we show some appreciation for our clerk? Thank you very much, uh, everyone. I declare the meeting closed. <laughs>